Over the last few decades, the gaming industry has become one of the most popular and prolific forms of entertainment. Over the years, we've been able to witness the birth of some of the most beloved characters in the media space. We've been able to delve into their worlds and play through their engaging games, and we've been able to watch them grow and flourish into some of the biggest gaming franchises to date. But have you ever wondered about the ones that never got that chance? Whatever happened to that old game you used to play as a kid? Or what about that one that had so much potential, but seemingly vanished into thin air? Today, we'll be looking through every single gaming franchise, from several different companies in hopes of understanding the current state that they're in. To help consolidate and organize my thoughts, I've chosen to place them into a list, with each tier relating to a different state. This happens to be the first volume and will cover four different gaming companies. To be included in this list, the franchises must have more than one game to their name and they must have released in the West at some point. With all of that out of the way, I think it's about time we got started. And where better to start than with arguably the most popular and well-known gaming company in the entire world. So not including the numerous single release arcade games, the first ever Nintendo franchise actually happens to be Donkey Kong, first conceptualized by Miyamoto in 1981. Now I'm guessing most of you know the iconic game where you play as Mario and have to get to the top by avoiding barrels thrown by Donkey Kong. The game was an instant success in arcades and spawned the addition of numerous sequels in the form of Donkey Kong Jr, Donkey Kong 3, and Donkey Kong Jungle Fever. The franchise would also branch off into sub-series such as Donkey Kong Country, Mario vs Donkey Kong, Donkey Konga, and DK King of Swing. Donkey Kong was thriving in the early 2000s, with games being released usually within a few years of each other at most. Recently, however, we have experienced a Donkey Kong drought, with the latest game being a remake of Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze for the Switch. Because of this, I think the Donkey Kong franchise, at this current moment, as much as I hate to say it, belongs in the they exist here. You could argue that it belongs in the mainstays just for what it's done for the Nintendo in general, but I'm looking at it as current. Now following Donkey Kong, we have a fairly unknown franchise, going by the name of Mario. Now I'm not sure if you guys have actually heard about this franchise before, but apparently- Okay, with all joking aside, if you were to pick one franchise to encompass Nintendo, this would probably be the one. After his initial appearance in Donkey Kong, Mario would make his first appearance in his own franchise in Mario Bros, released in 1983. Two years later, Mario would not only strike gold, but single-handedly revive the whole video game industry with his return in Super Mario Bros for the NES. To date, this game alone has sold over 40 million copies. To help put that into perspective, that's about two times the total sales of the whole Metroid franchise. As a result, Mario was split off to do many things, making up a total of 14 different franchises, as well as numerous spin-offs as well. Super Mario Bros is the first game among the Super Mario subseries, which in my opinion includes every game that has the word Super Mario in its title. So we're talking Super Mario Maker and New Super Mario Bros, all of those are included, and is made up of 32 games including remakes and remasters. The franchise has seen consistent releases since Super Mario Bros in 1985, up to recent years with Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury in 2021. Honestly, I'm not even sure why I'm still talking about this. It's probably one of the easiest Nintendo franchises to place. Life support. What? <coughs> now, if you thought Wii Sports was the premier sports franchise, well, you must have never played NES Sports. Uh, to be honest, I'm not even sure if this counts as a franchise, but it was a series of games released on the NES from 1983 to 1988. It would include anything from baseball to ice hockey, but Nintendo cancelled the series in 1988, so the franchise is just dead. Anyway, the next franchise to be released was Punch-Out, making its first appearance in arcades in 1984. The game, as you'd expect, has you boxing, but in a more puzzle-like manner where you predict and counter the enemy's movements. A further seven games would be released for the franchise, ending with Punch-Out for the Wii in 2009. Since then, however, there hasn't been as much as a whisper regarding the franchise. The Punch-Out franchise to this day has a very dedicated playbase, with speedrunners pushing the absolute boundaries possible. The fact that it's been MIA for over a decade, however, most likely means that Nintendo, at least for the moment, has no plans of bringing it back. Later on into 1984, Nintendo would release Excite Bike, which would mark the first entry into the Excite franchise. While initially only involving the use of motorcycles, the vehicle choice would branch out with the release of Excite Truck for the Wii in 2006. While the gameplay differs vastly between each game, the one common goal is to be completely insane. The game might as well have been called Crashing Simulator. With the latest game being Excite Bike World Rally, 
which was released for the Wii in 2009, it's probably safe to say that this series is bordering on just being completely dead, or at least on its last breaths in life support. Now alongside Mario as one of Nintendo's most recognised franchise, we have The Legend of Zelda. First released all the way back in 1986 for the NES, Link, Zelda and Ganon's story has been portrayed through 19 mainline games that have spanned every single major Nintendo console. With total sales well over 100 million, and Tears of the Kingdom furthering those records, it would be a waste to discuss this any further regarding the current state it's in. The Legend of Zelda is one of Nintendo's flagship franchises, and will most likely stay that way forever. Now let's just say that gamers in 1986 were eating real good, because just 6 months after the release of The Legend of Zelda, another franchise was looking to make a name for itself. That franchise was Metroid. First released in 1986 with the original Metroid for the NES, the franchise has gone on to release 16 games in total, all of which have been consistently stellar, give or take maybe one or two. While suffering from large periods of time without new releases, the franchise has managed to stay relevant and even revive itself in recent years to the point where it's become one of the most requested and exciting franchises in the current day. The franchise at this point deserves to be a Nintendo mainstay and could possibly see itself becoming a flagship series in the near future if it continues on its current trajectory. Following back-to-back -back legendary franchises, could Nintendo make it a hat-trick? No, they couldn't. Because the next franchise released happened to be Kid Icarus. Taking place in Angel Land, the game follows Pit, an angel and guardian to the goddess of light, Palutena, who battles against the forces of evil in the form of Medusa. It's ironic that Pit is an angel. Meanwhile, his franchise more so embodies that of a fallen angel. Initially released in 1987 for the NES, the game would receive mixed reviews before having a sequel released for it in 1991 called Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters. All signs pointed to the franchise taking off like an angel. <laughs> Get it? Well, what if I told you that this was the last Kid Icarus game for 21 years? Now Pitt made his grand return in his new game- Wait what? Oh. Well, he was added to Smash, which will become pretty commonplace the more franchises we review. But Pitt did eventually make a return in Kid Icarus Uprising in 2012 for the 3DS, making it the first time the franchise had seen a 3D world. Even after selling decently well and being praised for its gameplay, the franchise has yet to see another game for over 10 years. It was revived just to be wheeled back into life support. Next up, we have the first project of legendary producer Yoshio Sakamoto, Famicom Detective Club. These were a duology of adventure games whereas the title would have you think you work to solve numerous and mysterious cases. While originally released only in Japan, the series quickly became a cult classic among its fans and in 2021, Nintendo felt it within themselves to finally bring the series to the west, releasing remakes for both The Missing Heir and The Girl Who Stands Behind. Taking these new remakes into account, this series has revived itself and safely sits among the It Exists tier. Now after a long span of one-hit wonders like Duck Hunt, the next Nintendo franchise would be Nintendo Wars, a series of turn-based strategy games where you move each of your allies' units across the battlefield to attack your enemies. Beginning in 1988 with the release of Famicom Wars, the series would see moderate success, releasing 12 games over a 20-year period until Advance Wars Days of Ruin in 2008 for the Nintendo DS. The franchise would soon be wheeled into hospital for life support, before being revived very recently with its reboots of Advance Wars 1 and 2, looking to released this year. Honestly, I'm not sure if this is enough to take it off life support, but I think because it's two games in one, it's done enough to move up to the they exist tier for now. We now arrive at the first franchise to have two names, formerly known as Mother in Japan before being renamed to Earthbound for its western release. The role playing games often featured a little boy and his group of friends defeating aliens with their supernatural powers. The franchise got its start with Earthbound Beginnings, or Mother as they called it in Japan, in 1989 for the NES. Now technically only one of three games was ever released in the west, that being the titular game Earthbound in 1995. Both Mother 3, the sequel, as well as Mother 1 plus 2 would remain Japanese exclusive releases. Seeing as the game only ever released one game in the west, and even including the Japanese releases, the franchise has not seen a game since 2006. The only remembrance of the franchise at this point is Ness's inclusion in Smash Bros. Series creator Shikisato Itoi has repeatedly stated that he wishes to leave the Mother franchise where it is, and that a Mother 4 is essentially impossible at this stage. Unfortunately for fans of the series, this does mean that this is a finished or dead franchise. The franchise with the most recent release takes up the next spot. Honestly, I would have never imagined Nintendo to partner up with Colgate for one of their releases. But here we are. Now all jokes aside, Fire Emblem has become a, one of Nintendo's longest running franchises. Starting off with Fire Emblem, Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light in 1990, 
Thank god they've started shortening the names of these games. Up until the most recent Fire Emblem, which was Fire Emblem Engage, the franchise spans over 30 years, with 17 mainline games to its name. The game initially caught the attention of players due to its challenging turn-based RPG elements, as well as its permadeath mechanic. Now here's a fun fact, the franchise would actually release 6 games before ever appearing in the west. Following the addition of Marth and Roy in the Super Smash Bros melee roster, and people realising that Marth was at least a high A tier character, if not S tier, Nintendo decided to finally bring the franchise over in 2003, with Fire Emblem, The Blazing Blade. The franchise has seen consistent releases up until this day, solidifying itself as a Nintendo mainstay. Now, this is a franchise I didn't even know existed before researching for this video. Released in North America only in 1990, the game would receive a port to the Game Boy and a sequel titled Super Play Action Football in 1992. Now, some of you are probably wondering, you know, why the hell I even included this, and it's obvious that this franchise is just straight up dead. But I mean, I wasn't kidding when I said I would include, well, kind of almost all Nintendo franchises, as long as they fit the criteria I set out. Now often regarded as a forgotten classic, the Star Tropics franchise featured two games to its name in the form of the original in 1990, as well as a sequel called Zoda's Revenge Star Tropics 2. Unfortunately, the game would never expand past this, despite players praising the game for its fun gameplay and catchy music. The fact that the sequel was released on the NES, even after the SNES had already come out, is often cited as one of the main reasons the franchise never took off. As a result, the franchise cannot even be put on life support at this stage. Ah, F-Zero, the sci-fi racing franchise that predates even Mario Kart, first being released in 1990 for the SNES. Often considered one of the hardest racing franchises of all time due to its intense speed and tight turns, the franchise would go on to release 9 games over the course of 14 years. Now that sounds amazing right? Well, the franchise has yet to see a new game since F-Zero Climax for the Game Boy Advance in 2004. Once again, the game's titular character, Captain Falcon, has been relegated to a roster spot on Super Smash Bros, where he will most likely remain forever. Just to suffer. When I first made this video, this franchise was pretty much on its last legs, begging for a revival. Thankfully, Nintendo actually watched my video and seemingly revived it, if only by a little when they released F-099 later in 2023. I can't say I have too much hope for the future of this franchise, but for now, I will place F-0 in the It Exists tier. From a racing franchise to a flying franchise, next up is Pilot Wings. And if you've never heard of this one, then don't worry, because neither had I. From what I can tell, it's just a series of flight simulation games. First released for the SNES in 1990, the franchise spans three games total. What's surprising is the latest game, Pilot Wings Resort, was actually released for the 3DS in 2011. Still though, I can't see this franchise getting a new game anytime soon, if ever. Now in the 9 years since his first appearance, Mario had gotten a PhD and finished studying medicine, before becoming a doctor on the NES in 1990. The game drew elements from a rather obscure game called Tetris. The franchise would include another 7 installments, with the latest being Dr. Mario World, a mobile game released in 2019. Honestly, this franchise just feels like a quick ripoff of Mario and Tetris, and most likely only exists to cash in on another facet of him. I guess it deserves to be in the Exists tier though, as it's still receiving new games to this day. We now have our first spin-off franchise from the original Mario franchise. The Yoshi franchise features a total of 8 games, starting with Yoshi in 1991 for the NES and Game Boy. Mainly consisting of a combination of puzzle and platformer games, the franchise has had significant breaks in between sets of games. Within the last decade, however, there have been 3 mainline games for the franchise, and while it may not have the star power to be a Nintendo mainstay, as of right now, it certainly isn't on life support. The lovable pink blob is up next, making his grand entrance in Kirby's Dream Land for the Game Game Boy in 1992. Over the last 20 years, the franchise has seen over 20 games released, meaning that in some cases there were multiple Kirby games released within the same year. The latest to be released, which is ironic considering the first game's title, is Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe in 2023. Having sold well over 40 million copies, and ranking it as one of the top 50 best-selling video game franchises of all time, paired with its consistent release cycle, Kirby easily manages to take a spot as a flagship franchise. Now here's a fun fact, it took Mario over 10 years to pass his driving exam. Well, at least that's how long it took for him to get into a cart and start racing around Nintendo inspired courses. Released in 1992 for the SNES, Super Mario Kart would prove to be an instant success, selling well over 8 million copies in its lifetime. Introducing the addicting gameplay of Absolute Mayhem, and the idea that it doesn't matter how terrible you are because RNG and items can carry you to first place regardless, the franchise would spawn 15 games in total, covering pretty much every Nintendo console and 
and more. The latest addition to the series was Mario Kart Live Home Circuit in 2020, but before that was the release of Mario Kart 8 Deluxe for the Switch, which also holds the record for the best-selling Nintendo game if you were to not include Down. Wii Sports. Mario Kart games are often within the top three bestsellers on, on each respective console, and with the game's ever-growing popularity and consistent releases, I think Mario Kart is without a doubt a Nintendo flagship. Now we have another one of these obscure entries at this point, titled Battle Clash, released for the SNES in 1992. The game was a light gun shooter, involving the player taking control of a gunner in a mecha suit and fighting other mechas in one-on-one -on -one battles. The game was followed up a year later with the release of Metal Combat Falcon's Revenge. Since then, there's been nothing though, allowing us to add it to the pile of dead franchises. So by this point, we've had a racing franchise, we've had a flying franchise, well, how about a jet skiing franchise? Wave Race crashed onto the scene in 1992 for the Game Boy. Featuring two game modes, Slalom and Circuit, the initial impressions were positive and resulted in the production of two sequels, Wave Race 64 for the N64 and the latest game, Wave Race Blue Storm for the Nintendo GameCube. Unfortunately, this latest game was released all the way back in 2001. There have been mentions of interest in reviving the series, but going on 20 years without a game does not bode well for any fans still holding on to what little hope is left. Because of the expressed interest by Nintendo though, it can just hold off in the life support tier. We've arrived at what I consider to be one of the most underutilized gaming franchises ever. Star Fox was first released as far back as 1993 for the SNES and saw monumental success. It followed up with the release of Star Fox 64, which became the best-selling game of the franchise. At this point, Star Fox was on its way to becoming another household name in Nintendo's collection. Fast forward 20 years and, well, Star Fox 64 still remains the best-selling game in the franchise, and by a significant amount. Nintendo's lack of creativity showed in their decisions to outsource the future Star Fox games to other teams, and as a result, the franchise has never been able to find its true identity. The most recent entry, Star Fox Zero, which was released in 2016 for the Wii U, also holds the record for the lowest sales out of the whole franchise. While often considered one of Nintendo's major franchises, the current state it's in couldn't be worse and as such, it belongs in the life support tier. Now, if you guys have made it this far, then I applaud you. I would also ask that you consider hitting that subscribe button if you're enjoying the video. Now onto the next franchise, which happens to be Wario. Making his first appearance all the way back in 1992 in Super Mario Land 2, Six Golden Coins, Wario would have to wait two years before hijacking Super Mario Land and turning it into Wario Land in 1994. Over the course of six Wario Land games, spanning from 1994 to 2008, the player would play as Wario with the sole goal of becoming rich from collecting treasures. Much like the Mario games it was based on, Wario Land featured platforming elements over a series of worlds that each had a set of levels. While these games fared well and were received positively, the popularity of Wario would explode upon the release of the WarioWare games. Being released in 2003 for the Game Boy Advance, WarioWare Inc. Mega Microgame featured what is known as microgames. Go figure. Short 3-5 to five second instances where should the player fail, they lose a life. The game would throw numerous games at the player in quick succession. The series would perform decently well, resulting in 9 total games spanning over most of Nintendo's major consoles, with the latest release being released on the Switch in recent years. As a whole, I believe the Warrior franchise, while being a niche one, has remained consistent enough to stay as a mainstay. I would say that if we were to separate Warrior Land, which has been MIN since 2008, it would most likely be a dead franchise at this point, or at least on live support. Next up, we have Picross. Now I'm gonna be honest, I don't actually know anyone that's played this series of games. But considering that it's still being released to this day, in the form of Picross S7 for the Switch in 2022, there must be at least one person out there grinding these games. The games are Momogram puzzle games, which if you're unsure of what those are, the goal is to essentially reveal a hidden picture on a grid by scraping away specific squares of it. Certain numbers are given on the sides of each row and column that let the player know how many squares are required to be scrapped. Honestly, these games are released pretty much every year, so I guess it's got to be a flagship franchise. Yeah, sorry, no chance. For those that love these games, I'm sorry, but there's just no way I'm putting it up there with these other iconic franchises. Now, Nintendo must really love puzzle games, or maybe they were just easier to create back in the day, because just six months after the release of Picross, Nintendo would start a new series known as Panel de Pong, or Puzzle League. Now, for the seven people who know this franchise, I'm afraid to tell you that it's most likely dead. Featuring 10 games over the course of 14 years from 1995 to 2009, the series focused on puzzle-like games similar in a sense to Tetris. There's not too much else to say about this franchise, as it's been for gotten by Nintendo. 
Now I'm just going to quickly shoot through the countless Mario sports games during this section, because honestly there's just so many of them to cover separately. So starting off with Mario Tennis released in 1995 for the Virtual Boy, the gameplay as you'd expect is pretty much just tennis, like think Wii Sports Tennis but with Mario characters and special abilities. The franchise actually includes 8 games on all major consoles, but I think the niche is too specific and therefore belongs in the It Exists tier. Now after winning a few Grand Slams, Mario made his way over to Golf in 1999, where he looked to win some PGA Tours. Over the course of 6 games, with the latest being Mario Golf Super Rush released in 2021 for the Switch, Mario established himself as Tiger Woods equal, before looking towards baseball. Now Mario turned pro in 2005 on the GameCube in Mario Superstar Baseball. I guess baseball wasn't really a sport though, as he retired in 2008, following Mario Super Sluggers for the Wii. Now after casually beating Lionel Messi in a 1 on 1, Mario decided to try his hand at football, or soccer for you Americans. He would make his first appearance in Super Mario Strikers in 2005 for the game. After making his return in 2007 in Mario Strikers Charged for the Wii, Mario would retire to focus on exploring the galaxy. Don't worry though, as he's returned to play recently in Mario Strikers Battle League, released for the Switch in 2022. Now honestly, I don't think there's enough Mario sports games at this point, but if there's one thing they all have in common, it's that they're all just alright. Nothing super special and mainly just spin-offs to play every now and then. Now there's always been this debate going on if Pokemon really is a Nintendo franchise, seeing as it's jointly owned by Game Freak, Nintendo and Creatures Inc, but it would feel weird not to include it on such a list. Pokemon as a whole probably needs no introduction. From the games, to the trading cards, to the anime show, Pokemon is probably the most recognised franchise aside from Mario. The first games to be released were Pokemon Red and Green for the Game Boy in 1996 or as they were known in the West, Pokemon Red and Blue, which were released two years later in 1998. Featuring 151 different Pokemon to catch, the role-playing game would take over and never look back. The addictive gameplay and the goal to catch them all while becoming the best Pokemon trainer kept fans coming back for more. To this day, 23 mainline games have been released for the franchise. If you were to count spin-off games, that number would jump to a staggering 65 games. And as it would take a whole day just to list off each, I will quickly be mentioning the bigger subseries and where they would place in this list. Pokemon Mystery Dungeon has fairly consistent releases for the handheld consoles, and honestly, out of all the subseries, most deserves a spot in mainstays. Pokemon Snap was released in 1999 and didn't receive a sequel until 2021. Most likely, we'll have to wait that long for another game, so it's probably on life support. Pokemon Stadium never made it off the N64, so it's dead. Pokemon Tournament got an enhanced port for the Switch in 2017, but outside of that, it's grass at straws, life support. Pokemon Ranger is my personal favourite forgotten series. After releasing 3 games from 2006 to 2010, and selling decently well, it was never touched by Nintendo again, so unfortunately it's most likely dead as well. Overall though, Pokemon easily secures a spot as one of Nintendo's flagship franchises, even if people don't want to consider it a Nintendo franchise in the first place. Now the pinnacle of snowboarding was upon us in 1998, with the release of 1080 snowboarding. Including a stacked roster of 5 characters and the choice of 6 raceable tracks, the game would go on to receive critical acclaim for its magnificent graphics and its ability to emulate the feeling and atmosphere of snowboarding, all while sitting in your mum's basement. This would result in the game selling over 2 million copies and warranting a sequel to 1080 Snowboarding Avalanche, which would release in 2003 for the GameCube. Unfortunately, this game would not receive the same love as the original, with many pointing out the frame rate issues and the limited gameplay. Seeing as I can't find the official sales numbers of this game, it's probably safe to assume that the reason why this was the last entry was due to the underperformance of the game. It's a shame considering how good the original game was though and it's most likely a dead franchise at this point. Next up is a franchise that might have had the most unique naming convention out of all of Nintendo's franchise. What franchise is that, I hear you asking? Well obviously I'm talking about Mario Party. Now first introduced in the West in 1999, the games involved Mario and friends travelling around a game board collecting stars which could be bought using the coins earned from winning various minigames. Each game featured different boards which all included different features and surprises to enjoy. Fun fact, Mario Party currently holds the record for the longest running minigame series in video game history. Over the course of 25 years, the 18 games associated with the franchise have sold over 69 million total copies. When you think of Nintendo Party games, this franchise is almost always the first considered, and as a result, deserves a spot as a Nintendo mainstay. Super Smash Bros, or better yet, the haven for characters of dead franchises, was released in 1999 for the N64. Looking to challenge the Avengers for the greatest crossover of characters ever, the original Super Smash Bros featured 12 characters ranging from Samus to Ness. Crazy to think there are now 82 fighters to choose from in Ultimate. The goal of the game? To smash each other. Oh. I mean... 
fight each other until you can knock them off the stage. The idea of Nintendo's iconic characters beating the shit out of each other was amazing and has resulted in the franchise becoming one of the best selling series to date. With releases on every major Nintendo home console since the N64, the franchise has become one of the most recognised even outside of Nintendo. It's gotten so big that characters outside of Nintendo franchises have somehow found their way in. In some cases, just having fighters in the game has helped boost popularity and helped push for the revival of certain series. The series Wild and Limbo now most definitely deserves a spot as a Nintendo flagship franchise. Now here's a game you may or may not have played, and if you did play it, chances are you never actually knew the name of it because your best mate had it pretty much just loaded up on his GameCube 24-7. Oh, shit, that was just me? For those of you that don't know, this is Custom Robo, an arena-style fighting game that had you fight using mecha units. The aim was simple, reduce the enemy's HP to zero while flying, dashing, and maneuvering through 3D arenas. Now, unless you were a true weeb, you probably never had access to this game until Custom Robo Battle Revolution, which happened to be the first game in the franchise to release in the West back in 2004. Unfortunately, this transition didn't reignite the fire under the series, and unfortunately following Custom Robo Arena, which released back in 2006, the series has seemingly died off. Now, I hope you guys aren't sick of Mario yet, because he's back, and this time, not in 3D. Well, I mean, he, he is kind of in 3D, but not really. Paper Mario reverted Mario back to his 2D origins as a paper cutout, while having him move around in a 3D world. The first installment of the series was released in 2000 for the N64, with five sequels following. These games have always been quite niche, but have managed to grow a dedicated fan base. The games have been released consistently every few years, with the most recent being Paper Mario The Origami King in 2020 for the Switch. I think some of you may not agree, but I consider it a mainstay, just based on the consistency and the apparent insistence on keeping the franchise alive by Nintendo. Sin and Punishment was a third-person rail shooter released in 2000 for the N64. The game was initially only ever released in Japan, but would later be released on the Virtual Console in 2007. Similar in nature to the Star Fox series, the games differ in that Sin and Punishment took place entirely on foot, as well as the fact that aiming and movement were completely separate, unlike Star Fox. Players could switch between a lock-on gun mode or a manual gun mode, which was considerably more powerful but harder to aim. The game was received positively and resulted in the game getting a sequel for the Wii in 2008 called Sin and Punishment Star Successor. The use of Wii motion controls allowed for aiming by pointing the Wii remote. Nintendo was unsure if they should release the sequel in America, but due to the success's high sales on the virtual console, they decided it best that they try. It seems that while the game was positively nice. reviewed, sales didn't live up to Nintendo's expectations, as we have yet to receive another release in a franchise since. Nintendo would delve back into the puzzle games with the release of Kururuin, a set of puzzle games where you would need to guard the stick through a set of mazes. As simple as that sounds, this game can get pretty ridiculous, mainly due to the fact that this bloody stick never stops spinning itself around and around. Originally released back in 2001 for the Game Boy, the franchise would see a further two sequels named Kururuin Paradise and Kururuin Squash. Unfortunately, these two remain Japanese exclusives, but a recent release of the game through the Nintendo Switch expansion pass does breathe some life into the franchise. Unfortunately, I believe it is a fleeting breath. Now before the explosive rise of Animal Crossing New Horizons, the franchise was a relatively modest life simulation series. The games themselves have no end goal, with players being able to do anything they wish within the limits of the game. First released in 2001 for the GameCube, the series spans 9 total games, when including the original Japanese version and spin-offs. While many will attribute the majority of its success to New Horizons, there have been multiple games, specifically Wild World for the DS in 2005 and New Leaf for the 3DS in 2013, which have managed to sell more than 10 million copies respectively. The franchise in this regard has been a commercial success, and it's impossible to ignore the explosive rise of New Horizons for the Switch in 2020. It is definitely a Nintendo mainstay, but there are arguments to be made for it being a flagship series. Actually, you know what? I think I might actually place it there at this current moment, as I don't see the next Animal Crossing game flopping. Looking to follow in his brother's footsteps, Luigi took a shot at starting up his own franchise. A fan of the Ghostbusters movies? Well, I'm assuming based on the format of his games. Luigi finds himself rich after winning a luxury mansion. The only problem? The mansion is filled with ghosts, and his brother, Mario, has been captured by their king. This offers a nice dichotomy, featuring the clumsy Luigi as the hero. First appearing on the GameCube in 2001 as a launch title, the franchise has released four games up to this day. The franchise has managed to stay relevant up until 2019, with the release of Luigi's Mansion 3 for the Switch. The games are a breath of fresh air from the usual platformers his brothers involved in. But the overall lack of games means that this franchise can't rank any higher than it exists. 
for now. We now arrive at another franchise that has been lost to time. Golden Sun was first released in 2001 exclusively for the Game Boy Advance. Golden Sun was a traditional RPG game and featured many core aspects such as fighting, leveling up characters, moving through the world and completing dungeons. The game would introduce a few new mechanics though, mainly regarding its version of magic, which could be used not only in combat but outside in the world as well. You were able to move objects, read people's minds and even create whirlwinds. The game received critical acclaim on release and is considered one of the best RPG games of its time. This would result in Nintendo releasing two further games, the first being Golden Sun The Lost Age, released in 2003 for the Game Boy Advance. The second, Golden Sun Dark Dawn for the DS in 2010. Despite positive reviews all around, the lackluster sales must have told Nintendo that interest in the series was dwindling, and as a result, we haven't received a new game since. Unfortunately, it's bordering on being a dead franchise, but I still have hope for the future. One of the most unique and creative franchises developed and published by Nintendo happens to be Pikmin. Released for the GameCube in 2001, the initial game was unlike anything seen before, and followed the story of Olimar after he is left stranded on an unknown planet following his ship getting hit by a comet and crashing. To help him with his journey, Olimar would recruit the help of Pikmin, small plant-like hybrids that could be used to carry, fight, build, and destroy obstacles. The game was received well, and over 20 plus years, the game has released 5 total games. The game, despite its frequent drought periods, is now stronger than ever, and with the recent release of Pikmin 4, I think it may have pushed itself into mainstay territory. It's definitely a good time to be a Pikmin fan. Here's where we start coming across some of the more obscure entries when it comes to Nintendo franchises. Magical Vacation in particular might not ring a bell for many fans of the company, and that's mainly because the first game was only ever released in Japan. These games were your typical RPGs, with you adventuring through different worlds using a turn-based battle system. The series would receive its very own sequel in 2006, which came to be known as Magical Star Sign in the West. This game in particular made use of the DSi's touchscreen, which could be used to interact with the world and move your character. Unfortunately, this is where the franchise has been left, so it is most likely a dead one. Here, we have the closest rival to Kirby, in terms of cuteness. A series of platform games that follow this cute little guy as he ventures through multiple platforming levels. Interestingly, this series tries to make water levels good, and the focus is, ma and focus is mainly on them instead of your typical ground type gameplay. For the most part, this franchise was locked away in Japan. In fact, there were 5 games that released before this guy ever made it to the west. With the release of The Legendary Starfire in 2009 though, the series would finally debut in the West and as such deserves a spot on this list. Unfortunately, this trip to the West also proved to be the last trip this franchise would ever take, as there hasn't been a new entry in the series yet. No, don't do it! The Mario Brothers decided to team up for once in their own franchise. The first adventure would take place on the Game Boy Advance in 2003 in Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga. For the most part, the games function differently from other role-playing games, as it involved the player controlling both Mario and Luigi simultaneously. This was achieved by having Luigi follow close behind while having buttons mapped separately to each, the A for Mario and B for Luigi for example. The franchise has remained exclusively on portable devices, with the latest being a remake of Mario and Luigi Bowser's Inside Story, which was released on the 3DS in 2019. The company behind these charming games, Alpha Dream, unfortunately filed for bankruptcy in 2019, making the future of this franchise very dark. Even with its recent releases, this series can't go above live support. Here's a franchise that I never expected to make a return. Another code was a point and click adventure game released all the way back in 2005. The game made full use of the DS's capabilities. Players could move Ashley with a stylus as she advanced through environments solving puzzles in hopes of discovering what happened to her late father. The game was well received and got its very own sequel which released back in 2009. From here though, another code became another day, and another day, and another passed without any news of a new game. This went on for over a decade, until recently where both a remake of the original game as well as a sequel were released. This fast tracks the series straight into the it exists here in my opinion. If I'm being honest, I was unaware that this game even had a sequel, as I've only ever played the original Nintendogs. The game itself was pretty much like having a dog, while also not having a dog. You could play with them, you could wash them, you could feed them, and even enter them into frisbee throwing competitions, which by the way, pro tip, was the easiest way to make money in that game. The game was a hit with fans, leading to its monumental 24 million sales. Six years later, the game received its sequel in the form of Nintendogs plus Cats for the 3DS. This game sold decently well, but it was nowhere near the levels of its predecessor. Since then, we have yet to see another game. So no, there hasn't been a Nintendogs plus Cats plus Turtles. I know, I'm deeply saddened by this as well. And from the looks of it, we'll probably never get it, as the franchise is most likely dead.
Again, we've come to one of those franchises that I'm not even sure if I should have included, but based on the criteria, it fits. Clubhouse Games is a collection of 42 all-time classics, featuring card games like Blackjack all the way to board games like Shoji and Chinese Checkers. The game, if you can even call it one, was just a collection of other games, and obviously did well enough to warrant a follow-up in 2020, also titled Clubhouse Games, but this time, it included 51 worldwide classics. Honestly, I don't really want to rank this higher than it exists, so we'll just leave it there for now. It should probably be in life support, or just not exist in the first place. So one of the more tragic declines I've seen comes at the expense of this next franchise, Chibi Robo. First released in 2005 for the GameCube, Chibi Robo Plug and Adventure had Chibi Robo game's silent protagonist clean up around the Sanderson's house. As you progress in the game, the platforming would become more challenging due to the short height of Chibi. Initial reception to the game was positive and would urge Nintendo to follow up on it with the release of a further four sequels. Each game would see a decline in sales however, and in a last ditch effort to save the series, Nintendo decided to change the game from a 3D platformer to a 2D platformer in the same vein as a Castlevania game. They also bundled an amiibo character with retail versions of the latest game, Chibi Robo Ziplash. But this did little to save it, as sales were at an all-time low. Many consider the commercial failure of Ziplash to be the final nail in the coffin, as no plans have been discussed regarding future entries. The best-selling Nintendo game ever, well if you could even count it as one, considering that it was packaged with the console it was played on. But Wii Sports was revolutionary in what it was able to do. It was essentially a glorified tech demo to show off the Wii's motion controls, but went on to receive universal acclaim. This would spawn endless amounts of sequels and spin-offs, mainly in terms of party games. Some of the sub-series spawned from Wii Sports included Wii Party, which featured two games, Wii Play, Wii Fit, Wii Chess, and out of all of these, Wii Sports is the only franchise that has continued to be released to this day. I'm not sure if you can count Switch Sports as a sequel, but many consider it to be it. I would say that Wii Sports, or just Nintendo Sports at this point, I don't know what to name it really, but it falls into the It Exists category. The inconsistency in releases makes sure it can't reach mainstay status. Well, can you guess this next franchise based on what you just heard? I'll give you a clue. It starts with Rhythm and ends with Heaven. Wait, fuck. Released in 2006 for the Game Boy Advance, exclusively in Japan, and originally known as Rhythm Tengoku, the game would first test the player with a rhythm test upon starting. Regardless, it would be another three years before the franchise would make it to the Western world. Now formally known as Rhythm Heaven, the game was released in 2009 for the Nintendo DS. Similarly to the original game, Rhythm Heaven featured multiple minigames that were highly unique and required precise timing and rhythm. Players would use the styles to touch and swipe at the right times. The game was praised for its innovative take on the tired minigame genre, and as a result, two more games would be released, Rhythm Heaven Fever for the Wii in 2012, and most recently, Rhythm Heaven Mega Mix for the 3DS in 2016. Unfortunately, the franchise has not seen a new installment since Mega Mix, and at the current rate, it's looking dire for the continuation of this beloved series. Have you ever wanted to raise your IQ by 50? Well, this next franchise won't help you with that, but it does involve fun interactive puzzle games that help you better use your brain. Brain Age was the go-to game back in the day, with the original game selling over 19 million copies. The franchise has five games to its name, with the latest release being Dr. Kawashima's Brain Training for the Switch in 2019. As of yet, there has been no NA release for this game, but it did release in EU and AU in 2020. Due to its niche nature, I believe it can't move past It Exists though. Now after wiping out most of the real life professional athletes like Tiger Woods and Lionel Messi, Mario thought it best to take on another franchise, and who better than Sega's Sonic. This has become more of a tradition nowadays, whenever there's the Olympics or Winter Olympics and you can kind of expect a Mario and Sonic game. Is that enough to push it into mainstays? Not really. I would just say it exists and just pops up every 4 years. Now have you ever wanted to go scuba diving but can't swim? Well, have I got just the franchise for you. I introduce you to Endless Ocean, released on the Wii in 2007. The game involves the player exploring the vast ocean while encountering an extensive list of marine life. You can also go cave diving, trench exploring and wreck diving. So pretty much all the most dangerous shit ever without any of the real danger. Sounds fun right? Well enough people thought so to warrant a sequel which was released in 2010 for the Wii. Not sure what happened, but since, the notion of exploring the sea no longer seems to interest Nintendo, making for another sunken franchise. The next franchise featured is one of the few that features mystery adventure games. Hotel Dusk is a relatively unknown franchise, first released in 2007 for the Nintendo DS. 
The game had you hold your Nintendo DS sideways and use the touch controls to unlock combination locks and observe other things. The game did receive good ratings and within three years a sequel was produced called Last Window, The Secret of Cape West. While never formally released in America, EU received the game months after Japan and since then no mentions of the franchise have been made. Honestly I have no idea what this franchise is nor how it's managed to release 4 games, but from what I can tell it's a fashion game series where the player must operate a boutique and coordinate outfits. You can also compete in contests to become the stylist champion. What's surprising is that this game was the best selling game in Japan of any format on release. As a result the game would receive 3 sequels up until 2017 with Style Savvy Styling Star. Due to the games being exclusive released on handheld consoles, it's hard to say whether a future game will be made. Nintendo has recently released Fashion Dreamer in 2023, which somewhat acts as a spiritual successor to the style savvy franchise. This could breathe new life into the franchise moving it from life support into it exists, but it's hard to say if it's really part of the same franchise at all. One of Nintendo's most iconic ideas was the introduction of the Mii characters. Little customizable characters where people could really make some of the most foulest looking entities known to man. But yet, imagine taking care of those Mii's but helping them with their personal tasks, making friends, or even dressing them up a little bit. This was essentially the goal of the Tomodachi games. First released as a Japanese exclusive back in 2009, the series would eventually travel across the sea to the west, where the franchise got a sequel in 2013 called Tomodachi Life. While this remains to be the latest game in the franchise, a similar game titled Miitopia would end up being released in 2016 as somewhat of a spiritual successor. Unfortunately, with the release of the Switch and the silent execution of the Miis in general, I don't think we will be seeing a new entry in this franchise for a while at least. Now have you ever wanted to learn how to draw? Well, I would advise taking up art lessons. Or, better yet, you could play Nintendo's greatest franchise ever, Art Academy. Now obviously I'm exaggerating a bit here, but this franchise did actually have a good few training exercises that would actually help you learn to draw. Well, as well as you could draw on ADS that is. But the series did have a good run through the early 2010s, where it released over 6 games in total. The latest game would release back in 2016, so for now it's most likely on live support. Fossil Fighters was first introduced in 2008 for the Nintendo DS. The central concept of the game was the revival of prehistoric fossils which would turn into supernatural forms known as vivosaurs. Using their elemental energy, the player would use them to engage in combat with other vivosaurs. The game would receive a mixed reviews, with groups like IGN shitting on it, calling it a Pokemon ripoff. Even so, the franchise would see the inclusion of a further two games, and Fossil Fighters Champion released for the Nintendo DS in 2011, and most recently Fossil Fighters Frontier for the 3DS in 2015. The franchise never took off however, and after receiving mixed reception three times, it seems Nintendo's pulled the plug on it quickly making a name for itself as one of the greatest JRPG franchises ever. Xenoblade Chronicles first appeared on the Wii in 2011. The game follows the story of Shulk and his ability to use the Monado. The game was praised for its open world aspects and unique gameplay that allowed for movement during fights. The game would sell relatively well and push Nintendo to task Monolith Soft with making more games. Over the last decade, the franchise has seen the release of a further three Xenoblade Chronicles games, with the latest being released very recently in the form of Xenoblade Chronicles 3. While still a fairly new and niche franchise, with each new addition the fanbase grows. If it continues on this trajectory, and with the new series the team have in store, then I'm sure it will make a spot for itself in Nintendo's mainstays. For now though, due to the lower sales and niche genre, it will remain in the It Exists tier. Fluidity is one of the few successful pitches to Nintendo from an outside company that resulted in them publishing the game. Released exclusively on the Wii Wear Shop in 2010, the game had the player twisting and tilting their Wii remote to use various forms and properties of water to solve problems and defeat enemies. While there are no official sales records, the original game must have sold decently well to ensure a sequel. Fluidity Spin Cycle was released in 2012 on the 3DS shop, but due to extremely poor sales, it's unlikely that the franchise will ever see the light of day again. Now interestingly enough, this franchise was initially planned and teased as a tech demo for the Nintendo DS in 2004. After many years, the franchise would be revived and formally released in 2011 for the 3DS. Using the touchscreen, players would be met with what was made to look like the control panel of a submarine. The goal was to direct submarines through several different ocean locations. Each level featured multiple paths one could choose, as well as enemies that fired missiles. The game received poor reviews leading to the release of a free-to-play sequel in 2014 titled Steel Diver Sub Wars. While faring better in the eyes of critics, when compared to the first game, it was obvious following the game's release that this franchise was most likely never going to surface again. 
Made up of entirely digital games, Pushmo is a series of puzzle games for the 3DS and Wii U. Released in 2011 for the 3DS, the game featured a relatively simple gameplay mechanic that involved the player pushing and pulling blocks in a structure to climb up and rescue a child. Three follow-up games were released all digitally in 2012, 2014 and 2015. That marks the end of the franchise though it seems, as no new games have been announced or teased since. Just like Push Mode, this next franchise is made up of almost a full lineup of digital games. The Dylan franchise started off as a downloadable video game through Nintendo's eShop. Playing as Dylan, the Armadillo, the games were a mixture of tower defense, adventure games, where you would defend different towns in the outback by either clobbering them yourself or by setting up different defense towers that could be upgraded through collecting materials beforehand. After its initial release, the series would get a further two sequel, the latest of which releasing with a physical copy in the EU and here in Australia. Seeing as the game released back in 2018, I think it's enough to slot it into the it exists here for now. Box Boy was a series of puzzle platformers that was released primarily for the Nintendo 3DS. First featured in 2015, the game featured, well, a box boy named QB. Now QB had the ability to spawn boxes from his body that he would use to traverse the 173 challenges before him. Each world would often introduce a new feature and the concepts would rarely be reused. This unique take on puzzle solving was praised by critics leading to the release of a further three games. The most recent entry was Box Boy plus Box Girl, which was released for the Nintendo Switch in 2019. This game, as you can probably guess, introduced co-op play, allowing two players to play as QB and QC. Considering the franchise is still in its infancy, but has managed to release four games over such a short time span, I think it's safe to have it in the It Exist tier for now. I don't think it reaches the same number of eyes as Mainstays though. We have now arrived at the latest and the most recent Nintendo franchise. While not technically the most recent, it is the most recent one that has had multiple games put into it. Splatoon exploded onto the scene in 2015 for the Wii U, and since then has only continued to grow. A team-based action shooter, the game received positive reviews with players finding the unique take on the shooter genre refreshing and fun to play. Featuring a multitude of weapons and maps, the game had you splashing the map with ink and marking it as your territory. Teammates could then use this ink to transform into a squid and travel twice as fast as normal. In its lifetime, the game would sell close to 5 million copies, which was monumental on a system that only managed to sell 13 to 14 million units as a whole. This would result in two sequels fittingly named Splatoon 2 in 2017, and recently Splatoon 3 in 2022, both for the Switch. The popularity of the series has skyrocketed since, with both Splatoon 2 and 3 selling well over 10 million copies. At this rate, it could very well become a Nintendo flagship, which is even more impressive given its age. For now though, due to the small number of games released, I think it still belongs in the mainstays category. And there you have it, that is the completed list of Nintendo franchises. Now if there's one thing that Nintendo does well, it's that it makes such a large variety of games that anybody, no matter what, regardless of things like age, gender, nationality, or even beliefs, anyone and everyone can pick up a Nintendo game and enjoy it. And despite it having quite a few dead franchises, it still has probably the most beloved franchises out of any gaming company in the entire world. Now despite me saying that, Nintendo isn't the only gaming company in the world. We're far from the only one to create iconic and beloved franchises. Out of the countless companies that come and go, very few ever reach the top and sit amongst the titans of the industry. This next one though, not only fought its way to the top, but also held its own while birthing some of the most prestigious and godly gaming franchises to this day. Capcom would start its journey with the release of a coin-operated arcade machine called Little League in July of 1983. They would follow up with another one in October called Fever Chance. Now while these aren't technically a franchise, I thought it best to mention them as they would mark the beginning of what would one day become one of the biggest Japan-based video game companies in the world. After dipping its toes into the arcade market, Capcom would release its first real arcade game, Volgus, in 1984. Vulgus had the player take control of a spaceship as it cruised across an alien planet. The spaceship was equipped with a simple blaster and also had a limited supply of missiles that could be replenished with the power icons. A sequel called Titan Warriors was actually developed for the NES, but unfortunately was never released. Well, at least that's what Capcom believed, because a playable finished ROM was actually made available online since its cancellation. Safe to say, this franchise has no consistency, and while it was one of the more popular arcade games of its time, sales as a whole remain fairly low. 
The games have actually had representation in future games, however, such as the power icon being reused in future Capcom games, a boss being named after the initial game, as well as the mention of Volgus 2 from Deadpool in a future fighting game. All in all, while it got the ball rolling for Capcom, it's safe to say that this franchise is dead, if you can even call it a franchise. Just six months after the release of Volgus, Capcom would release another arcade game, this time going by 1942. The game was a vertically scrolling shoot 'em up game based on the events of World War II. The player was tasked with reaching Tokyo and destroying the Japanese air fleet. Wait, what? What? The reason this odd approach was taken was Capcom had started targeting a more global Western audience. But this approach would certainly pay off as the game became a commercial success ranking within Japan's five highest grossing table arcade games of 1986. It would then be ported over to the NES where it would go on to sell over 1 million copies worldwide. As a result, a further 8 games would release under the 1904X name, starting with 1943, The Battle of Midway, ending with 1942, First Strike, and 2010. While once a consistent franchise, there hasn't been a new entry in over a decade. The franchise as a whole has sold over 1.4 million units, and while that may not seem like a lot these days, that was extremely impressive back then. Unfortunately, due to the lack of new games and a lack of further representation outside of a few re-releases on newer consoles such as the Wii Virtual Console, the franchise at this stage is most likely dead. Capcom would continue its streak of successful arcade franchises with the release of Commando in 1985. Commando would adopt a vertically scrolling format, but instead of a plane, the player took control of a military soldier named Super Joe. Equipped with an assault rifle and a limited handful of grenades, Joe was tasked with fending off a massive assault of enemies while the screen panned upwards. The game was a commercial success, at one point becoming the world's top arcade game after ending the 1985 year as the highest grossing arcade game. In a similar fashion to 1942, the game would be ported over to the NES where it would once again sell over 1 million copies worldwide. At this point, I'm sure people were calling it the NES effect. Once called the great granddaddy of the modern shoot 'em up genre, the game would be highly influential in popularizing the run and gun shooter style. The game would spawn two sequels in the form of Mercs released in 1989 and Wolf of the Battlefield Commando 3 which was released as a downloadable title in 2008. Due to the lack of consistency and other meaningful additions to the franchise, I believe it's now a dead franchise though. Capcom had proven with these last two franchises that they were here to stay. The question was, could Capcom make it a hat trick? Well, not only did they strike gold once again, this next franchise went far beyond anything the previous two franchises had ever done. Released in 1985 for arcades, Ghosts and Goblins was a running gun platformer that had players con take control of a knight named Sir Arthur. Princess Prinprin has been kidnapped by Astaroth, and it's up to Sir Arthur to rescue her while defeating zombies, giants, demons, and whatever the fuck this thing is. Along his journey, the player could pick up new weapons, bonuses, and even extra suits of armor. The game is infamous for its extremely hard difficulty, which personally I never really understood, and to me it just sounds like something bad players Ah, uh, sorry guys, I slipped up there. But like I was saying, if you were even decently good at- Huh. That's weird. I think the game's kind of bugging out a bit. Regardless- Okay, yeah. This game's fucking hard. Two hits. That's all you get before losing a life. And if you lost a life, you'd have to start the level from the beginning, or at the halfway point if you had reached it. Not only this, but the sick bastards behind the game also made it so that once you had beaten the final boss, you'd have to then replay the whole game on an even harder difficulty, just to achieve the true final ending. The game united masochists across the world, as it became one of the best-selling arcade games of its time. It was also, and you know the drill by now, ported over to the NES among other consoles where it would sell over 1.6 million copies worldwide. The game was so popular that it not only resulted in four mainline sequels, a puzzle game, a gambling game, and two mobile games, but it also spawned two separate spin-off series that each had multiple games of their own. The first of these spin-off series was Gargoyle's Quest released in 1990 for the Game Boy, an action-adventure platform game that flipped the narrative as it had you play as Firebrand, a crowd-favorite antagonist character from the original Ghost and Goblin series. The game would accommodate two styles of gameplay, an overhead view when traveling around the world as well as the 2D action platformer levels. Firebrand could jump, cling to walls, hover for a short while, and fire projectiles. One sequel and one prequel would be developed for the series. Gargoyle's Quest 2 for the NES in 1992, and Demon's Crest for the SNES in 1994. Now I wonder if you guys know which was which. Despite being praised for its detailed graphics and novel scrolling camera, the series would not release another game following Demon's Crest. The games would, however, release on the Switch Online service earlier this year. Over a decade later, the second spin-off series, Maximo, would release for the PlayStation 2 in 2001. 
Originally planned for the N64, the game was an attempt to merge Ghost and Goblin's universe with illustrator Suzumu Matsushita's manga artwork, but unfortunately was delayed before being transferred to the PS2. The game begins with Maximo returning to his castle, only to get one hit by his own advisor Achille. Realizing that if he were to die, the game would be very short, Maximo instead strikes a deal with death himself and is brought back to life with the goal of stopping Achilles' evil plan. The gameplay involves players hacking and slashing their way through countless enemies. As was the case in the Ghost series, Maximo would also wear armor that would slowly break as he incurred more hits from enemies. Unlike the Ghost series, players were able to pay the Grim Reaper death coins in order to retry, with each death increasing the amount owed. Taking place over 5 major worlds, each world would consist of multiple stages and a boss battle. Upon defeating these bosses, players were given a few choices. You could get a health bonus, you could save the game, or you could receive a kiss from the rescued sorceress. Now I don't know about you guys, but one of these options is far superior to the rest. <coughs> The game would receive fairly favourable reviews and would make the PlayStation 2 greatest hits after selling more than 400,000 units in North America. Within two years, a sequel titled Maximo vs Army of Sin would release for the PlayStation 2 in 2003. Featuring many of the core aspects of the original, the game would receive favourable reviews but would only go on to sell about 200,000 units, a 50% drop from the first game. Following its release, Studio 8, the developers of Maximo, began working on a third game. Concept art as well as an early playable prototype were actually shown. However, the game would never get the green light from Capcom, and as a result, Maximo vs Army of Sin remains the series' latest entry. The two games would, however, be released on the PlayStation Network for the PS3 in 2011. Overall, the Ghost and Goblins franchise as well as its spin-off series have seen commercial success and have built their own dedicated fanbase. The main series would go on to get its own resurrection on the Switch in 2021, fittingly titled Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection. Along with this, Arthur, Firebrand, and the universe itself would make several cameos in other franchises, from Arthur's costumes in the Mega Man and Smash series, to playable characters in the X Capcom series and Versus Capcom series. All in all, I believe Ghosts and Goblins has potential to be a Capcom mainstay, or at least in the year it exists here, while its two spin-off series are most likely either in the dead or zombie tier for now. Continuing on with their lucrative arcade series, Capcom would look to plagiarize their own franchise, but this time, they would add the word Bionic in front of it. Released in Japan in 1987 as Top Secret, the game followed protagonist Nathan Rad Spencer as he was tasked with uncovering what happened to another super agent, whom you may remember as Super Joe. Now, this connection was purely created for Western audiences, and was never the intent of the series creator Takuru Fujiwara. So while there may be discourse regarding whether they're a part of the same franchise or not, I chose to separate them as two unique series. The Bionic Commando games were platform games in which the player couldn't jump. Instead, players could use a bionic arm to swing across gaps and climb ledges. The game would be received well, going on to become the fifth most successful table arcade game of the month. Now I know what you're thinking, you know, let me guess, they ported this game over to the NES and it sold a billion copies. Well, you're partially right, but instead of just directly porting the game over, Capcom would introduce some significant changes in the form of removing any and all references to Nazism that was present in the original Japanese version. As for the game's sales, well, there's no information I could find apart from the fact that Capcom employee Ben Jude said that the game did not sell well in Japan. This didn't mark the end of the Bionic Commando franchise however, as multiple sequels would be released for the series in the form of Bionic Commando Elite Forces, which was released in 1999 for the Game Boy Color and acted as a sequel to the original 1987 arcade version of the game, as well as Bionic Commando, which was released in 2009 for the PS3, Xbox 360, and PC, as a sequel to the 1998 NES version. The NES version of the game would also receive a portable adaption for the Game Boy in 1992, as well as an enhanced remake titled Bionic Commando Rearmed, which was made available on PlayStation Network and Xbox Live in 2008. This was also a prelude to the 2009 version Bionic Commando. Rearmed would then get a sequel three years later in 2011 with Bionic Commando Rearmed 2. Confused yet? I mean, I certainly am as I write this. Hell, I'm not even sure if I've got this all right. But as of the current day, this is where the franchise stands. Rad Spencer would go on to make future appearances in games such as Marvel vs Capcom, but as a whole, I believe this franchise is looking well towards life support. Now by this stage, Capcom had established itself as a somewhat considerable force within the gaming space. What they didn't realise at the time, however, was that their next franchise would not only continue the success, but shoot them straight to stardom. Street Fighter would make its first appearance in 1987 for arcades. The franchise became a breakout success, selling up to 1,000 cabinets. Wait, 
That's it? Well, in reality, the original punching pad cabinet was poorly received. It wasn't until the alternative six button version was released that Street Fighter actually got some recognition. Playing as the iconic character Ryu, players would engage in one-on-one -on -one fights against the CPU or another player who took control of Ryu's former partner and current rival, Ken. Using a best of three format, players could use the joysticks and buttons to move left and right, crouch, jump, and block. They would also have access to three punch and kick attacks. Three special attacks could also be used, the Hadouken, the Tatsumaki Senpaku, and the Shiryuken. The game would become Japan's fifth highest grossing arcade game in 1987, before taking the top spot in January of 1988. Despite this, the game wasn't considered a breakout success. It would, however, lead the groundwork for the game that would change everything. Following the commercial success of Final Fight, another fighting game franchise that we'll cover later in this video, Capcom would begin developing an interest in a Street Fighter sequel. Yoshiki Okamoto recounted at the time, the idea was to revive Street Fighter and to make it a better playing arcade game as a whole. Over the course of two years from 1989 to 1991, a team of 35 to 40 people including Noritaka Funamizu, Akira Nishitani and Akira Yasuda would work tirelessly on the game. The result? was a product that would shake the very foundations of the gaming industry. Street Fighter 2 would release on the 6th of February 1991 in arcades. The game would follow several conventions and rules established by its predecessor, such as the best of three one-on-one -on -one timed format, in which the winner was decided based on who had more health at the end. Street Fighter 2 heavily expanded on its predecessor though, becoming the first one-on-one -on -one fighting game to feature a whole cast of characters that players could freely choose from, each with their own specific movesets. Grappling moves and throws would also feature in this rendition with the addition of new special attacks. So it kind of hyped up Street Fighter 2 at the start, but the game wasn't actually that successful in Japan initially, mainly because players were actually going at it solo, which is something someone like me with no friends would do. It wasn't until Japan arcade magazine Gamest published some articles informing people like, hey, you know you can play this game with other people, right? That the game would finally start gaining some traction. I say some traction, but in reality, it would bulldoze through everything without ever looking back. In the United States specifically, the game was immediately successful, exceeding all expectations set. It became the highest grossing arcade game of 1991, and by 1994, had already been played by over 25 million people in the United States alone. To this day, more than 200,000 arcade cabinets, as well as 15 million units have been sold, bringing the gross revenue of this one singular game to a staggering 10 billion plus, and inspired grassroots tournament events that have culminated into the massively popular Evolution Championship Series, also known as EVO. This monumental success has resulted in numerous mainline sequels in the form of Street Fighter 3 released in 1997, Street Fighter 4 released in 2008, and most recently Street Fighter 5, which was released in 2016. Street Fighter 6 is on the horizon as well, looking to be released in June of this year. But wait, that's not all. This series would go on to receive multiple sub-series as well, the first of which was the Street Street Fighter Alpha series. The series would feature only three titles between the years 1995 to 1998, and look to flesh out the backstory and grudges held by many of the classic Street Fighter 2 characters. A year later, Capcom would co-produce a 3D fighting game named Street Fighter EX with Arika, a company founded by Akira Nishitani, who had worked as a designer on the Street Fighter 2 games. The game would combine the classic Street Fighter roster with new faces from Akira, while featuring gameplay similar to Street Fighter 2 and the Street Fighter Alpha series. The series would see a further two games in the form of Street Fighter EX 2 in 1990 and finally, Street Fighter EX3 for the PS2 in the year 2000. Now, there are technically more sub-series, such as the Super Puzzle Fighter games, Super Gem Fighter Mini Mix, which got their own mobile spin-off series, and there are also countless crossover games, but I thought I'd leave them for now and come back to them as separate franchises. With all that said, we can finally place the Street Fighter friend. But wait, what? Are you serious? There's more? Well, we can't forget about all the other media such as anime films, animated TV shows, manga and comics, live action films, and the- Alright, we get it. Jesus Christ. Street Fighter has made a name for itself as Capcom's first flagship. It remains one to this day. As for its sub-series, I believe they're most likely in the zombie tier, as there's always a chance for revival when branding the Street Fighter name. At this point, there should be something glaringly obvious. All these franchises so far have been, well, produced by Capcom. Well, no shit. Now all jokes aside, what is apparent though, is that up until this point, Capcom had been developing games purely for arcades and not really home consoles. During the mid 1980s, Capcom looked to change this though and started working on a project specifically for home consoles. By the end of 1987, the game would release with the now iconic title, 
Mega Man. The first Mega Man game would release on the NES and follow the struggles of humanoid robot called, well, Mega Man. The player would take control of Mega Man and fight through six stages, all of which culminated in a boss battle against one of the six robot masters. The game was one of the first to introduce a non-linear path, allowing the player to choose the order in which they take on these stages. Part of the game's strategy was to pick out stages that would earn the players the most useful weapons that could be used in future stages. Critics praised Mega Man for its design and many of the core aspects that would go on to craft the subsequent games. Funnily enough, not even Capcom thought this game would sell, they thought it would flop, but after decent games in Japan, the team quickly commissioned an American localization. Now as part of this rush to localization, Capcom would have to get someone to draw the cover art in as little as 6 hours, and the West as a result was blessed with this masterpiece. Nice. Yeah, the game didn't sell well, but it was obviously good enough to start pumping out sequels, as two years later, Mega Man 2 would release. And two years after that, Mega Man 3 would release. And from there, the classic Mega Man series would see a new game released pretty much every single year until 1996. Mega Man would then go on vacation for 12 years before returning in Mega Man 9, 10, and most recently, Mega Man 11, which was released in 2018 for all consoles. Now you may be thinking, well dang, you know, 12 years without a new game, the franchise almost died. Well, let me introduce you to the 50 billion sub-series and spin-offs that were released before, during, and after the classic Mega Man's vacation. We'll quickly run through each one so this video isn't longer than it already is. As the series moved from the NES to the SNES, Capcom looked to redesign the series both in terms of graphics and controls. What they created was X, the successor to Mega Man, who was more advanced and had complete free will over his thoughts and feelings. The games would feature a similar format to the original NES, with stages that offered different weapons upon defeating each boss. New additions included the ability to dash, scale walls, and even obtain armor attachments, creating access to special abilities. The game would perform well and spark the start of a new series that has seen eight total mainline games over the last Last two decades, with various other spin offs and legacy collections. The game's narrative has yet to conclude, with Mega Man X8 ending on a cliffhanger in 2004. Since then, multiple collections have been released, as well as the latest game in the subseries, Rockman X Dive, which was released in 2020 as a mobile game. While there hasn't been a new mainline entry since 2004, multiple legacy collections, as well as the recent mobile game, do enough to just barely keep it in the life support tier. After screwing around on Nintendo consoles for a bit, Mega Man would then make his way over to the PlayStation in 1997 with Mega Man Legends. Now in 3D, the game looked to take advantage of the console's hardware, shifting its gameplay from the usual side-scrolling platformer to an action-adventure game sandbox with RPG elements. The series unfortunately only has two mainline games and a spin-off. Mega Man Legends 3 was at one point in development before being cancelled in late 2011 with no plans to resume development. A campaign would actually start, known as Get Me Off The Moon, in which over 100,000 people pushed for the game's release. This would include sending letters, emails, and even calling Capcom's headquarters in order to get them to change their minds. Capcom has acknowledged this, but has stayed firm in their decision to this day. There is a small possibility it'll come back, so I believe it goes in the zombie tier. And while that's tragic to hear, it's not like Mega Man fans were starred for content, because let's have a look here. Oh yeah, we're only on sub-series 3 of 80 billion. So we've had 2D platformer games, 3D action adventure games with RPG elements, you know, I wonder what would happen if they were to expand on those RPG elements. Well, you'd get the Mega Man Battle Network games. These games were primarily developed for the Game Boy, amidst the success of Nintendo and Game Freak's Pokemon series. The series would have players take control of LAN, on the outside and megaman.exe within the net. While in control of LAN, players could explore the world map, check emails, purchase items, and even interact with NPCs. The combat, however, only ever took place within the net and featured a grid that was divided into two sides. On one side, you had megaman.exe. On the other side, you had, well, the enemies. The simple goal was to wipe out the enemies on the other side using Mega Man's signature arm cannon. The initial games were met with positive reviews and over the course of eight years would see six main games released ending with Mega Man Battle Network 6 as well as multiple spin-offs. The series was deemed by developers as complete following Battle Network 6 due to the new DS hardware and therefore we can put it into the finished category. Up until this point, none of these series had a real definitive conclusion, at least in terms of its story. That was about to change though in 2012 with the release of Mega Man Zero. Now Zero wasn't a completely original character, as he served as X's sidekick in the Mega Man X subseries. The gameplay for the series remained fairly similar to how Zero played in the X series, with an in-depth ranking system that actually rewarded players with new abilities and enhancements based on how well they performed. Legend has it that the saying, get good, actually originated during this era, because well, it actually held true to some extent. 
The series would also introduce the Cyber Elf system, which allowed Zero to equip the slaves, I mean, small helpers being known as Cyber Elves. These would assist them in combat and provide permanent enhancements. The series was regarded as a return to form for the Mega Man franchise. It would go on to include a further three games until Mega Man Zero 4. With this fourth installment, Mega Man Zero would become the first series in the franchise to reach a definitive conclusion, meaning we can also place it in the finished tier. Now set 200 years after the events of the Zero series, we now arrive at Mega Man ZX, released in 2006 for the Nintendo DS. The player now had the choice between a male and female protagonist, a first for the franchise. The game took elements from both the X and Zero series and had players explore a 2D overlaid map as sprites before engaging enemies to finish their missions. These missions were selected from a list that was displayed on a computer, and players had the choice of exploring both the game world, during and between missions. A sequel would release a year later in 2007 called Mega Man ZX Advent and would mark the last entry into the sub-series. A third entry codenamed Mega Man ZXZ would enter development during 2008 was later cancelled by Capcom. Because of this, it's hard to see the sub-series making a grand return. It would however be included in a legacy collection in 2020, and I'm not going to write off the potential new entry when it comes to the Mega Man name, so I'll put it in zombie tier for now. Now is there anyone even still with me? Well, if you are, you may be glad to hear that we've arrived at the final sub-series of this massive franchise. Acting as a follow-up to the Battle Network series and commemorating the 20th anniversary of the franchise as a whole, Mega Man Star Force would release for the Nintendo DS in 2006. Star Force would draw a lot of its gameplay elements from Battle Network, with players battling within a 3x5 grid and using battle cards to attack enemies. A total of three games would release for the series, ending with Star Force 3 in 2008, with people criticizing it for its lack of innovation in regards to its similarities with the Battle Network games. As is the case with a lot of these sub-series, another sequel was actually put into development from 2009 to 2010, but due to the low sales of Star Force 3, this as well would end up being cancelled by Capcom. It seems at this point that Capcom has no plans to continue the series, Overall, the franchise has amassed a total of 38 million units sold across all its games. Pair that with countless appearances in other media such as anime, TV, film adaptions and comics, and the franchise has easily become one of Capcom's biggest flagships. Get that shit out of here. You want to see a real ninja? Here. Okay, I swear he does cool stuff. Let me introduce you to Strata Hiryu, the protagonist of, well, Strata. Released in 1989 for arcades, the game was developed in conjunction with the manga studio Moto Kikaku. The game was a hack and slash platform game in which players controlled Strata as he ripped through his enemies. Strata was able to perform multiple aerial moves, including regular vertical jumps as well as cartwheel jumps. Additionally, he was able to climb across walls and ceilings and slide under certain objects. This style of gameplay was innovative for its time and has been cited as a major influence for future franchises such as Ninja Gaiden and Devil May Cry. The franchise would see a further two sequels produced, Strider 2 and, uh, Strider 2? Wait a minute! Strider 2, which was known as Journey from Darkness Strider Returns in North America, would release in 1990. The game was published by US Gold under license from Capcom USA and is considered non-canon. The game would receive fairly poor reviews, with some describing it as seeing a loved one revived as a mindless zombie. Nine years later, Capcom themselves thought, fuck it, let's just make our own true sequel, also called Strider 2. Unfortunately, this game was too met with mixed reviews due to its short length and overall lack of innovation. The franchise would return in 2014 with a reboot of the original, which is where the series has been left to this day. Strider being the ninja he is, has managed to sneak his way into a few other franchises though, such as Capcom vs games and Mega Man Legends among others. Seeing as we haven't seen a new original game in over two decades though, I can only place the franchise in live support. The next banger Capcom would release out into the world was Final Fight, released in arcades in 1989. The game took the format of a side-scrolling beat-em-up, where the player had the choice between three playable characters, Mike, Cody, and Guy. The premise of the game revolved around fighting your way through different sections of Metro City in an attempt to rescue Mike's daughter and Cody's girlfriend, Jessica. The game allowed two players to play at once and offered a variety of moves, including standard punches, aerial kicks, and even grabbing and throwing enemies. Weapons and health recovery items could also be picked up off the ground and used. Each stage would end with a boss battle, which... I swear it seemed much harder when I was younger. Wow. The game would go on to receive major commercial success in arcades, selling over 30,000 arcade units, prompting the release of two further sequels, multiple spin-off games, as well as, you guessed it, a port to a home console, in this case the SNES. The port, while omitting Guy completely, as well as having no multiplayer aspect, would go on to sell 1.5 million cartridges, making it one of Capcom's best-selling games on the platform. 
Capcom would follow up on this by releasing both Final Fight 2 and 3 with each of subsequent game, introducing new playable characters. Chuck in a few spin-off games like Revenge and Streetwise, and you've got a franchise that has managed to sell over 3 million units worldwide. The latest game, Final Fight Streetwise, which was released in 2006 for the PlayStation 2 and Xbox, was met with poor reviews, many criticizing the camera, graphics, and overall lackluster polish of the product. It's hard to say whether this has turned Capcom off the series, but at the moment I believe it's on live support due to the community's efforts, even recently looking to port a definitive version to the Sega Genesis with Final Fight Ultimate. Now Capcom would enter the RPG market with the Breath of Fire series in 1993. The series is notable for its reoccurring characters and somewhat ambiguous continuity across all its games. The games all offer their own self-contained stories but follow the journey of Ryu and Nina, well at least most of them do. These games draw a lot of the aspects from other traditional RPGs of the time, featuring the classic turn-based combat formula, 2D character sprites presented from a top-down perspective. Players would move Ryu around the world map and engage in battles to progress the story. These battles would trigger randomly and would often take place in areas such as dungeons. The franchise has grown to include six mainline games as well as multiple mobile games. Up until 2003, the games had been developed for home consoles such as the SNES and PlayStation, but following the release of Breath of Fire 5 Dragon Court in 2002, Capcom would shift the franchise to release only on mobile devices. A total of five mobile games have been released, with the latest Breath of Fire 6 released in 2016. I'm sure many of you consider this franchise to be dead, and in a sense, if you're ranking it based on the West only, it certainly would, as none of the mobile games have ever escaped Japan. Capcom themselves stated that they have no plans of making a new Breath of Fire game, and that due to the overall niche, it wouldn't make sense to try and push out another title. Chris Svensson would state on message boards that the series was a resting IP, but well, this was back in 2009 and that's over a decade ago now, so I unfortunately believe, at least in the West, that this franchise is dead. Now after witnessing the explosive growth of Street Fighter 2, Capcom thought, damn, well why don't we just make another fighting game? And well, that's just what they did. Darkstalkers would make its first appearance in 1994 for arcades, under the name Darkstalkers The Night Warriors. While the gameplay might seem familiar to the Street Fighter franchise, the characters certainly were not. Set in a gothic horror sort of universe and sporting anime style art, each character was based on a monster from international folklore. The game would also add new additions in the form of air blocking, crouch walking and chain combos. The first game was a hit in arcades, managing to sell over 24,000 arcade units. The franchise would see a further two sequels in Night Warriors Darkstalkers Revenge in 1995, and Vampire Savior World of Darkness in 1997. And while these games were positively received, they didn't sell as well as Capcom had hoped. The franchise has unfortunately not seen a new mainline game since 1997, but has seen multiple ports and remasters over the years. The most notable of these I feel I should mention is Darkstalkers Resurrection. For years, Yoshinori Ono, the producer of the Street Fighter franchise, would state that Darkstalkers is not dead and urge fans to send in requests should they truly wish for a revival of the series. By March 2011, over 100,000 requests had been sent in, and in response, Darkstalkers Resurrection would be developed and released in 2013 for the PS3 and Xbox 360. The game was a HD remaster of the last two Darkstalkers games, but included online multiplayer among other updates. The game flopped though, the game that was looking to resurrect the franchise only helped put it back into a deep slumber. Throughout the years, the franchise has seen its fair share of representation in other media, through anime, TV shows, comics, and manga, which has given it enough life to slot it into the life support tier. Now while the last few franchises haven't exactly fared well, this next franchise would help cement Capcom as a household name within gaming. Now, I'm sure everyone has heard of this series, regardless of whether or not you had the balls to play it when you were younger. Heck, even my mum knows about this. I mean, albeit she recognises the name from the movies, which, uh... But regardless, the Resident Evil franchise has become one of the most recognised, if not the most recognised horror series in the world. First released in 1996 for the PlayStation, the game was actually first inspired by another Capcom game, Sweet Home, which was released for the SNES in 1989. Resident Evil would take elements from Sweet Home and expand on them to create what is now considered a defining period for the survival horror genre. Resident Evil. With the choice of now iconic characters Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine, players were tasked with investigating a series of bizarre murders. Gameplay often involved aspects of exploration, puzzle solving, action, and inventory management. By the end of 1997, the game had sold 4 million copies worldwide, making it the highest selling PlayStation game at the time. 
Since then, the franchise has grown to include 8 mainline games, multiple remakes, countless spin-off games and series. The first of these spin-off series was the Gun Survivor series, first making an appearance in 2000 with the release of Resident Evil Survivor. The game branched out from the usual Resident Evil formula by being the first in the franchise to adopt the first person view. The game would also feature branching paths that allowed the player to determine how the story would unfold. A further three sequels would follow, ending with Resident Evil Dead Aim in 2003. Further expanding on the Resident Evil franchise, we have the Outbreak series, first released in 2003 for the PlayStation 2. The game depicts a series of episodic storylines in a zombie inhabited Raccoon City and has the player control 8 characters, each with their own unique abilities. It would also be the first game in the franchise to feature co-op play and online multiplayer support. The game would receive a sequel just one year later in Japan called Outbreak File 2, which had all the original characters returned with new scenarios available. Now if by 2012 you hadn't shit yourself playing this franchise yet, Capcom wanted to make sure you did when they released the Revelation series. Resident Evil Revelations was released in 2012 and looked to return to the roots of horror, initially set up by the series. The game emphasizes survival, evasion, and exploration over fast-paced action by limiting the player's movement speed, ammunition, and health. A sequel would release three years later, in 2015, titled Resident Evil Revelations 2. The gameplay, while similar to its predecessor, would include multiplayer aspects allowing for another player to take control of Moira. Players would need to cooperate to solve certain puzzles and complete actions. This series in particular has gone on to sell over 6 million copies, making it one of Capcom's 30 best-selling series, and this is just a spin-off of the main franchise. Resident Evil has evolved far beyond just a gaming franchise, having made multiple animated films, TV shows, merchandise, novels, and comics. And if that wasn't enough, the franchise has successfully broken into the film industry, having had seven live action films based off it. Now I'm not here to shit on these movies, but they are, well, uh, interesting and fun in more ways than one. But despite the constant roasting of these films, the franchise has managed to gross an incredible 1.2 billion at the box office, making it one of the highest grossing film series based on a video game ever. Alongside this monumental achievement stands another, with Resident Evil not only being Capcom's best-selling franchise, but the best-selling horror game series of all time, with 135 million copies sold. This franchise is easily a Capcom flagship. Now let me ask you guys something. Have you ever wanted to play a Star Wars themed fighting game? Oh. Uh, well what about a good Star Wars fighting game? Now if anyone can do it, it's going to be Capcom. In 1996, Capcom released Star Gladiator Episode 1 Final Crusade for the PlayStation 1 and Arcade. Now instead of the usual 6 button system used in other Capcom based fighters, Star Gladiator utilized a 4 button configuration system, offering a more intuitive and simple control scheme for beginners to get into. Add on unique characters and weapons and sound effects that clearly draw inspiration from Star Wars, it was no wonder that this game would draw attention. And within 2 years, a sequel would release for arcades, being ported to the Dreamcast in 2000. Unfortunately, that's where the series has been left by Capcom. And while certain characters such as Hayato and Chun have made future appearances in other fighting games, I think Star Gladiator at this point is a dead franchise. Now, have you ever wondered who would win between Wolverine and Ryu? What about Iron Man vs Mega Man? Now while you may never see these type of fights happen on the big screen, the godfather of fighting games Capcom would make it possible to witness these fights with your own hands. The Marvel vs Capcom franchise spans a total of 8 games, starting with X-Men vs Street Fighter in 1996 until most recently with Marvel vs Capcom Infinite in 2017. The basic gameplay? Wait, did you guys hear that? God, the music in this series is so good, and I'll happily die on that rock. Oh, sorry, where was I? Oh yeah, the basic gameplay is similar to that of most fighting games, specifically the Marvel-based fighting games, X-Men Children of the Atom, and Marvel Super Heroes. What the series did introduce, however, was the use of tag team system that has now become synonymous with the franchise. Players were able to swap between Wolverine and Magneto whenever they wished, with each character having their own separate health bar, which would replenish when they were off screen. This added an element of strategy in prolonging fights to help heal back up. The games were an instant hit, both in arcades and on home consoles, with the franchise as a whole selling over 10 million units. And while the franchise hasn't seen a new release in years, it still remains one of Capcom's mainstays for its sheer draw and appeal. Now following the success of Marvel vs Capcom, Capcom looked to incorporate similar aspects in their next series, which was titled 
which released the year after in 1997 for arcades. The series is somewhat of a forgotten gem in my opinion, and kind of draws in elements from all of Capcom's previous fighting games. The game, which takes place in the same world as the Street Fighter series, imitates Star Gladiator's four-button setup, all while incorporating two character teams similar to Marvel vs. Capcom. The difference this time around, however, was the player wouldn't swap in their substitute fighter, but instead build vigor that could be used to launch a team-up attack. The game was heavily praised and ended up receiving a sequel called which was released just three years later for arcades, before being ported over to the Dreamcast in 2001. The same fighting system was used from its predecessor, however instead of only two character teams, this game had players build teams of three. This not only meant that a further team up attack could be used, but a new type of attack called a party attack was made available. Players could also cancel out opponent's team up attacks by executing one themselves, which added a layer of depth to the already engaging gameplay. While the sequel sold decently well, I guess it wasn't enough as there hasn't been a new game since. In 2013, director Hideaki Itsuno did express an interest in continuing the series by developing a third installment. But seeing as this was a decade ago, I think the Rival School series has to be placed unfortunately in the zombie tier. Now we go from one forgotten gem to another. Capcom really needs to start bringing some of these back honestly. Anyway, the next franchise to be released was Power Stone. Released in arcades in 1999, the game had players select a character before fighting the other characters one by one. These fights would take place in 3D arenas, which allowed players to move freely around and pick up and use objects like chairs, rocks, and even like bombs. Power Stones would appear throughout the fight, and players who collected three of them pretty much went Super Saiyan. The game didn't sell amazingly well, but did end up receiving a sequel a year later called Power Stone 2. Power Stone 2 would feature the original cast along with a few new characters. The game still featured 3D arenas but allowed for up to 4 players to battle simultaneously. The franchise would get its own anime series even that ran through 1999. It was actually pretty good if I don't say so myself. The game would receive a remake for the PSP in 2006 under the name Power Stone Collection. But since then, there's been no real news regarding the franchise since. I did find this Twitter post though. So if you're still waiting on the third installment, best to go and spread the word as they say. All in all though, this franchise seems to have been completely forgotten by Capcom, as the characters don't even make appearances like so many others do in Capcom's other big fighting series like Street Fighter or the Capcom vs series. The Power Stone franchise seems to be dead at this point. Now three years after the release of the Resident Evil franchise, Capcom would look to return to the survival horror genre. Now what were the monsters of this game you may ask? Vampires? Maybe they went back to zombies? Well, not quite. See, this franchise would focus on the reoccurring outbreaks of deadly dinosaurs. Developed by the exact same team behind the Resident Evil series, similarities were immediately obvious in relation to the movement, inventory space, and the tense atmosphere the game created. The franchise would see huge commercial success, with the first game selling over 2.4 million copies on the PS1. This provided a great opportunity, and many saw it as a second coming of the Resident Evil series, uh, just with dinosaurs this time. The franchise would receive a further three games, ending with Dino Crisis 3, which was released in 2003 for the Xbox. Dino Crisis 3 was hit with very mediocre reviews though, with criticism relating to the game's camera, lack of enemy variability, and overall frustrating nature. It probably doesn't come as a surprise then, that the franchise hasn't seen an entry since. As is the case with all these long forgotten franchises, Capcom seems to like teasing the audience with the possibility of a revival. In Dino Crisis's case, the official Twitter account for Capcom's lead development team responded by saying that if enough people wished for it, then a new Dino Crisis title could release. In some regards, this gives enough hope to place the franchise in the zombie tier, no matter how unlikely a true revival is. Wait, do my eyes deceive me? Is that another Capcom vs franchise? Oh, you know what that means. Okay, okay, I promise, that's the last time I'll do that. Probably. But in all seriousness, Capcom would have partnered with SNK to create another series of games, featuring star characters from both companies like they had done previously with Marvel. The difference this time around though, was that not every game in the series was a hardcore fighting game. In fact, of the 7 games present in the series, just under half of them were actually digital card collection games. Now some consider the card games to be a separate or spin-off series to the fighting games, but honestly it's just easier to talk about them as a collective on the one banner. Released all the way back in 1999, the first game to release was actually Card Fighters Clash, featuring characters from both SNK and Capcom. The gameplay and battles resembled a more simplified version of Magic the Gathering, in which players could place three fighters onto their field to use in battle. A week or so after this release, SNK vs Capcom, the match of the millennium, 
would release for the Neo Geo Pocket Color. This game lent more into the familiar crossover fighting game that had come before it, and also included a one-on-one -on -one mode, two fighters to tag teams like Marvel vs Capcom, as well as three fighter Q teams drawn from SNK's flagship fighting series, The King of Fighters. The series would expand to include a further five games before SNK's bankruptcy, essentially killing off any potential for a revival at this point. The last game of the series was SNK vs Capcom Card Fighters DS, which was released all the way back in 2006. SNK producer Yasuyuki Oda stated in August 2022 that both parties had actually shown interest in a potential revival of the series. So I guess we can push it up to zombie tier. So by now we've covered Resident Evil, we've covered Dino Crisis. Well, what if I told you that we almost got a ninja version of these games? See, back in 1997, Yoshiki Okamoto had the idea to create Sengoku Biohazard, named after the Resident Evil series, which was known as, well, Biohazard in Japan. The game was to be set in the Sengoku period, and feature a ninja house similar to the mansion in the first Resident Evil. This ninja house was to be filled with booby traps, with battles taking place using swords and shuriken. The game would go on to adopt a more unique perspective though, focusing more so on the action segments, while still incorporating tense horror elements and things like puzzles and fixed camera angles. This game series would go by the name Onimusha. While most of the games in this franchise featured different protagonists, they are for the most part all skilled swordsmen, tasked with slaying enemies and other monstrous enemies. By defeating these enemies, players would absorb Genma souls, which are used to restore health, infuse power into their weapons and armor, and even provide power for the use of elemental attacks. The first game of this franchise, Onimusha Warlords, would release in 2001 for the PS2, where it became an instant hit, smashing records and becoming the first PS2 game to crack 1 billion not 1 billion, 1 million sales. The game would eventually surpass 2 million units sold, putting it roughly in the same place Dino Crisis was in its initial release. Following this success, the franchise would see the release of two direct sequels for the PS2, as well as a further three games afterwards. Originally, Onimusha was planned to be a trilogy, meaning it should have finished following the release of Onimusha 3, Demon Siege in 2004. Well, unfortunately, or I guess fortunately in this case, both Onimusha 2 and 3 sold incredibly well, skyrocketing the franchise towards flagship status at the time. Kenji Inafume would state that Onimusha 3 merely ended Nobunaga's storyline, and the next installment would be the start of a new one. Two years passed before Onimusha Dawn of Dreams was released for the PS2 in 2006. Now set decades later in medieval Japan, the story would follow Soki. A new storyline seemingly meant a new experience, as players were now able to control the camera, rather than a static camera employed in the previous entries. In saying this, the game still drew heavy influence from its predecessors, as Soki still possessed Oni powers, and the ability to absorb demon souls upon defeating them. Unlike its predecessors, however, the game would underperform according to Capcom. In terms of sales, the game managed to ship a total of 325,000 units, which for some context was lower than the other three games, but it seems that another franchise has fallen due to lackluster sales. The franchise would see the release of a mobile game, a browser game, before it returned to form with the most recent remaster of the original game. Following the disappointing results of the fourth installment, Keiji Inafume would state that while a follow-up to Dawn of Dreams interested him, he was more interested in developing Mega Man Legends 3 at the time. And if we go back to earlier on in this video, we can see... ...before being cancelled in late 2011, with no plans to resume development. Ooh, yeah. That game never came out either, so who knows what the chances of a next mainline game coming out for Onimusha at the moment. In other media though, during 2022, Netflix would announce that the series would be getting an anime adaption. Overall, I think while Onimusha deserves mainstay status, it's hard to place it there currently due to the lack of recent new games. I'm confident that Capcom can at least remaster the final two games of the original trilogy, which could easily skyrocket it back into mainstays, and maybe even beyond. Now here's an interesting franchise, certainly not one you'd expect a company like Capcom to publish or push. Everblue would release in 2001 for the PS2, and was essentially a scuba diving exploration game with RPG elements as the player was able to explore sunken ships and learn about marine animal life. The game would feature an inventory system as well as an above water town with shops and even NPCs. Now you may be wondering how this game even ever got a sequel, and I'm honestly wondering the same. The game actually received fairly unfavourable reviews, but against all odds, a follow-up titled Everblue 2 would release just a year later in 2002. The game would once again take control of Leo, who was the diver in the first game as he and his group of friends found themselves caught in a storm. Their ship would sink as a result, causing them to book it to the nearest island, where they would meet the Amigos. The gameplay for the most part stayed the same as the original. What is especially interesting is that even after this game underperformed, Akira who developed the games would go on to produce the Endless Ocean franchise with Nintendo, which acts as the spiritual success of the series. In this case though, I think that we can safely say that this Everblue franchise is dead, or maybe even could be considered finished by Capcom. 
The same can't be said for this next franchise though. Now I might sound like a broken record at this point, but we have once again come across a Resident Evil game. But we're not just talking about any Resident Evil game. No, this time it was actually a failed one. See, after the completion of Resident Evil 2 in 1998, preliminary work began for future installments into the franchise. This even included a trip to Spain to examine castles as the basis for the environments to be used. The plan was to develop Resident Evil 4 based on this research, with Kamiya looking to incorporate more action features, which Capcom didn't quite agree with at the time, and said it would take away the focus from the survival horror elements and aspects that the franchise was so well known for. What they decided to do was to separate this idea into its own game, and it may have been one of the best decisions Capcom ever made. Because not only did we receive arguably the most iconic horror game in Resident Evil 4, but a new masterpiece was born as a result. Alluding to Dante's Divine Comedy, this franchise would go by the name Devil May Cry. The first game of many would release in 2001 for the PS2, where players would assume the role of Dante, fittingly named after the Italian poet Dante Alighieri. The gameplay focused heavily on fast-paced, highly stylized combat, where players are ranked based on their performance. This required the player to keep up long attack and evasion strings while avoiding damage. The game would go on to receive critical acclaim for its innovative gameplay, action, visuals, and gothic ambiance. Over 3 million copies of the game had been shipped, resulting in multiple sequels being developed. Over the next two decades, Capcom released three direct sequels, with the most recent being Devil May Cry 5 in 2019. During this time, multiple mobile games, a reboot, and various HD collections were also released. The series as a whole has managed to sell over 28 million copies, placing it within Capcom's top five best-selling franchises. The series has found considerable success in other forms of media as well, with multiple light novels, comics, manga, and even a few anime adaptions being made, with the latest actually being produced by Netflix. The franchise is without a doubt a Capcom flat. Can you can you please wait your turn? Like we'll get to you. So as I was saying, Devil May Cry is without a doubt a Capcom flagship, and it's crazy to think we may have never actually seen its birth in the first place. So, does anyone want to hazard a guess as to the next franchise on this list? Well, if you're a fan of legal dramas, then this is the game franchise for you. The Ace Attorney franchise is a series of visual novel adventure video games. The series would see its first entry in 2001 for the Nintendo DS under the name Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney, where it followed rookie defense attorney uh, Phoenix Wright, as well as various other defense attorneys introduced throughout the series. The first game would include five separate cases in which the player was tasked with defending their clients. The games are often broken down into two segments, an investigation investigation section as well as the courtroom trials. Investigations had the player gather information and evidence by talking to other characters and analysing the environment. This evidence was then used in the trial in which players would cross-examine witnesses and uncover the lies and inconsistencies in their testimonies. The game was praised for its unique gameplay and the sales certainly followed along, with initial sales numbers being far greater than anything Capcom had ever expected. This game in particular has been credited as one of the main influences in popularising visual novels in the West. Over the next few decades, the franchise has seen the addition of five further mainline sequels, the latest of which being Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney, Spirit of Justice, released for the 3DS in 2016. Alongside these mainline games are two spin-off series, the first of which is the Ace Attorney Investigation series. First released for the Nintendo DS in 2009, the Investigation series consists of two games that unlike the mainline entries follow the prosecutor side, more specifically Miles Edgeworth, who's tasked with investigating five cases that tie together to form an overarching story about a smuggling ring. The team wanted to make sure that these games felt as immersive as possible for players so they allowed players to take direct control of Edgeworth and added the ability to connect his thoughts allowing for new information to be processed. The series has not seen a new entry since Investigations 2 which was released as a Japanese exclusive back in 2011 for the Nintendo DS. Capcom wasn't done with the spin-off series just yet though and would release the Great Ace Attorney series in 2015. The series would receive two games in Japan between 2015 and 2018, before being released worldwide in a compilation bundle titled The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. The games would follow the ancestor of Riot, a student at Imperial Yume University that holds a strong sense of justice. Overall, the Ace Attorney series has become one of Capcom's most prolific franchises, selling close to 10 million units over its lifespan. The franchise has had multiple stage musicals, live action films, an anime, and multiple manga series developed from it, and with the game's consistent releases and respectable sales, it easily cements itself a high spot on this list. I believe it just falls short of other flagship franchises due to the lower sales and limited reach due to its niche genre, but can quite comfortably sit in the main Objection! Are you done? Now like I was saying, the Ace Attorney franchise can easily sit in the main- Alright, let me ask you guys something again. What do you think this is? A pilot's cockpit? Maybe a submarine's control panel? Nope. This is in fact 
the controller used for Steel Battalion, the next franchise in this list. Released in 2002 exclusively for Xbox, the player got to use this controller to control a bipedal heavily armoured mecha. The game was essentially a tech demo and simulation game where you had to start up the operating system as well as handle problems like the machine toppling over or overheating. The game was released in very limited quantities and managed to actually break even according to Atsushi Inaba. Honestly, this has to be one of the most interesting games I've ever seen. Now you may be asking, okay Kai, come on, there's no way this overly complex game ever got a sequel. Well, just two years after the first game, Steel Battalion Line of Contact would release. Not only that, a decade later in 2012, a third installment called Steel Battalion Heavy Armor would release for the Xbox 360. The second installment was genuinely praised and even has the same controller as its predecessor. The latest installment though was anything but praised. You see this third game straight away from the old Joy-Con super complex controller and instead had players use a combination of the Xbox 360 controller and the Kinect motion sensor. Safe to say this game was unplayable due to the inability of the Kinect to accurately read the player's movements. Despite the game having a somewhat recent release, I believe this franchise is most likely dead considering its niche appeal and its disappointing end. With their next franchise, Capcom would return to the side-scrolling beat-em-up style with the release of Beautiful Joe in 2003. The game would incorporate a traditional 2D platform side-scrolling element intermixed with charming 3D cell shading graphics, similar to another GameCube title at the time. The player took control of Joe, an avid movie girl whose girlfriend gets kidnapped. After accepting a special V-Watch from his favourite superhero Captain Blue, Joe could then transform into the titular character, Beautiful Joe. The gameplay itself follows the traditional style of beat-em-ups, with a few extra additions in the form of Joe's beautiful effects. These powers, which consisted of things like slowing down time, speeding Joe up to mark speed, and even zooming in to do more damage, the series garnered critical acclaim and saw relatively low sales. Due to the game's low production budget though, the games were actually deemed commercially successful, and the franchise managed to expand to include four total games, as well as an anime TV series and manga. Joe would later appear in future Marvel vs Capcom games as well, and despite it seeming like the series is long dead, series creator Hideki Kamiya would tell people essentially like look just spam Capcom with emails if you want this franchise to return. It's just become a common trend with all these lost franchises. Kamiya would state that he would love to finish the series with the third installment and even remaster and remake the first game on the Nintendo Switch. The series at the moment seems to be resting on life support for now, but if there's one series that isn't in any need of life support, it's this next one. Despite being one of the newer additions to the Capcom library, this franchise needs no introduction. Monster Hunter has quickly evolved into one of the most successful media franchises ever. Over the course of 19 years, the series has produced a total of 6 mainline games and 12 spin-off games. With each release, the franchise grows, with the most recent entry Monster Hunter World and Monster Hunter Rise breaking records and selling exceptionally well. Funnily enough, if you were to ask someone a decade or so ago what Monster Hunter was, they'd most likely have no idea what you were smoking, as Capcom had this track record of releasing the games to the West years after they'd already released in Japan. It wasn't until Monster Hunter World in 2018 that the series would release worldwide simultaneously. The core gameplay loop centers around hunting, slaying, and trapping large monsters across a variety of biomes. Players would receive requests from locals that could range from gathering of materials to even hunting specific monsters. Players could use these resources and loot gained from slaying monsters to craft stronger weapons, armor, and other items allowing for stronger monsters to be hunted. Part of the game's success and appeal has to do with the game's multiplayer, which allowed up to 4 players to hunt cooperatively. As of the current day, the franchise has sold over 90 million units worldwide, making it the second best selling Capcom franchise after Resident Evil. Now, among the many spin-off games, there was actually a small sub-series that has emerged, known as the Monster Hunter Story series. These games actually took a detour from the usual Monster Hunter gameplay, focusing a lot more on RPG elements and story, in which the player takes on the role of riders instead of hunters. Players would steal eggs that they could then hatch into monsties. Players were then able to ride these and use them in the game's turn-based battle system. The series would receive a sequel for the Nintendo Switch in 2021, as well as an anime series. Due to the appeal of Monster Hunter and the recent releases, this spin-off series is most likely a mainstay. In addition to the immensely popular games, the franchise has anime adaption, manga series, a book, and both a feature film and animated film that was released on Netflix in 2021. The franchise has quickly grown to be one of Capcom's biggest endeavors and is easily one of Capcom's flagship franchises. Now Capcom mainly focuses on fighting games, but has definitely shifted into other genres such as action adventure games, survival horror games, and even RPGs. What they hadn't delved into just yet was the female market. But not to worry, because Capcom has that covered with this franchise. Full House Kiss. 
Released in 2004 for the PS2, the game is created in conjunction with a manga of the same name. The gameplay focuses mainly on housekeeping tasks, and has the player, after coming back home from school each day, complete certain tasks within a certain time limit. I'm unsure how well the game sold, but I'm just going to guess that it was a crazy hit, because the game actually got a sequel in Full House Kiss 2, which would release in 2006. These games were actually never released outside of Japan, meaning that we can add it to the list of dead franchises. Now, I have a confession to make about this next franchise. I actually first found out about it through its anime and not its games. Yeah, yeah, I know, shameful. You're allowed to leave a dislike now. But anyway, Sengoku Basara, I would argue, has become more than just a video game franchise anyway. The franchise would make its first appearance in 2005 as a hack and slash action title for the PS2 titled Sengoku Basara Devil Kings. Originally released only in Japan, when looking to localize the game to the West, Capcom thought it would be a good idea to remove all references to Sengoku and just Japan in general in favor of some generic, bland fantasy story, loosely based on the other hit franchise franchise, Devil May Cry. I'm sure Western audiences appreciated this change, right? Yeah. The game ended up both as a critical and commercial failure, and pretty much put Capcom off from localizing any of their other games until Sengoku Basara Samurai Heroes in 2010. The franchise has seen four mainline entries as well as countless spin-offs and mobile games. In addition to the games, the series has had four anime shows, an anime movie, a live action show, magazine series, a bloody trading card game, and numerous other light novels, mangas, and stage plays. And while the game series has only barely sold 4 million total copies, it easily manages to take a spot in the mainstays category in my opinion. Now Okami would dash onto the scene in 2006 for the PS2. While technically only a one game franchise, it has had both the HD remaster as well as the spiritual successor which was released in 2011 for the DS. Set once again in classical Japan, Okami follows the journey of Amaterasu as they save the land from darkness. The game mixes action, platforming and puzzle game elements, similar in a sense to the Legend of Zelda series. The main story is mostly linear, with the option to engage in numerous side quests and optional activities. Most notably, the game makes use of watercolor style and cel-shaded environments, giving the look and feel of an animated ink illustration. The game would go on to be praised by critics and also win numerous game awards over multiple conventions. Yet despite this universal praise, the game barely managed to sell, remaining under 600,000 copies by 2009 and was recognized in the 2010 Guinness World Records as the least commercially successful winner of a Game of the Year award. Following this disappointment, Capcom would look to release an HD remaster in 2012 for the PS3, before re-releasing it on the next-gen consoles in 2017, and finally, the Nintendo Switch in 20. 2018. This remaster would sell 3 million total copies, indicating that interest in the series was still present. In response to Capcom indicating that they were looking to revive some of its dormant properties in 2019, Kamiya alongside Ikumi Nakamura, who would work on Okami, stated on Twitter that Okami is going to be back. For now though, we'll just have to wait and see if that's truly the case. For now, Okami can be placed in the It Exists tier. Now following the poor sales of Okami, Capcom needed a big hit once again. Now let's see, what worked in the past? Fighting games? Ah, uh, there's been plenty of those though. Maybe another hack and slash and beat or beat em up? Nah, they needed something bigger. Oh. Oh, I guess it's just back to zombies. All jokes aside though, the Dead Rising franchise remains one of the most comical and fun series to date. Capcom took a more lighthearted approach in their depiction of the flesh-eating monsters this time around, with the release of Dead Rising for the Xbox 360 in 2006. The majority of the games follow Frank West, while he attempts to uncover the mystery behind the zombie outbreak. Essentially, players had 72 hours to do whatever the hell they wanted. They could use whatever items found around the environment to fight off zombies, which always led to some hilarious instances. A total of 8 different endings were possible, based on conditions met by the player during each playthrough. To this day, the franchise has had four main entries, with the latest Dead Rising 4 being released for the Xbox One, PS4 and PC in 2016. Multiple remakes, re-release compilations and mobile games have also been developed for the franchise, and we can't forget the three films, Zombrex, Watchtower and Endgame. In total, the game series has sold a whopping 15 million units worldwide making it Capcom's sixth most successful IP, a truly impressive feat considering it's one of the newest. I'm honestly split on where to place this. I would personally place it in mainstays as I don't believe it's quite on the same level as the other flagships just yet. Let me know where you guys would place it though. Now it seemed that the release of the Xbox 360 lit a fire on the Capcom's ass, as for whatever reason, Capcom seemingly wanted to take advantage of the new hardware by pumping out new IPs. Dead Rising was the first, and now just six months later, Capcom would release another series going by the name of Lost Planet. The series would touch down with its first entry, Lost Planet Extreme Condition. The games featured numerous protagonists of the EDN 3, a planet on the brink of an ice age. The games had the players survive in the harsh conditions while fighting off various alien creatures and others planning to colonize the planet. 
Boss Planet Extreme Condition would go on to sell over 1 million copies, which was once again extraordinary for a new IP of a new console. Capcom seemed to be on fire, and not long after, a further three games followed. The franchise continued to prosper with the release of Lost Planet 2 in 2010 for the Xbox 360. The game would sell almost 2 million copies once again, showing the potential of the series as a whole. You have to remember, this was in an era where COD and Halo were also at their prime which makes the game's success that much more impressive. E.X Troopers, a spin-off game, would release in 2012, and while it introduced new enemies and weapons, the game would suffer from poor sales. The final nail in the coffin, however, was the release of the latest entry. Capcom would outsource the development of Lost Planet 3 to Spark Unlimited, which would eventually release in 2013. The game was met with mixed reception, with criticism being directed towards the repetitive gameplay and lackluster level design. The sales would reflect these thoughts, as the series hit a new low in terms of sales. The series did have a film adaption in the works from 2008 to 2013, but plans slowly faded out of the picture after the studio in charge hit a financial crash. Since then, no other mentions of the franchise have been made, and it seems Capcom has no plans to revive the series anytime soon. I think despite its explosive rise, its fall followed close behind. I think the franchise sits between the dead and zombie tier, but considering the complete silence regarding the series, it's more likely dead. Now let me ask you guys, what do you get when you combine Devil May Cry hack and slash combat with the fantasy elements of say Breath of Fire and the combat and party systems of Monster Hunter? Wait, I just realized I can't actually hear you guys answer. But if you said Dragon's Dogma, then ding ding ding, congrats, you've won. Nothing. Uh, anyway, Dragon's Dogma was released for the PS3 and Xbox 360 in 2012, and would have players completing quests and fighting monsters in real time, with the ultimate goal being to defeat, well, a dragon called Grigori. Set in the grand open world and played from a third person's perspective, the player had the choice of various character classes. One of the most intriguing aspects of this game was the pawn system. The pawn system allowed players to issue commands such as go and help as well as offer information regarding specific enemies. What was even cooler was how these party moments were generated. If you were connected online, two of the NPCs were borrowed avatars of other players. And one last core cool aspect involved was the grab action, which had players clinging to enemies and objects. The game was a breakout success selling over 330,000 units upon its debut. These numbers actually broke the record in Japan for the fastest selling new IP of the 7th console generation. As of 2022, the game has sold a staggering 7.2 million copies by itself, lamenting itself as one of the most successful Capcom franchises, period. Now technically at the time of writing, the series only has one game, along with an enhanced version titled Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen. But last year in June, a sequel called Dragon's Dogma 2 was announced. The franchise would also include a free-to-play online game that was released in 2015. Unfortunately, the game was never accessible outside of Japan, and by 2019, the servers were shut down. This wouldn't be enough to deter fans, however, as very recently, there's been a very dedicated group of players that have managed to restore the Japanese MMO and even bring it to the West, where you can download it and play it on private servers. On the other hand, the series would produce its own ONA for Netflix in 2019. This series as well is hard to place. Because the franchise only has one mainline game to its name, I don't believe it can hang with the mainstays. I think it certainly has the potential following the sequel's release, but for now, it strikes me as just existing. Geist Crusher marks the most recent IP Capcom has developed. It was released all the way back in 2013 for the Nintendo 3DS. The franchise has seen two games to its name, with the latest being released in 2014, also for the 3DS. The games were launched as part of a cross-media franchise that includes a manga series as well as an anime series. Due to the games never making it out of Japan, and with Capcom stating that they have no plans on localizing the series, it's safe to say that this is yet another dead franchise. And there you have it, those are my final lists. Capcom initially made a name for itself as the king of fighting games. Since then however, it has shown time and time again that it has more than enough potential to branch out and create something amazing in other genres. Much like this next company, if I were to ask you to name one company that had the largest selection of franchises, what would your answer be? Nintendo? Perhaps Sony? Now while these would be solid guesses, I'd wager there's one that trumps even those beasts. A company that has not only tapped into every gaming genre known to man, but has also established some of the most famous and influential franchises within the industry. Monaco GP was a racing game where you didn't race. Wait, what? No, see, instead of racing other players and trying to finish first, the idea was to instead finish the course before time ran out. So I guess you could say you were still racing, but it was just against time. 
As the game progressed, rival cars would get faster, the roads would get more narrow, and the surface would change to things like ice and gravel. Various hazards would appear on the track, such as puddles and tunnels, which limited the player's vision. The game found decent success in Japan, but would skyrocket upon reaching the United States, where it became the top grossing driving game of 1981. This would result in a further two sequels, Super Monaco GP in 1989, and finally Ariton Senna's Super Monaco GP2 in 1992. Super Monaco GP in particular went on to garner incredible success, whereas Super Monaco GP2, while positively received, was criticised for sharing too many similarities with its predecessors. Following Super Monaco GP2, the franchise would see no further releases, meaning unless Sega's been working on the next game for over 30 years, it's most likely a dead franchise. Now when you think of Sega, the majority would think of a certain hedgehog. But what if I told you that Sega got started with a penguin? Released in 1982 for arcades, Pango had players control Pango, a red penguin who found himself stuck in an ice maze. The game made use of a four position joystick, as well as a singular button. This button was used to press up against ice blocks and slide them across the maze. Now you may be thinking, well alright, this seems to be the easiest maze ever if you could just push blocks out of the way and form your own escape path. But while it was technically a maze, the goal wasn't to escape it. Instead, there were these little eggs that hatched into snow bees, and it was up to Pengo to crush them with the ice blocks. If you're wondering why Pengo is red, it's because he's squashed so many bees that he's now covered in their blood. Okay, no, I made that part up, but I mean, come on, wh why is he red? Regardless, Pengo would do decently well and find himself in his own sequel called Pepenga Pengo, which was released in 1995 on the Sega Mega Drive, exclusively in Japan. Unfortunately, that's where this cute little penguin story ends, pushed away like an ice block into the dead category. Alright, let's go. Wait, huh? Let me move. Alright. Yeah, so the next game released was Sega's Zaxxon. This game in particular was the first to employ axonometric projection, which helped stimulate 3D objects from a third-person viewpoint. Zaxxon was also the first arcade game to ever be advertised on television, with a commercial produced by Paramount Pictures for over $150,000. With the use of a four-direction joystick, players were tasked with flying through two heavily defended space fortresses, with an outer space segment between them. So apart from dodging what appears to be brick walls uh, in space, players would be required to shoot down turrets, other ships, and fuel tanks which replenish the ship's fuel. Saxon would go on to find major commercial success, becoming one of the highest grossing arcade games of 1982. Sega was so confident in this franchise, I mean they did drop 150k on a commercial, that by the end of that same year they had already released a sequel called Super Saxon, which was really just Saxon 1.5, except with slightly different colours, a faster ship, and the space segment being switched out for a tunnel. 1987 would see the release of Zaxxon 3D, where you were forced to wear those flimsy ass 3D glasses, and most recently in 2012, Zaxxon Escape would be released for the iOS and Android. The latest game was heavily criticised for having little resemblance to the original, and I can see why. Okay, never mind. Maybe this is Zaxxon, because I can't seem to get past the first 15 seconds of any of these games without hitting a bloody wall. Anyway, I'm going to say this is a zombie franchise at best, as we haven't seen a new iteration in over a decade. Now we've arrived at our first franchise that wasn't originally a Sega franchise. Thunder Force was a series of free roaming scroller shooter games initially developed by Technosoft and published by Sega. The series would see six mainline installments, from the original Thunder Force in 1983 for personal computers to Thunder Force 6 released for the PlayStation 2 in 2008. Out of the six games created, Sega only developed one of them, and funnily enough, that just happened to be the latest game, which not only got heavily criticised for its blurry visuals, short length, and recycled stages, but was also the last game released for the franchise as a whole. Now I'm not saying Sega took a flourishing franchise and killed it, but... Okay, may maybe I am saying that. Unfortunately, what started as a unique little free roaming shooter has most likely seen its last days. It seems as though Sega had a strange obsession with penguins early on, as 1985 saw the release of Doki Doki Penguin Land. The game which shares an uncanny resemblance to Pengo had players guide an egg from the top of the screen to the bottom. The goal was to dig downwards carefully, as to not smash the egg when dropping it down. While the original game never saw play outside of Japan, it was considered a classic by Sega, and saw two sequels released in the form of Penguin Land, which did happen to release in the West, and Doki Doki Penguin Land MD. While all games featured similar gameplay, the Western release would depart from the classic story of delivering an egg to your penguin girlfriend, to now having Overbite, which was the game's protagonist, leading an interplanetary mission where he had to deliver eggs to his crew, which were hiding out in a space station beneath the surface of the planet. 
If this was an attempt to cater to a more western audience, then I have to say, they absolutely nailed it. That sounds so dumb that I can't help but love it. Unfortunately, just like Pengo, it seems as though Sega has shifted their interests onto other animal archetypes, leaving Doki Doki Penguin Land in the dead category. Hang on, what was the next franchise that came out? <laughs> Get it? Alright, I apologize for that. But yes, the fittingly named Hang On was the next franchise released in arcades in 1985. The game could be played on an upright arcade machine, or if you're all about the immersion, you could saddle up on the Ride On cabinet, which was quite innovative for its time, as it realistically simulated a motorcycle. These are commonplace these days in arcades, but you have to remember that this was over 30 years ago, and I can only imagine what people were thinking when tilting side to side zooming around digital race courses. As was the case with a lot of these old Sega franchises, the game would explode in popularity, to the point where they had to start modifying the coin mechanism to accept higher value coins, due to the sheer number being shoved into the machine. The franchise would see the release of two further sequels, the immensely popular Super Hang-On and the not-so-popular Hang-On GP, and that's where the franchise has been left to this day, with no new releases since Hang-On GP in 1996, and I think you're probably starting to get the idea of why certain tiers in this list are thicker than others. So I want to pass this one over to you guys. What do you guys think is the goal of this franchise? Well, if you said you played as a dude with a jetpack that flew around with a laser shooting anything from prehistoric animals to Chinese dragons, flying robots, and alien pods, then I, then I guess you won. Um, I mean, I don't really have a prize because if I'm being honest, I didn't think anyone would guess right. Space Harry was a third-person arcade rail shooter released for arcades in 1985, and as you can tell from my description, was definitely out there in terms of creativity. In this game still garners praise for its visual impact, solid gameplay, and classic tunes, and it's not hard to see why it became so successful. The game would spawn three sequels, the first of which being Space Harry 3D, once again utilising those god-awful 3D glasses. Space Harrier 2 would release in 1989, only to be followed by Planet Harry's in 2000. Unfortunately, by this point, the arcade scene was on the decline, and outside of a re-release of the original Space Harrier for the Switch, this franchise has joined its prehistoric enemies. Now, after messing around with on-rail shooters, races, and penguins, Sega wanted to take a shot at platformers. Wonder Boy would be released in arcades in 1986, and followed the titular character Wonder Boy, as he ventured through seven areas in an attempt to rescue his girlfriend, who had been captured by the Dark King. Sounds normal so far, right? Well, Wonder Boy himself was actually a tribal caveman, that had the ability to throw stone hatchets at enemies, but he also rode skateboards that could be found in eggs? The game, like many of Sega's at the time, went on to gain considerable success in arcades, before being ported over to numerous home consoles. It would also establish the long-running Wonder Boy series, which included a further five sequels up until Monster World 4 in 1994 for the Mega Drive. And while initially a Japanese exclusive, by 2012 an English language version would release digitally on all consoles. Furthermore, a remake of Monster Hunter 4 would be developed by Art Dink, now titled Wonder Boy Ash and Monster World, which would release in May of 2021. Due to this recent remake not doing too hot though, I think it's more than likely in the life support tier. So the creation of the cute em up genre, which is pretty much just shoot em up but with cute stuff, and yes, before you ask, that, that is a genre that exists, is often credited to Fantasy Zone, the next franchise on this list. Fantasy Zone follows Oppa Oppa, as he used his bullets and bombs to destroy enemy bases. Players could upgrade his weapons as well as increase his speed throughout each stage, and these stages would often end in a boss battle, leading to Fantasy Zone actually popularizing the boss rush mode in which the player was tasked with facing multiple bosses in quick succession. Some have referred to Oppa Oppa as Sega's first mascot, but judging by the little guy's lack of a face, or any real identifiable features, I can see why they eventually had him replaced. Even so, the game was quite successful in Japan, leading to a multitude of sequels. Two of these made their way to the west in Fantasy Zone 2, The Tears of Oppa Oppa, and Super Fantasy Zone in 1992. A further two games would follow, neither of which made it out of Japan, meaning we once again have a dead franchise on our hands. Now if you thought One Punch Man was strong, wait till you see this next franchise. Alex Kidd was first released in 1986 for the Master System. The player assumes the role of Alex, known to be one of Sega's earliest mascots, who must traverse levels while demolishing enemies and rocks in an attempt to collect money that could be used to purchase vehicles like motorbikes or helicopters. The game was notoriously hard for its time, as Alex had seemingly put all of his stat points into attack, and none into defense. The game also featured no save system, which may sound brutal, but there was a secret method around this, in which you could restart the level by paying with in-game currency. Alex Kidd would receive critical acclaim upon its release, and over the next four years would see an additional four games added to the franchise. 
Following the release of Alex Kidd and Shinobi World in 1990, the franchise was seemingly dying out despite its growing fanbase. In what can only be described as a miracle, however, Merge Games would revive the series with its remake of the original game titled Alex Kidd and Miracle World DX, which also released for all major consoles in 2021. Because of this, it is my great honour to announce that we finally have a Sega franchise not sitting at the bottom. However, I don't believe it's consistent enough to move past the it exists here. Now, Sega would follow up Alex Kidd with another breakout success in Outrun. Designed almost single-handedly by Yu Suzuki, the premier 3D driving game had players racing around different environments in their very own Ferrari. It was well known for its pioneering hardware, graphics, and non-linear gameplay, which allowed players to take different routes, with each representing separate difficulty levels. The game was a critical success not only becoming the highest grossing arcade game of 1987, but also Sega's most successful cabinet of the 1980s. A further three arcade sequels were released, as well as several non-arcade sequels, with the latest Outrun 2006, Coast to Coast, being released for PS2, Windows and Xbox in 2006. Well, duh. Despite the series not having a new entry since, its name has been adopted as a substitute name for the synthwave music genre, as well as being used for albums. Because of this lasting interest, I think it's plausible to put it in the zombie tier, as there's a slight chance that it may come back. Speaking of zombies, Sega would use them as an inspiration when drawing up the fly for this next franchise. What the fuck is that? Well, not actually, but Alien Syndrome was a horror game disguised as a running gun shooter, and no one can convince me otherwise. I mean, look at some of these boss designs. Yeah, you're welcome for the nightmares. The gameplay would allow up to two players to control two soldiers, who were tasked with fighting their way through levels while rescuing their comrades who were being held by aliens. It was praised for its horrific atmosphere, chilling sounds, and special effects, and went on to become one of the most successful table arcade units of the month. Alongside an upgrade for the PS2 using polygonal graphics, the franchise would get a sequel of the same name, which was released for the Wii and PSP in 2007. Unfortunately, the sequel was but a mere shell of the original, with poor enemy variety, lazy level design, and lackluster visuals. Due to the low ratings and poor sales, it's most likely been shelved by Sega, with little to no chance of being revived. Not to worry though, as the next franchise was ahead of its time. I'm talking about Afterburner, a rail shooter arcade video game released in 1987. The player was left to control what simulated an American F-14 Tomcat fighter jet. For maximum immersion, the arcade game used a motion simulator arcade cabinet, one that came with flight stick controls and was capable of tilting, rolling, and rotating the cockpit in sync with the on-screen action. Legend has it that this game was so realistic, they implemented a seatbelt on the chair to stop players from spinning out. And while there may be no sources to back up those statements, I'd like to believe that's just how epic this game was. After becoming the second highest grossing arcade game of 1987, Sega once again wasted no time and within the same year, released a sequel called Afterburner 2. Like with Zaxxon however, this was pretty much just an enhanced version of the original game. This didn't stop it from becoming the highest grossing arcade game of 1988 however, and due to this immense success, the franchise would see the release of a further four games, with the most recent being Afterburner Black Falcon, released for the PSP in 2007. Afterburner 2 has been re-released over the years, but no new game has derived from the series since Black Falcon, unfortunately making it yet another dead Sega franchise. We've now arrived at the first flagship franchise that wasn't originally owned by Sega. Shin Megami Tensei is a Japanese media franchise developed and published by Atlas before being acquired by Sega in 2013. The series debuted with digital devil story Megami Tensei, a first person dungeon crawler with turn based random encounters in which players controlled a party of two humans and a number of demons. The game would allow players to essentially gaslight demons into joining the party in exchange for items and money. The idea would go on to become the core mechanic used in Megami Tensei games, as well as its spin off series. This mixture of demon negotiation and recruitment, paired with the traditional RPG elements, was considered revolutionary for its time, and the game saw immense success upon its release. The game would go on to get its own sequel in Devil Story Megami Tensei 2, which once again garnered critical acclaim upon release and showed that Atlas had something truly special on its hands. 
Atlas would then remake the first two games under the new umbrella title Shin Megami Tensei, which has now expanded to include seven mainline games among multiple spin-offs. Each new entry would expand on the last, while still drawing from the core concepts set up by the original games. The immense success and popularity of the franchise have led to it being represented in other forms of media, such as anime and manga adaptions. While there are no sales figures for the earliest games, the latest entries into the franchise have all broken 500,000, with the most recent, Shin Megami Tensei V, selling well over 1 million units worldwide. It is without a doubt Atlas's flagship franchise, and as a byproduct, has become one of Sega's flagship franchises. The franchise was so popular that multiple spin off series have been developed from it, the first of which was the Devil Summoner series. Devil Summoner would release in 1995 for the Sega Saturn, and despite being a spin off series, would take place in an alternative modern Earth where people known as Devil Summoners would form contracts with demons using devices called Zero MPs. The games would still incorporate a traditional turn based combat system, with players taking part in battles while navigating an overworld and multiple dungeons. The subseries has expanded to include 5 games, with the most recent being Soul Hackers 2 released in 2022. Soul Hackers 2 would go on to receive mixed reception though, with many engaging with the story and characters but feeling let down by the uninspired level design. Sega would later reveal that the game was struggling to meet sales expectations, but that it would like to continue to support the series in hope of its potential long term success. I think it deserves the it exists status for a subseries because of this. Now while Sega may be disappointed in the slow decline of this spin-off series, they wouldn't have to worry at all about their next one. Barely a year after the release of Devil Summoner, Atlas would release their next spin-off series, which in some cases would go on to become even more popular than the mainline franchise. That series was Persona. Revelations Persona would initially start as an RPG game in which players controlled a group of high school students as they navigated through town areas as well as dungeons. Battles would take place in grid based arenas with characters and enemies being able to move according to their specific locations. It would also introduce the concept of summoning personas which reflected the multiple sides of each of the characters. Elements and characters such as the Velvet Room and Igor which have become synonymous with the series were also first introduced in this entry. Now while not a smash hit upon release, it did fare decently well, at least enough for it to make its way over to the west where it quickly became a cult classic. Persona 2 Innocent Sin would release a few years later in 1999 and involved many of the core features first displayed by its predecessor. While these earlier games were popular in Japan, it wasn't until the release of Persona 3 that the franchise would implement its most unique aspect resulting in the mainstream success of the series as a whole. Now while Persona 3 would continue with the high school setting and its depiction and use of personas, the game would be the first to introduce elements that mimicked simulation games. The play would now progress day by day through a typical school year in which they could form relationships with others and engage in Monday daily tasks to help increase their stats and strength of their personas. Now while this may sound boring as hell on paper, it was heavily praised and would actually go on to become one of personas defining factors and its addition would be included and expanded on in future iterations. As of the current day, there have been 5 mainline games among countless spin-off enhancements and ports. The latest in the series, Persona 5 in particular, was met with universal acclaim, with praise given to its immensely interactive world, charming characters and addictive gameplay. Persona 5 would go on to sell over 8.3 million units worldwide, becoming Atlas's most successful game, with the franchise as a whole selling over 16 million units, including spin-offs. Despite no mainline games being released in the last 7 years, the series has remained prominent with numerous spin-off games and enhancements released in recent years. It is without a doubt an Atlas flagship, and because of that, deserves a spot in Sega's flagships. We move from one smash hit to another, as Sega would debut one of their most popular series towards the end of 1987. The franchise in question is Fantasy Star, a series of RPG games that have consistently released over the last 35 years. The series can be divided into four sub-series, each taking place in their own little universe. The first four games in the series are set in the planetary system Algol and feature single player gameplay centered around turn based RPG combat. Starting with Fantasy Star Online, the series would turn more towards an online format in which players could team up cooperatively with others to take on quests and to take on bosses. This format would continue with Fantasy Star Universe, which featured a more robust single player story mode, alongside the persistent online network mode. The most recent subseries, Fantasy Star Online, which would release in Japan in 2012, had Western fans waiting until 2020 for a Western release. The game would receive a massive update with New Genesis in 2021, and like with previous games, gets frequent updates in the form of episodes that provide new stories, locations, and other content. As of the current day, 
And while it doesn't have a particularly massive concurrent player base, it's definitely consistent. The franchise has received positive reviews across its many series, and is often regarded as a classic in the RPG genre. The franchise has seen an anime, manga, and books, and even a drama created from it. And as a result, I believe it deserves a spot in Sega's mainstays. Now following Fantasy Star, Sega would release Shinobi, a side-scrolling hack and slash game where players would control ninja Joe Masashi as he fought against Zed, an organization looking to kidnap the students of his clan. The gameplay followed your typical beat-em-ups, with Joe being able to attack, jump, and use ninjutsu, which was called ninja magic. Shinobi would go on to receive critical acclaim, as well as becoming the most successful arcade unit of the month and the highest grossing in America in 1998. The game is regarded as one of the most influential ninja games ever, and the one that kicked off the genre's longest running franchise. But if you thought that meant it was still being released to this day, then I'm sorry to disappoint you. From its initial release in 1987, the Shinobi franchise has seen 12 games to its name, ending with Shinobi for the Nintendo 3DS in 2011. As was the case with a lot of these long-running franchises, the reception towards these games slowly declined over the years, with the latest receiving mixed reviews and being criticised for its difficulty, which while common for the series was released in a period of time where, well, I mean, let's just be real. As gamers, we've gotten worse. What are you aiming at? What are you aiming at? The Shinobi franchise has sold over 4.6 million units across its games, and while Joe remains an iconic Sega mascot, the current state of his franchise has definitely seen better days. At least that's what I would say. However, Sega, upon seeing my first rendition of this video, decided to prove me wrong when they announced in December of last year that they were taking things to that next level. This announcement brought to light the fact that Sega had begun development on a number of their old franchises, Shinobi being one of them. With this in mind, the franchise may move up into the it exists here for now. Now seeing the success of Shinobi, Sega saw the potential of farming the beat em up genre, as they would release Altered Beast barely 6 months later. Instead of a ninja though, Altered Beast would have you play as, well if you couldn't tell from the name, a hero chosen by god that could change into multiple magical beasts, like a wolf, a dragon, or a golden wolf. The game would feature multiplayer aspects that allowed two players to play at once, and they were tasked by Zeus himself to rescue his daughter Athena from Neph, the ruler of the underworld. Now while Shinobi was met with universal acclaim, Altered Beast was met with universal no claim because no one wanted to claim this game for well, what am I even saying? The game, while having an interesting concept, struggled due to its lack of innovation and clumsily drawn artwork and graphics. The game performed well enough to receive two sequels though, Altered Beast Guardian of the Realm for the Game Boy Advance in 2002, and more recently, Project Altered Beast, which never saw a release in North America, but was released in Japan and Europe in 2005. While the games have become a lost cause, there was talks of an animated project being announced back in 2016. Since then though, there's been no real news, which unfortunately means I have to place Altered Beast in the zombie tier. We now move on from beat-em-ups to strategy games with Herzog. Released for the top of the end computers, rocking GeForce RTX 1s in 1988, what was interesting about Herzog was that it acted as a prototype for its own sequel, Herzog's Way, which many consider as the first true real-time strategy game. Players would pilot a flying transforming mech that was used to purchase combat units which they could then airlift across the battlefield and issue commands to. Unfortunately, this game was never a huge commercial success, due to the lack of a marketing campaign and its relatively early release on the Genesis. While retrospective reviews of the franchise have always had positive things to say about it, that doesn't change the fact that due to the game's poor reception, it never got a chance to take off, and to this day remains a fairly unknown franchise. But while Herzog may have faded into obscurity, Sega's next franchise certainly wouldn't. That franchise was Golden Axe, a series of side-scrolling beat-em-up arcade games. Taking place in a medieval fantasy world, players would choose one of three heroes, tasked with recovering the legendary Golden Axe. The commercial success of the original would spawn a further four sequels and multiple spin-offs, with the most recent, Golden Axe Beast Rider, being released in 2008, and also marking the first time the series entered the 3D space. Even so, the game would still incorporate many of the series' elements, such as magic and riding beasts. The game was blasted on release though. Even IGN went on to say that this is the game worth avoiding like the plague, even if the classic remains deep and warm within your heart. Due to these poor reviews, the Golden Axe franchise has yet to see a new entry since. There was an attempt at a 3D reboot of the original alongside Streets of Rage and Altered Beast, undertaken by Sega Studios Australia, but this project would ultimately be cancelled after the studio closed down in 2013. In a weird turn of events, this cancelled prototype would actually see the light of day, when it was released as a limited one day release on Steam on October 18, 2020. This is where the story would end usually, but like I mentioned just before, Sega was upgrading to that next level. Golden Axe was one of the few shown during this announcement, and because of that, we can move it up to the it exists here as well. 
Now, after witnessing the explosive success of Tetris in the late 1980s, Sega looked to try their own hand at puzzle games. The game they released as a result was Columns, a match 3 puzzle game released for arcades in 1990. The game would be positively received and sell decently well. Many sequels and spin-offs featuring some of the best names would follow. You have classics like Column 2, The Voyage Through Time, or Column 3, Revenge of the Columns, which sound like, they sound like movies, like honestly. The franchise saw its fair share of clones back in the day as well, but none of that really mattered, as the original series has not seen a new entry since Columns Deluxe, which released for iOS in 2008. No, this is not some illusion. Sega really did partner with Disney to have Mickey Mouse star in the latest franchise, known as Illusions. <laughs> Get it? Alright, a fun fact. In Japan, the Illusion series is known as I Love Mickey Mouse, which I think is pretty wholesome. Cast of Illusions starring Mickey Mouse, which believe it or not is the actual title of the original game, was a platformer that released for the Mega Drive and Genesis in 1990. As was the case with pretty much any game released during this period, the game followed Mickey Mouse as he looked to rescue Minnie Mouse from the evil witch, Miserable. With the use of an attack called Bounce and projectiles like marbles and apples, Mickey would work his way through different levels while defeating enemies and bosses. The extremely positive reception to the game would kickstart a whole franchise of games that would end with a remake of the original, released in 2013 for all modern consoles. In a similar sense, Donald Duck would get his own sequence of games from 1991 to 1993. And while not part of the main franchise, a new side-scrolling co-op platform game titled Disney Illusion Island is scheduled to release on the Nintendo Switch on July 28, 2023, lending well to the idea that this franchise may still have something left in the tank. Now we've arrived at Sega's premier tile matching series, Puyo Puyo. Over the course of 30 years, this series has released countless games, 27 to be exact, with some years seeing the release of multiple games at once. The general aim of the games is to defeat opponents by causing the side of the screen to become filled with Puyo, slime-like creatures that fall from the top of the screen in groups of 2, 3, or 4. Sega has gone on to state that the series has sold over 35 million copies. What? But due to the success and its relative consistency, I think the franchise actually deserves mainstay status. Now the next franchise on the list is a relatively obscure one, known as Rail Chase. This was an arcade light gun game, released all the way back in 1991, and had players riding in a mining cart while being chased by what appeared to be native warriors. One of the biggest aspects was the use of DX cabinets that tilted and rocked in accordance with the in-game action. Rail Chase 2 would release a few years later, and feature similar gameplay. What's really cool is that this series was, while not incredibly successful, actually had its own theme park ride, which was featured at Sega's flagship amusement theme parks in the 1990s. Unfortunately, both these rides and the franchise as a whole have seemingly been forgotten. The Shining is up next. Wait, no, not, not that one. I mean, Shining. Do, do you get what I'm saying now? The Shining franchise, and no, I'm not talking about the horror movies. Huh. Actually, you know what? Maybe I am. All joking aside though, the Shining franchise is a series of RPG games that many consider to be the pioneer of Japanese console RPGs. Yes, even before the fabled Final Fantasy. Interestingly though, the battle scenes would actually be acted out by the in-game sprites, in a similar sense to a Fire Emblem. But if you thought Fire Emblem shout out games, then the Shining in comparison must have had diarrhea, as it would release a staggering 38 games, including remakes and enhanced ports, the latest of which being Shining Resonance Refrain, which was released in July of 2018. Now I know there was a fighting game spin-off series, but well, um, yeah, let's not talk about that. Now despite its incredible output rate, the large majority of these games have remained as Japanese exclusives, and while fan translations exist, I can't see the franchise being higher than mainstay. But if there was one franchise to shoot Sega into stardom, it would without a doubt be this next one. That's right, the one you've all been waiting for. The star of Sega, the Mario of Nintendo, the Mega Man of Capcom, the Pac-Man of Bandai Namco, the Solid Snake of Kana- Dude, we get it. Oh. Yeah, so I'm talking about Sonic. You can pat yourself on the back now for making it this far into this depressing video. Now, much like Mario, Sonic is kind of all over the place. Like, I get that he's fast, but seriously, Sonic's been in more games than I can be bothered to count. But from my sources, and not including remakes, ports, or mobile titles, it looks to be around 73 unique entries. I'm sure I don't have to state that this is an easy Sega flagship, even though I just did, but as Sega's main man, it's inevitable. The Speedy Hedgehog has participated in 2D platformers, 3D platformers, racing games, arcade games, mobile games, educational games, and even sports games. 
many of which are still being developed and released to this day. Marking itself as Sega's biggest franchise by a mile, with over 178 million software sales, 1.3 billion free-to-play mobile downloads, and countless other avenues like movies, merchandise, animations, and a thriving fandom, which has developed its fair share of fan art and fan games. It's without a doubt one of the biggest franchises in the world, and easily secures a spot atop the flagship tier. Now I feel inclined to rank and place the sub-series separately, but because Kai is my name and mediocre videos are my game, I'll just quickly run through where I would place each as a homage to the Hedgehog speed. The Sonic Riders series started off alright, but it quickly crashed into mediocrity following Sonic Freeriders which just completely sucked ass, and as a result we haven't had a new game since, dead tier. The Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing series only ever got two games, unless you include the 2019's Team Sonic Racing, and while these were fairly well received and sold decently well, were just inferior to Nintendo's kart racer Mario Kart. Despite this, Sega did release Team Sonic Racing, and while it was heavily criticised for being straight up worse than the Sega All-Stars games, it does show that recent Resources are available to continue it, life support tier. Other races like Sonic R or the Drift and Rival games I would just group as other races, but all of these haven't seen a new entry in decades, so they're probably dead. Olympics I covered in my Nintendo video, so I won't redo it here. Sonic Boom games actually had a nice run during the mid-2010s, but unfortunately have not continued since 2016, life support tier. Education games, which I'm sure most of you probably didn't even realize existed, considering there were only three of them and they were all released during the mid-1990s, dead tier. And finally, the many sports games which haven't received a new addition in decades, unfortunately leaving them in the dead tier as well. As for the many one-off entries like Pinball Party or Sonic Shuffle, I would assume they were also all dead as they never really got their own direct sequels. Now following on from Sonic, and in a similar vein to Capcom's Final Fight, Sega would release Streets of Rage. Streets of Rage was your typical beat-em-up, and drew a lot of its aspects from Final Fight, like the ability to pick up items such as knives and glass bottles that were present around the landscape. Despite its likeness to Final Fight, upon its release, the game was met with critical acclaim, with many calling it the best fighting game of all time, with its superb graphics, its huge number of attacks, and its funkadelic music, which was considered even better than Sonic the Hedgehogs. The game would top the charts and become one of Sega his best-selling titles, and unlike Capcom's Final Fight series, has continued into the current day with its most recent release, Streets of Rage 4, reviving the whole franchise which was seemingly dead back in 2020. Streets of Rage 4 in particular would sell incredibly well, shipping over 2.5 million copies, and for a genre as old as beat-em-ups, this was very impressive, and definitely set Sega up nicely if they were to continue the franchise. And continue the franchise, they did when they announced a new entry in development during their Power Surge reveal. Now unlike the other two that have been mentioned so far, I don't think this does enough to move it above the it exists tier. Now in case you were worrying about Sega losing its creativity, this next franchise would prove that they were still just as crazy as ever. Toe Jam & Earl was an action game that centred around, well, Toe Jam & Earl. The catch? They were alien rappers who had crash landed on Earth and had to collect parts of their wrecked spacecraft to escape. The game would feature a funky soundtrack and would often reference the urban culture during the 1990s. The game was to take heavy inspiration from games like Rogue, and as a result would feature roguelike elements like randomly generated levels and items. Despite the game receiving very favourable reviews, it would be deemed a commercial failure by Sega. This wasn't the end of the franchise though, as the game built up its own cult following throughout the years. This resulted in a further three sequels being released, and in a similar fashion to Streets of Rage, the franchise had experienced a long hiatus before its most recent game, Toe Jam & Earl, back in the groove, reviving it with its release back in 2019. Now remember how I said that this game had its own cult following? Well apparently Stephen Curry was the leader of it, as on the 5th of December in 2022, a Toe Jam and Earl movie had been announced as in development from Amazon Studios, who were working with Stephen Curry and his production company, Unanimous Media. While this is cool and all, because of the long hiatus between its games, I don't believe the franchise could be any higher than it exists, but honestly it's more likely a life support franchise, given that the most recent game was pretty much just an enhanced remake of the original. Now the depression continues with this next franchise, Land Stalker. This action adventure game game had players take on the role of a treasure hunter as they navigated through a 3D world solving puzzles and fighting enemies. The game was a major critical and commercial success, but while its planned sequel ended up being cancelled, I still thought it should be added as the series would have its own spin-off and Lady Stalker challenge from the past, as well as its main characters Nigel and Friday appearing in Climax Entertainment's Time Stalkers, an RPG that brought together many of Climax's characters from their series. Land Stalkers has been re-released several times on the Virtual Console, Steam, and most recently on the Sega Genesis Mini. A remake was also apparently in the works for the PSP during 2005, but unfortunately was also cancelled. At the end of the day, it joins the rest of the dead franchises. Now, does anyone remember the Asterix comics? 
You know, the series that follows Asterix and Obelix as they cause hell for the Roman invaders during their adventures? Following the immense success of this comic, the series would quickly migrate into plenty of other media formats, including game books, board games, and most importantly, video games. Now, Asterix has been passed around by plenty of publishers, such as Atari and Konami, but for the sake of this video, we will only be discussing the four games published by Sega, the first of which was the fittingly named Asterix, which was released in 1992 for arcades. The game was a typical side-scrolling platform game, in which Asterix and obelisks must navigate through each stage looking for a key that would be required to open the door at the end of it. The game was heavily praised for its similarities to the source material. The Asterix series would see a further three entries, released over the next three years until 1995. I'm guessing by this point that it either wasn't selling well or Sega just gave up on the franchise because there hasn't been anything from them since. Interestingly, Asterix himself has seen numerous releases up to this day by other publishers like Atari Europe. In relation to Sega though, this is nothing more than another dead franchise. We go from comics to cartoons, as Sega would start its own series of games centering around Taz, from the cartoon series Tasmania. The first of several games was a 2D side-scrolling platform adventure game, first released in 1992 for the Mega Drive and Genesis. The game would feature a grand adventure where Taz, dazzled by the prospects of a massive omelette, would find himself adventuring through the lands in hopes of finding a giant egg laid by the giant seabirds. The game would actually become a bestseller in the UK for two months, with many critics praising it for its stunning visuals for its time. An official sequel titled Tasmania 2 was conceptualised but never made it past development. Not to worry though, as Taz would return in 1994 following the release of Taz and Escape from Mars. And while many considered it a step forward in comparison to its predecessor, it was also seemingly the last step Sega would take with the Looney Tunes Devil. So by now, Sega's tried their hand at Penguin Games, then they moved on to Hedgehog Games. Any guesses as to what animal they tried next? I'll give you a hint, it starts with Dolph and ends with Finn. Ah, uh, why do I always do this? Anyway, the next franchise Sega would release was Echo the Dolphin. The player takes control of Echo, a bottlenose dolphin who travels through time to combat extraterrestrials in Earth's oceans and on an alien spacecraft. Yeah, have I mentioned that Sega has some seriously whack ideas? Now if you ever want to test your skills as a game, then this is the game to play. Echo makes Sonic look like a snail, honestly. The tight underwater caves, the incredibly fast movements, especially when you ram into enemies, and the overall layout of the levels made the game incredibly hard. It was also somewhat unnerving, finding yourself alone in the depths of the ocean. But maybe that was just how I thought about it. The original would become a bestseller on the Sega Mega Drive, resulting in the production of a further four sequels, which were released over an eight year period until the year 2000, with Echo the Dolphin, Defender of the Future. A sequel titled Echo 2 Sentinels of the Universe was actually in production in 2001, but was ultimately cancelled following the decline of the Dreamcast. A playable build of this cancelled sequel surfaced online in 2016. Now while this franchise may look like a lost cause, there is actually some hope for a new entry. Following a settlement reached by series creator Ed Annunziata with Sega regarding legal rights to the franchise, Annunziata himself would go on to express interest in reviving the series on the Nintendo Switch. And because of that, I believe I can move it up to the zombie tier. We move into the year 1993 now, and Sega was making some big moves. I'm not sure if you've heard of this small movie series called Jurassic Park, but it was pretty much about this zoological park that showcased genetically engineered dinosaurs and how that caused it to all fall apart. Anyway, Sega wanted to give this small movie series a chance, and decided to lend them a hand by developing games in relation to the movies. The first, which took on the same name as the film, would release in 1993 for the Sega Genesis. The game was your standard side-scrolling action game, with basic platforming elements. The goal was to reach the end of the level, but what made this game so unique was the choice of playing as the titular character Dr. Alan Grant, or a Velociraptor. Now, I don't know about you guys, but who'd want to play as some lame paleontologist when you could play as a freaking raptor that could jump higher, run faster, and rip enemies apart? Well, maybe that's just my preference. Regardless, the game sold incredibly well, breaking records at the time and blessing fans with a further two sequels, the first of which being a rail shooter which took place in a cabinet that actually resembled the rear of the Ford Explorer tour vehicles from the film, and then the series would finish off with The Lost World Jurassic Park in 1997. But wait, did the series get a revival with the Jurassic World trilogy? <laughs> no, it's dead. Now if there was one genre that dominated the 90s, it would without a doubt be fighting games. Street Fighter 2 in particular helped pave the way for fighting game dominance in arcades during this period, and Sega saw this as an opportunity to release their very own fighting game franchise, the first of which being Virtua Fighter. Now Virtua Fighter would separate itself from your typical fighting games, being the very first arcade fighting game to feature fully 3D polygon graphics. It would go on to receive critical acclaim, becoming one of Sega's best-selling arcade games of all time. 
The series has exploded into a very successful franchise with four mainline sequels and several spin-offs and has become Sega's flagship fighting series. With its consistent releases that have continued to this day and the immense success it's seen in arcades, I think it deserves a slot as a Sega flagship. And if you disagree, then I mean, come on, you, have you not seen the state of their list so far? You have to give them something. Now I really hope no one's been taking shots for every dead franchise. Well, if you have, you're probably not with us anymore anyway. And if you're thinking of starting now, um, I would advise against it because the next franchise on the list is Gunstar Heroes. What's Gunstar Heroes like here you asking? Exactly. But the game itself would follow a pair of characters known as the Gunstar, and a run and gun style as they blasted their way through enemies with fancy acrobatic maneuvers to boot. The game would receive very positive reviews, and cemented Treasure's place in gaming history. A long 12 years followed before the Gunstar Heroes franchise would get a sequel, in the form of Gunstar Super Heroes, which was released on the Game Boy Advance in 2005. The sequel too would go on to receive critical acclaim, with many granting it the best GBA game of E3 2005. Unfortunately, no one bought the game, and the series itself is pretty much died out since. It would release on Steam later in 2011, but apart from that, it's been radio silent. Interestingly enough, this next franchise started off as a spin-off from another Sega game called Bonanza Bros. The main characters from that game, Robo and Mobo, would feature in this new puzzle game in which players would compete in a series of timed minigames. Despite the game receiving mixed reviews, it would still spawn two sequels, first released in 1994 and then in 1995. That's really all there is to say about this series though, and its absence since means that it's yet another one of Sega's dead franchises. Now you know how I said that the 90s were dominated by fighting games? and that everyone was trying to get in on the action? Well apparently that also included Atlas. And while technically not a subsidiary at the time, them selling out later means that I have to include their fighting game franchise Power Instinct as well. Now there was only one goal when looking to release your very own fighting game during this period, and that was to not look like a Street Fighter 2 ripoff. You'd see games releasing with random ass characters or random ass movesets, but nothing would compare to Power Instinct. I mean look at this gameplay, I mean <laughs> what are those sounds? Is he, is he, is he sucking his face? Yeah. I honestly have no words. If anything, these absurd actions were what helped the series gain some traction, and I can't lie, I can certainly see why. Unfortunately, this series didn't survive the test of time, as the latest release dates date back to early 2009, with no news of a future entry. Now if you thought Sega was done with fighting games, then think again, as Sega would release Eternal Champions, meaning that in 1993 alone, Sega had already released two different fighting game franchises. It's no wonder that they have so many dead ones. To help differentiate themselves from the competition, Sega wanted to make sure Eternal Champions was as unique as possible. But while something like Super Smash Bros carved out its own identity with its unique aspects and flourished because of it, Eternal Champions' unique aspects were instead met with a very mixed response. There was a heavier emphasis on the story. The characters came from a bunch of different time periods, which meant that some would carry weapons or even force fields, which were all very strange for the time. Despite the criticism, the game would still sell well, and even received a sequel and two spin-offs, the latest of which being x Perts, a side-scrolling beat-em-up released in 1996 for the Genesis. In typical Sega fashion, however, the third game in the series would be cancelled during development, and no news has been heard since. I really do hope no one's taking shots for every dead franchise, and if you are, rest in peace brother, you will be remembered as a true legend. Wait, what's that? Another hit film series? Guess we gotta sweep in on that and make a few games out of it. That's what Sega must have been thinking following the success of the Alien franchise, as within a year they had already released Alien 3 The Gun, an arcade rail shooter based on the film of the same name. What was actually pretty cool though was this gun that the players used had been modelled off the M4A1 pulse rifle that it was seen in the films, so you could say that you were really there, fighting face huggers and soldiers. The arcade game would become the most successful upright arcade unit of the month, and while no direct sequel would follow, this wouldn't be Sega's last venture into this series. After what felt like centuries, Sega would drop one of the best survival horror games in recent years on us, with its release of Alien Isolation back in 2014. The game, which was once again based on the original film, this time set 15 years in the future, would emphasize stealth and survival horror gameplay. Players were equipped with a motion tracker and were incentivized to avoid and outsmart enemies rather than fight them. Should you find yourself forced into combat though, Amanda, the game's protagonist, had access to numerous weapons such as shotguns, bolt guns, and a flamethrower, which were all found throughout the course of the game. This iteration would receive generally favourable reviews and sell over 2 million copies. Sega would go on to say that these sales numbers were weak though, which I never understood. Even so, the possibility for a sequel was definitely explored, but was later shut down due to the large majority of the original team no longer working at Creative Assembly. I still believe there may be hope for a new entry, but with Sega, you never know. So for now, it's most likely a zombie tier. Now if you've ever been to an arcade, 
and more specifically how to go at the racing games available, you'll most likely recognize this next franchise. The Daytona series of racing games has to be one of the most recognizable and influential arcade races of all time. The first of several would release back in 1994, where it was already making use of its rendered 3D graphics and texture mapping. The game, while not a breakout hit upon its release, has stood the test of time, with its longevity far exceeding many of its competitors in the same genre. The series has seen multiple sequels and remakes over the years, and despite it seemingly dying out in the early 2000s, was recently resurrected with Daytona Championship USA or Daytona USA 3, which debuted in late 2016 as an arcade exclusive. The series as a whole has been extensively praised for its state-of-the-art graphics, sound design, and damage physics. And while it may not be the most consistent franchise out there, I still think it can slot into the It Exists tier for now mainly due to its longevity. Now after witnessing the success of Virtua Fighter, Sega wanted to expand the graphical style used in that game to more genres. Virtua Cop, a 1994 light gun shooter, was one of the many games birthed as a result. This was the case with Virtua Fighter when it was released. Virtua Cop became well known for being the first time 3D polygon graphics had been used in real time with texture mapping. And in case you didn't know, Sega made sure you did, as they would advertise the game as the world's first texture mapped polygon action game. Enemies would react differently depending on where they were shot, and the game would also be the first to not use bulletproof glass, as players were finally allowed to shoot through glass and watch it shatter. These additions were extremely impressive at the time, and the game would go on to influence later shooters such as Time Crisis, The House of the Dead, and even the cult classic GoldenEye 007. The positive reception received pushed Sega to develop a further two sequels, in Virtual Cop 2 and Virtual Cop 3. Now despite the success of Virtual Cop 2, the lack of interest following Virtual Cop 3 most likely killed off any chance of a revival for this franchise. While while a port of Virtual Cop 3 was initially planned for the Xbox, it was later cancelled due to the cost required in designing a light gun to be used specifically for this game on that console. World Series Baseball. It sounds like your typical old school sports game, right? But this inconspicuous title was actually part of what would one day become a titan of the sports gaming genre. If you remember at the start of this video, where I stated that some of Sega's older franchise had been sold off to other companies, well this is what I was talking about. I'm referring to 2K's acquisition of Virtual Concepts, the studio which is now heralded as the king of 2K sporting franchises. I know I said I most likely wouldn't include these, but I thought I might as well quickly run through them, just to give you guys an idea of how some of the most popular sporting games first came to be, and where better to start than with World Series Baseball, released all the way back in 1994 for the Sega Genesis. Now this wasn't by any means the first baseball game, but it definitely was a major improvement over the earlier ones. It would be the first game to include licensed MLB players and teams, and for its time featured relatively accurate gameplay. As is the case even today with sports games, a new year meant a new entry, and the World Series Baseball franchise would continue until 2K3 in, you guessed it, 2003, where Sega would strike a deal with 2K Games to sell a visual concepts and the IP of the 2K Sports series for a measly 24 million. And yes, I know 20 years ago that probably sounded like a lot, but I mean, looking at it now, it just looks like daylight robbery. The next sport that Sega tackled was NFL, with the release of NFL Football 95 starring Joe Montana. Can you imagine if they kept that naming convention? NBA Basketball 23 starring Nikolai Jokic. Actually, you know what? Maybe Sega was onto something. On a more serious note though, this wasn't actually the first Joe Montana game, which was actually released all the way back in 1991. The thing is, at the time, Sega didn't obtain any licenses from the NFL, so apart from Joe Montana, the rest of the players were actually just made up people. This is a weird series honestly, Sega signed a 1.5 million 5 year contract with Joe Montana, and had him featured in 5 games up until NFL 95. But this wasn't the end of the franchise, as Sega continued on, now featuring Dion Sanders instead. In July 1997, Joe Montana actually filed a 5 million dollar lawsuit against Sega, claiming that they had breached their license with them. But seeing as I can't find anything more than that, I'm just going to assume that it didn't really go anywhere. NFL then led in into the NFL 2K series, which Sega continued until NFL 2K5, before 2K Sports would take over. A similar story can be said about Sega's NHL ice hockey series. No cool lawsuits to mention this time though, as the series continued in a similar fashion until NHL 2K5, once again with 2K Sports taking over. Now let's talk about the big dog. Yes, that's right, I'm talking about NBA 2K series, which actually started with Sega, believe it or not, all the way back in 1999 with the first NBA 2K on the Dreamcast. Unlike the NFL, Sega did have licensing rights to use real players and thus begun the norm for updated NBA seasons of players and teams. I bet Sega is kicking themselves for letting this one go. 
But alas, by the end of 2003, and following the release of NBA 2K5, this series was also lost to 2K Sports. Now, the next sports game series never did get picked up by 2K, most likely because college football's national championship was just considered a mere clone of the Joe Montana games, but with college teams instead of professional teams. The game even used the exact same engine and featured exhibition matches as well as a tournament mode. It would get a sequel titled College Football National Championship 2, which was released a year later in 1995. And finally, there was Sega Worldwide Soccer, a series of soccer games developed and released between 1995 and 2000. While these games often featured licensed teams, there wasn't too much setting them apart from other typical sporting games at the time, with many of the games in the series receiving mixed reception upon their release. With all of these sporting series, it's safe to say that they all belong in the dead tier for one reason or another. Now, do you remember the old Mighty Morphin Power Rangers show? Well, what if I told you that you could play the show as a game? because that's exactly what Sega tried to achieve with their release of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers for the Sega CD. Honestly, they were, they were really stretching it by calling this one a video game, as it essentially played back episodes of the TV series of the same name, but added what were early iterations of quick time events, which while they did nothing to change what was happening in the episodes, obviously, did take away from players' health bars and score that were kind of just slapped on the screen. Now while it may sound cool in theory, it looks as if you'd be split between paying attention to what was going on in the episode itself, while also waiting and focusing on random quick time events that show up. But maybe that's just me. This game did go on to become the top selling Sega CD after all. It must have struck a chord for some people. The series would go on to get its own spiritual successor called Mighty Morphin Power Ranger, the movie. And despite its name, these were actual video games. So let me get this straight. The first one, which is just the title of the show, was just the show with quick time events thrown in. But the one that clearly says the movie after it isn't actually a movie, but instead is a set of video games? <laughs> Someone make it make sense. The movie video games were actually a set of four different adaptions of the same film, each released on a different console. The Super NES got a side-scrolling action game, the Game Boy got something similar, the Game Gear got a competitive fighting game, and the Genesis would receive a side-scrolling beat-em-up, all of which would end up in the dead pile of Sega franchises, well at least the Genesis one would. Another month meant another racing series, and this time it was the Sega Rally franchise. What started in 1994 with the Sega Rally Championship quickly expanded into a series of five games, with the most recent, Sega Rally 3, being released in 2008. Apart from the series being the first to have players race on different terrains, which actually had an impact on the vehicle's handling, there's honestly not too much to say about it. With the latest entry never seeing a Japanese release, I can't say that it's likely we'll see a new installment anytime soon, if at all. And the award for the most creative main goes to... It's the biggest piece of dog shit. Well, I thought it sounded cool. The uninspiring name aside, Bug was a platform game first released in 1995 for the Sega Saturn. It would be one of the first platformer games to incorporate 3D environments and restrict players' movements to a track. The game, believe it or not, centered around a bug called Bug, who was a green bug and Hollywood actor who wanted to gain more clout by defeating the vicious queen Kadavra. Bug would work his way through multiple worlds, which made up Bug Island. Are you guys sick of hearing me say bug yet? Well. <laughs> There's plenty more, don't worry. These worlds were filled with enemy bugs, ranging from insects to mollusks to arachnids, with each ending in a boss fight. Now while Bug didn't catch the eye of the general public, it did receive generally positive reviews. A sequel titled Bug 2, get it? Because it's the, the second game? You don't say! Yeah, they need to work on their titles. The sequel would feature much of the same as its predecessor, but would suffer from poor camera settings, resulting in very frustrating gameplay. Following Bug 2, Sega would squish him, with no chance of a revival. Now what better way to follow up a game series about a bug, than with a game series about a toy soldier? Sega was certainly working overtime in the creative department with these games. Now, while Bug was looking to take out royalty in the form of Queen Kadavra, Sir Tongara, the protagonist of Clockwork Knight, wanted nothing more than to win the heart of royalty, due to his love for the fairy princess, Chelsea. Being a side-scrolling platformer in the same vein as the Mario and Sonic series, the game would separate itself from the bunch by using 2D sprites on top of fully 3D levels and bosses. Its short length and extremely easy difficulty were criticised, however, and the game never really took off as a result. Even so, just six months later, a sequel would be released titled Clockwork Knight 2, which just as quickly picked up on the cliffhanger left by its predecessor. Clockwork Knight 2 would fare much better than the original, and would go on to garner praise for its much greater replay value, graphics, and the endless number of secrets. Following this entry, the franchise would see a number of planned sequels, none of which made it past the beta stage unfortunately. Because of this, it seems as though Sega has lost hope in this franchise as well. Now we'll take a quick detour back in time for this one, which I seemingly missed in my first part. 
Thunderblade has little to do with thunder or blades, and instead has a lot to do with decimating enemy tanks, helicopters, and structures from inside a helicopter with your chain gun and missiles. The game was heavily inspired by the 1983 film Blue Thunder, which is where its name is derived from. The game started as your standard stand-up arcade cabinet, but was later updated to a helicopter-shaped sit-down model that would move in tandem with the joystick. A sequel titled Super Thunderblade would release a year later as a launch title for the Sega Genesis, and featured a lot of the same as its predecessor. Despite the appeal of the games, there has not been a new iteration outside of a few re-releases of Super Thunderblade, and therefore we can slot it once again into the dead tier. Now what did I tell you? This part of the video isn't any better, and to prove that, let me introduce you to Beyond Oasis, one of the best action-adventure games of its time. The player took control of good old Prince Ali, who after finding a buried gold armlet, could use it to summon four spirits. Being that it's an action-adventure game, it shares elements similar to games such as The Legend of Zelda, where Prince Ali can pick up items, restore health, mana, and gain numerous special weapons. The game received incredibly positive reviews, leading to a sequel, or should I say a prequel, titled The Legend of Oasis in 1996. Yeah, I think they were taking its similarities to The Legend of Zelda a bit too literally with that title. The gameplay, while still involving the collecting of elemental spirits, now took place in real time, and each weapon came with its own set of special attacks that played out in fighting game styles. The prequel was positively received as well, but I'm guessing sales must have been lacking, as this would be the last time we saw anything to do with the Oasis series. Following the immense success of Sega's first 3D fighter, Virtua Fighter, they looked to return to the genre with the release of Fighting Vipers. The game incorporated the same engine as Virtua Fighter 2, which would instead feature enclosed arenas and its own unique armor mechanic. This armor would slowly be broken upon taking damage, leaving opponents susceptible to heavier hits that dealt more damage. Fighting Vipers, unlike the many fighting games prior, featured more freedom styles of martial arts in a US setting to cater more towards a western player base, and to a certain degree this proved to be extremely effective, as the game would go on to become the most popular arcade game at the time. This would lead to its very own sequel in Fighting Vipers 2, which would release just three years later in arcades. While the game went on to become a hit in arcades in Japan, the game would never make it to the US even though it was initially slated for a US release. The original Fighting Vipers would get a re-release in late 2012 on the PlayStation Network, but outside of that, this makes up another of Sega's lost franchises. Oh, would you look at that? We've stumbled across one of the best rail shooters ever, Panzer Dragoon. Get this. In this game, you play as a hunter who rides his own dragon as he blasts his way through waves of different enemies. With six levels each being connected through cutscenes, the game separated itself with its 3D field of view in which enemies could appear from all sides. Yes, that means even behind you. It made gameplay extremely exciting, and the fact that you were riding a goddamn dragon just made it that much cooler. While the game garnered very positive reviews, the game suffered from low sales, most likely because it was stuck on the Sega Saturn, which was getting beaten down by the original PlayStation at the time. Even so, Pan Panzer Dragoon would fight for its life and actually managed to spawn its own series of games. In total, the Panzer Dragoon series has released six games, five of which have been released between 1995 and 2002. After an extremely long wait, the original game would receive a remake, which was released in 2020 for the Nintendo Switch. Outside of this respective franchise, former development staff have worked on multiple spiritual successes, such as Rez in 2001 and Crimson Dragon in 2013, giving hope to the possibility of a series revival in some regards. Despite its recent remake, I believe we'd be incredibly unlikely to see a new game anytime soon, but for now, I think it can slot into life support. Following on from Panzer Dragoon, Sega would return to the RPG genre with the release of Mysteria The Realms of Lore in 1995, also for the Sega Saturn. While this game would incorporate your typical turn-based combat on grid-based battlefields, it would differentiate itself by having rather unique objectives alongside eliminating enemies. These could range from reaching a certain destination or avoiding contact with enemies entirely. The formation of your party was also done in a non-linear format, and the story would actually adjust itself depending on the newest character addition to that party. While it was positive positively received in Japan, many critics believed it would not fare well in the West, as there was far too little story to drive players forward, and certain aspects became far too tedious, especially for an audience that at the time had very little exposure to the genre as a whole. These concerns are probably the reason why the game's sequel titled Rig Lord Saga 2 never made its way out of Japan. Regardless, Rig Lord 2 would mark the final entry in this franchise, and I'm starting to think I should have made this tier even larger. So among the galaxy's greatest heroes, we've got Iron Man, Batman, Superman, and Vector Man. Wait, 
You, you don't know about Vector Man? Well settle in, and let me tell you the story of the greatest man of them all. Vector Man was the titular character of his own 2D action platformer, in which he could be seen jumping, running, and blasting enemies with projectile attacks. Similar in a sense to Mega Man. Dang, I guess it was just customary back then to put man behind everything. Regardless, he would also be given the special ability to transform into different forms, such as a helicopter or other vehicles. These would give him certain abilities tied to that transformation. Vector Man was so strong, he transformed himself into stellar reviews, and stories of his righteous nature and courage as he saved the Earth were spread across the galaxy, resulting in over 500,000 people picking up a copy of his games. Due to popular demand, he would return only a year later in Vector Man 2, where he did much of the same. Despite him once again saving the day, he would soon vanish, never to be seen again. Rumors surfaced about him returning in a third installment, and he even came back to tease his fans at E3 2003, but was later cancelled for being too green, and he hasn't been back since. He doesn't deserve it, but Vectorman is unfortunately a dead man. So Sega had incorporated their Virtua 3D style into fighting games, then into shooters, so of course the next logical step would be to incorporate this style into sports games, and that's exactly what they did with the release of Virtua Striker. As was the case with both Virtua Fighter and Virtua Cop, Virtua Striker would get its namesake by incorporating the unique 3D polygonal computer graphics that had shot both the previous series to start in, and in classic Sega fashion, they would advertise this new series as the first three-dimensional computer graphics soccer game. I'm starting to think Sega may have a kink for being the first to do things. Regardless, the series would see four mainline entries, released consistently throughout the years from 1994 with the original to 2006 with Virtua Striker 4. Honestly, for the most part, the game still seems to hold up somewhat to this day. Virtua Striker 4 remains the last entry and it stayed that way for over 15 years. By this point, had it been a few years since Sega's last beat-em-up franchise, Sega would return to the genre with the release of Die Hard Arcade in 1996. This game would also be the first beat-em-up to use texture-mapped 3D polygon graphics. Now I know what you're thinking, well that can't be right, this game isn't called Virtua Beta or something similar, and honestly I'm surprised Sega didn't continue with that naming convention. But fancy 3D polygon graphics weren't all that this new beat-em-up had to offer. Die Hard also included a more sophisticated moveset, quick time events, and the ability to combine items to make more powerful weapons. The violence, while being dramatic and over the top, wasn't particularly gory, and instead was hyped up to play more of a comedic role. A sequel known as Dynamite Cop would release two years later and feature similar gameplay to its predecessor. Its main main character, Delinga, would actually make a cameo appearance in The House of the Dead 2. Outside of that though, the Dynamite and Decker franchise has been lost to the wayside, never to appear again. Sega was really firing on all cylinders during this period, and this next series continued to prove that. Let me introduce you to Dragon Force, a relatively unknown real-time strategy game that was initially released in 1996 for the Sega Saturn. The game was quite unique in that it had players assume the role of one of the game's eight rulers. These rulers were all vying for control of Legendra, and to help them had an army of up to 100 soldiers. Armies would travel between towns and castles via fixed routes on an overhead map, and when two armies collided on the map, a battle would ensue. This is where the gameplay really took on a life of its own. These battles were played out in real time, and featured the sprites of all your soldiers, meaning that there could be up to 200 soldiers fighting on screen at any one time. Decisions had to be made on the fly, and this led to some incredibly engaging and chaotic fun. The game would go on to receive critical acclaim for its melding of war simulation along with its story-driven RPG genres, and is often regarded as one of the Saturn's best games. The game would also sell decently well, shipping over 400,000 copies worldwide. This led to the creation of a sequel, fittingly titled Dragon Force 2, just two years after the original. Unfortunately, this game would remain a Japanese exclusive release, and the series as a whole has not received another entry since. Sega's next endeavour would be the Knights franchise. The first game in the series, Knights into Dreams, was a 1996 action game that followed teenagers Elliot Edwards and Clarice Sinclair as they entered the dream world Nightopia. It was here that they would meet the exiled Nightmarin Knights and start their journey to stop the evil ruler Wiseman from destroying Nightopia and with it, the real world. Players would take control of knights as they flew through Elliot and Clarice's dreams, while collecting enough energy to, to defeat Wiseman. Each of these levels came with a time limit, and while the controls certainly took some time to get used to, there was no better feeling once mastered than to watch as you strung together multiple loops and orbs in a fluid fashion. I remember thinking for a game called Knights, why were all the levels played during what appeared to be daytime? But ignoring the thoughts of a dumb little kid who could barely manage to do anything on this game back in the 2000s, the game would receive acclaim for its graphics, gameplay, soundtrack, and unique atmosphere. 
It is often credited as one of the greatest games of all time, and would go on to become the best-selling game on the Saturn in 1996. You'd expect following this kind of response that a sequel would be in development the next day, but unfortunately for fans, they'd have to wait almost a decade before the long-awaited sequel, Knight's Journey of Dreams, would release in 2007 for the Nintendo Wii. The sequel would incorporate a lot from its predecessor, and in similar fashion had Knight's flying through the dreams of the two children while gathering keys to progress. This iteration would go on to receive criticism due to its controls, camera and aesthetics, but despite this mixed reception, series creator Takashi Lizuka would state that he was still interested in developing a third installment. With no new updates in the following years, many considered the franchise to have died off, but in 2019, Sega would file the trademark for Knight's Dream Wheel. This raised a few eyebrows, with many thinking a new game would be coming out soon. Unfortunately, in June of 2021, it was revealed that this was merely a slot machine at a resort and casino. I think the interest is still there though, and while the likelihood of a new entry is extremely low, it can still survive in the zombie tier. Now hear me out, imagine this, it's 1996, and there's a tactical RPG game, so far so good right? But this game also works as a dating sim, with storytelling reminiscent of visual novels. Doesn't that sound like fun? Wait, wh why are you leaving? To say the Sakura Wars franchise was ambitious would be an understatement, especially for the time period. Sure, there were plenty of popular tactical RPGs, and while not hugely popular, visual novels definitely had their own fan base. But the thought of mixing these genres as well as implementing dating sim mechanics was unheard of. It was so out there that Sega had to term it a dramatic adventure, as there really wasn't anything like it to compare it to. The gameplay, which was somewhat inspired by Fire Emblem, was split between adventure-style segments where players could explore environments and interact with cast members, and battle sections where your choices from the adventure sections would actually have an effect. It was also during these adventure sections that players could pursue romances with the female cast, which by these days standards doesn't seem too strange when you think of games like Fire Emblem or the Persona series. Now, it's understandable for outsiders to think that the game may not perform well, but even a few staff members were skeptical that the game would even be commercially successful. Well, they were most likely roasted the following week, as the original Sucker Wars would outsell all expectations. The game received positive reviews and the series has now expanded to include six mainline games and plenty of spin-offs. The series has also branched into the anime and film industry, where it's had multiple series produced for it. Despite the success, the series did actually die out at one point, following the release of Sakura Wars So Long My Love in 2005. But due to the positive fan response at Sega's FES convention, the series was renewed with its latest entry in 2019. This entry in particular was met with very average reviews though, so while it had fun interactions between its characters, I'm not too sure we'll see another entry, at least not for a while. If Sega's flagship fighter is Virtual Fighter, and their flagship platform is Sonic the Hedgehog, then their flagship horror series would without a doubt be the House of the Dead. What started off as a horror-themed light gun shooter quickly spawned into a series of games that has continued to this very day. The original House of Dead, which had been released back in 1996, followed agents Thomas Rogan and G in their attempts to stop the disillusioned Dr. Kurian and his army of undead from overrunning the unsuspecting populace. Being that the game was a rail shooter, players were tasked with shooting oncoming zombies. It wasn't all linear, however, as there were certain choices players could make that would affect the direction of the gameplay. This game in particular, alongside Resident Evil, is often credited for popularizing zombie video games, as well as bringing zombies back into the limelight, leading to a renewed interest in zombie films and pop culture going into the 2000s. The series would expand to include four further sequels, as well as a remake that was recently released in 2022. Furthermore, during an interview with Sega in 2019, series director Takashi Oda stated that he wanted to produce three more games for the series, essentially alluding to the continuation of this franchise. Taking this into account, I'm willing to drop this series into the mainstays, and I'm aware that there was a somewhat long drought period, but with the renewed interest and recent entries, I think has a good chance of staying on track for now. Now if you're a fan of mechs, then you're gonna love this next franchise. I'm talking about Virtual On Cyber Troopers, a 3D fighting game where players battled in massive mechs while zooming around large open-ended arenas. Players had a choice of multiple Virtuaroids, each with their own unique selection of weapons. I always loved Raiden and his shoulder-mounted laser cannons. Despite this, the series never got its own direct sequel. Now you may be wondering, well why is it included in this video then? Well that's because the game did end up with its own spiritual successor, but not in the way you'd think. This spiritual successor would be in the form of a certain magical virtual on, which combined the gameplay of the 3D fighter 
with the characters and story of a certain magical index, a popular light novel series that has had its own fair share of spin-off games. It just so happens that one of them incorporated elements from Cyber Troopers. Even with this though, I'm going to have to say that this franchise is most likely a dead one. In what may be the best box art for a video game ever, we have Sega Bass Fishing. Honestly, you could have no text on this cover, and I'd know exactly what I was in for. Uh. What started as an arcade game quickly got ported over to systems like the Dreamcast, Xbox 360, PS3, and Wii. The goal of bass fishing surprisingly has nothing to do with bass, at least not specifically. The player was tasked with catching a certain weight of fish within the time limit to progress. Despite its simplicity, the arcade version of the game actually got listed as the second most popular arcade game of the month. Bass fishing was such a huge hit that a further two games were released. In 2012, an on-rails FPS crossover titled Sega Bass Fishing of the Dead was reported to be in development for Nintendo's Wii U and 3DS. But in what may be one of the most disappointing reveals ever, it was all just an April Fool's joke. I have yet to recover from that. I mean, who wouldn't want to play a game like this? Sega Bass Fishing of the Dead? More like Sega Bass Fishing in the Dead, Tia. <laughs> I think I'm starting to lose it, guys. Now Sega's next franchise, Spike Out, would return to the beat-em-up style in the same vein as Streets of Rage. The difference this time was that Spike Out ushered the beat-em-up genre into the 3D landscape. The arcade game would become the third most successful game of the month and spawn its own set of sequels. The first was Spike Out Final, which was released a year later in 1999. Slash Out would switch things up, now taking place in a medieval fantasy setting and act as a slash em up instead. Spiker's Battle would add a versus fighting element when it was released in 2001, and the final game in the franchise, Spike Out Battle Street, was released exclusively to the Xbox back in 2005. That's right, Xbox used to get their very own exclusives. Oh, how times have changed. Unfortunately, if there's one thing that hasn't changed, it's the overwhelming number of dead Sega franchises, with this being one of them. Choo Choo Rocket. Now with a name like that, I honestly have no idea what to expect. But in reality, this is just a series of fun action puzzle games that could be played online with friends. The main goal for this game was to place arrows on a board that would lead mice into escape rockets while avoiding cats. The game would feature both single player modes as well as a multiplayer mode, where players could battle it out to see who could collect the most mice. Due to its chaotic nature and addictive multiplayer, the game would go on to become a commercial and critical success. It had made such a large splash that other games like Sega Superstars and Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg had mini games based on Choo Choo Rocket included in them. Now, Alongside the many ports of the original, the series would actually get a sequel 20 years later with Choo Choo Rocket Universe in 2019. Despite this recent release though, I can't in good faith say that this game is any higher than the zombie tier at the moment. Hey hey, come on over, have some fun with Crazy Taxi! Now just based on the name of this next franchise, I'm sure you could guess the genre and general gist of what it had you doing. Crazy Taxi was a series of racing games that had players try and accumulate as much money as possible by delivering passengers in a speedy fashion to their destinations. The crazy aspect comes into play when you realise you can undertake crazy stunts to rack up extra tips. The franchise has been recognised for its innovative gameplay design, which was easy to learn but incredibly hard to master. It was also one of the pioneering games to introduce in-game advertising. The original, which was released back in 1999, was so popular that it got its own port to the Dreamcast, which would go on to sell over 1 million copies. After witnessing this, there was no looking back, as the series would expand to include a further 6 games ending with Crazy Taxi Tycoon, which was released for iOS and Android in 2017. The game would get delisted from both app stores in April of 2020, with the servers going offline shortly after. Now there may have been rumours circling in recent years regarding big budget reboots of some of their older IPs. It just so happens that Crazy Taxi is one of those names that has been mentioned. Now this like many rumours slowly faded into obscurity, at least until December of 2023, where the rumours were finally confirmed during Sega's Power Surge announcement. With a new Crazy Taxi in development, it only seems right to move it up into the it exists tier. Here we have one of the few games that was released only in the West and never in Japan. Toy Commander was an action game released in 1999 for the Dreamcast. You take control of an army of washed up toys, on a mission led by Huggy Bear to destroy the new army themed toys that Andy the Child got for Christmas. The game incorporates its environment into its gameplay, and a lot of the levels involve missions that take advantage of certain situations that would only happen in that specific location. It's honestly quite cool. The game would garner praise for its subtle but spectacular visuals and somewhat challenging gameplay. While no 
direct sequel would release? Some may state that Toy Racer, which was released a year later in Europe for the Dreamcast, acts as the game's sequel. Even so, the developer of these games, no cliche, would unfortunately close down in 2001, essentially cancelling any plans for future entries into the series. New toys, old toys, I guess none of that matters in the dead tier. Now have you ever wanted to race on a horse without actually needing to get on a horse? Well look no further than Derby Owners Club, the next franchise on this list. Now, I'd never heard of this series before researching this video, but from the looks of it, it does look pretty intriguing. Released back in 1999, it had players actually create their very own horse. Players could then train these horses using 10 different exercises before giving them a meal. They would then race on these horses and be given a virtual prize money based on how well the horse had performed during the race. This particular arcade game actually changed the Japanese arcade market. While it charged slightly more, it allowed for longer periods of playtime, which was a new concept for the time. This success would extend over to the American arcades as well. Even so, the cabinet was deemed too expensive, and the game did not do enough to entice casual players to have a go. Multiple updates were issued for the game, as well as a sequel in 2008 called Derby Owners Club Feel the Rush. Most recently, the franchise received an iOS and Android version in 2012. This was later shut down in 2019 though. Taking all of this into account, I don't see this franchise making a return, and unfortunately has to go into the dead tier. We've seen plenty of tactical RPGs from Sega, but how about one from Atlas? Well luckily for us, Atlas would have a crack at the genre when they released Grow Lancer in 1999. The series as a whole grew rapidly, with CareerSoft the developers pumping out 8 different iterations of the series within its 12 year lifespan. Unfortunately, the series never truly broke out of its niche shell, and as a result, no new installment has been seen since Grow Lancer 6, Precarious World, which was released back in 2007. The series would see future remakes of the original, but this too was released decades ago in 2009. And while not technically a Sega franchise, due to them now owning Atlas, it must join the rest in the dead tier. Oh, sorry. Uh, I didn't see you there. I was just rocking to some Samba de Amigo. If you couldn't tell, Samba de Amigo is a rhythm game that was first released in arcades in 1999. As is the case with many arcade games, players actually got to use controllers shaped like maracas in this game to match a series of patterns that were displayed on screen. The music in this game is the bomb, and is primarily made up of popular Latin music songs, rather than your traditional samba music. The game was incredibly fun and wacky, and it thrived because of this. After becoming the highest grossing arcade game of 2000 in Japan, it would receive multiple ports first to the Dreamcast in 2000, as well as the Wii in 2007. Sega would also release a spiritual successor named Chakato Tambourine the very same year, which pretty much played the exact same as Samba de Mugol, but instead of maracas? That's right, you guessed it. This game was played with a controller shaped like a tambourine. Well. No shit. Now apart from the ports of the original game, there was an incredibly long wait time before we would see the series make a return. For many this game seemed like a one hit wonder, but Sega, seemingly out of nowhere, would drop a sequel revealed during a Nintendo Direct on February 8th, 2023. This iteration will mimic the gameplay of the original by using the Switch Joy-Cons to mimic gestures, but will feature more variety in terms of its musical genres. So for now, I guess this series can be placed up into the It Exists tier, although it's more than likely going to remain dormant following this latest release. So does anyone actually remember the microphone attachment for the Dreamcast? Alright, so for the 13 of you that do, do you remember any games that actually used it? No? Yeah, me either. Well that was before this video, and in particular, Seaman, which was a virtual pet video game and one of the few to actually make use of the microphone attachment. Now where to start with this game? It's, uh, it's certainly unique. The game has players taking care of Seaman, the gimmick being that everything happens in real time. Essentially you have to check on him daily in fear of him dying. The Seaman would also throw insults at the player and ask certain questions which prompts the player to use the microphone attachment. So you don't think the internet should be censored, is that right? Yes. Well, good for you. The game garnered praise for its dark humour, unique gameplay and bizarre aesthetics. It even developed its own cult following, resulting in a sequel being developed called Seaman 2 for the PlayStation 2 in 2007. Seaman 2 would have players transcend to god status, where they could now alter the environments and give things to the island's inhabitants. The poor sales of the sequel most likely killed the series though. Either that, or it was just getting too weird and edgy. It seems as though Sega forgot these games worked in real time, because they've left Seaman to die for decades now. I think we've established this now, but Sega certainly wasn't shy when it came to ambitious titles, and the Shenmue series is a testament to that. Shenmue, which was released all the way back in 1999, was an action-adventure game that consisted of large 3D open-world environments, interspersed with brawler battles and quick-time events. 
It combined elements of role-playing, life simulation, and social simulation games, with its very own day and night cycle, various weather effects, NPCs that followed specific daily routines, and interactive activities like arcades and vending machines. All of these things culminated in a production and advertising cost of 50 to 7 million US dollars, making it the most expensive video game ever developed at the time. It's almost as impressive as it is insane for a game that's over 20 years old. Regardless, this incredible effort wouldn't go unnoticed, with many praising the game for its graphics, soundtrack, ambition, and realism. The game would sell over 1.2 million copies, but due to the mind-boggling production cost, it was actually deemed a commercial failure. Despite this, Shenmue 2 would release just two years later. Following Shenmue 2, though, this series would enter one of the worst development hells a series could experience. 2004 saw the announcement of a spin-off MMORPG titled Shenmue Online, which never saw an official release. 2010 saw Shenmue City launched in Japan only to be shut down a year later, but the prospect of a new original entry still eluded fans. During this disastrous thought, Yu Suzuki, the series director, who had left Sega following the release of Shenmue 2, would start a Kickstarter campaign in hopes of raising enough money to work on a third installment into the franchise. This Kickstarter was met with incredible support, becoming the fastest campaign to raise 2 million in under 7 hours, only to end the following month after raising a whopping 6 million. Suzuki would work on Shenmue 3 almost independently, and within 4 years the game would be unveiled and released in 2019. The game which remained faithful to its predecessor was met with mixed reception, with people either praising it for sticking to the original games, or criticising it for its similarity to the original games. It also saw very low retail sales, although these did not consider digital sales or copies that were sent out to Kickstarter backers. The series has also had its own animation adaption developed which premiered back in 2022. Shenmue has always been an underappreciated classic, but unfortunately, due to its niche nature and relatively low sales, I can't see the series continuing on, at least for a while. I think it's most likely on life support. Sega is always trying to one-up themselves when it comes to how absurd and ridiculous they can make their games. The game followed Ula La, a space-faring reporter that was investigating an alien invasion. Not only did she have some of the most iconic walks in gaming history, Okay. But her method of combat was also quite unique. This game was seemingly developed with a female audience in mind. It's just so silly and ridiculous, but that's part of what makes the game so charming. Heck, even Michael Jackson makes a cameo appearance in this game. <laughs> While the game was received well, it didn't sell too well. That wasn't going to stop Ooh La La though, and within a few years, she saw herself back at it again in Space Channel 5 Part 2. Despite pitches for a new entry on the Wii and Kinect, systems that seemingly would go hand in hand with such a game, the developers felt like they had exhausted all their ideas, and Sega, being Sega, had no interest in reviving a franchise that wasn't pulling in trillions of dollars. But no one can deny Ooh La La, and after talks between Mizuguchi, Q Entertainment and Sega, a new virtual reality project was eventually greenlit for production. Following the positive reception received on their VR demo back in 2018, the game would continue development before being unveiled as Space Channel VR kind of funky news flash, and while I've never owned a copy myself, the videos I've seen are just as goofy as the original games. Unfortunately, many critics weren't impressed with this new iteration. Honestly, it's hard to say where this game should place. I know it's had a recent release, but I can't see it having too much longevity. I think for now I will place it in the It Exists. Jetstar Radio is one of the most critically acclaimed and beloved series in gaming history. Well, at least for those who have played it. If you were to ask Sega though, I think they'd say it was one of the worst, and one of the most hated series. Honestly, how this franchise hasn't got a new release after all these years is beyond me. Anyway, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Jet Set Radio was first released back in 2000 as an action game for the Dreamcast. You played as a member of a graffiti gang, as you skated around Tokyo spraying graffiti, challenging rival gangs, all while avoiding the authorities. It was one of the first games to use cell shaded graphics, which still look great to this day. Like I said, this game would garner critical acclaim, and is often considered one of the best games of all time. A sequel titled Jet Set Radio Future would release for the Xbox in 2002, and just like its predecessor was universally praised. So how is it that such a beloved and coveted series has yet to receive a new installment in over 20 years. Is it because the sequel didn't sell well enough? I mean maybe, but it's not like people haven't tried to revive the franchise. In fact, there have been multiple attempts trying just that, starting with Kuju Entertainment, presenting a concept to Sega regarding a new installment for the Nintendo Wii. This was shut down by Sega who stated that they weren't interested in a new installment. Fast forward to 2017 when Dinosaur Games created a visual proof of concept for a project called Jet Set Radio Evolution, which was, once again, turned down by Sega. It was 
wasn't until 2021 that fans finally got something to hold on to when Sega teased the possibility of a Jet Set Radio reboot. Now this may have just been Sega screwing with fans, but some leaked footage that was apparently from Sega Japan's internal meeting held in 2021 gave rise to the real possibility of the teaser being real. Just like Crazy Taxi though, this leak would actually turn out to be true, as during their next level announcement, a new Jet Set Radio was teased. Like the many other revived franchises, this means we can finally move this beloved series back up to It Exists. The dawn of a new century meant the birth of a new racing game. This series in particular was meant to rival Sony's popular Gran Turismo series. Unfortunately, the games were deemed inferior and Sega GT gained the minuscule attention following its modest sales. Sega wouldn't give up hope just yet though, as they would release a sequel Sega GT 2002. Now Sega wasn't too hopeful for this game's success, as they bundled it with Jet Set Radio Future in some cases. The last attempt at salvaging the series came in the form of Sega GT Online, which was released a year later after GT 2002, now with extra cars and an online facility to make use of Xbox's new Xbox Live functionality. Unfortunately, these games like their predecessors went relatively unnoticed and never gained much attention, essentially killing off the series before it even began. We now arrive at one of Sega's biggest franchises, which is funny considering it's not even really theirs. What started as an innovative turn-based strategy in real-time tactics video game series, initially published by EA and Activision, believe it or not, was soon scooped up by Sega, and as a result has led to it becoming one of Sega's biggest franchises to date. The franchise I am referring to is none other than Total War a massively popular series of strategy games developed by Creative Assembly. The Total War series would make its debut appearance back in the year 2000, with its first game, Shogun Total War. Set in Japan during the Sengoku Jidai period, the game had players take on the leadership of a Japanese clan with the ultimate goal of becoming Shogun. Players were tasked with juggling a multitude of elements, including their own military force, religion, diplomacy, economics, as well as espionage, all of which had a significant impact on the player's actions, all while the battles played out in real time. These real time strategies were implemented in particular to align more accurately with historical authenticity, to the point where they had real life military historians such as Stephen Turnbull advising the creative team to make sure it was accurate. Shogun Total War was met with a positive response and sold decently well, and while it wasn't a massive breakout hit, it certainly laid the groundwork for a series that would go on to not only include 15 games, but also sell a whopping 40 million units across those games. The immense success of the series continues to this day, with the latest entry Total War Pharaoh scheduled for release later on into this year. This franchise is without a doubt a flagship franchise, and while it may not technically be a Sega one, it certainly does fill out some of the empty spaces up there. We move from one titan to another. Next up is the adorable Super Monkey Ball, a series that needs no introduction as it's consistently been released for the past 20 years. Well, consistently up to a point at least. Super Monkey Ball would actually start off as just Monkey Ball and feature three playable characters, Ai Ai, Mei Mei, and Baby, with a fourth Gong Gong being introduced in the game's Game Boy port, which added the iconic Super to the titles. These four would become the staple characters of the whole series and feature in every subsequent title to date. These games were unique in the platforming space, as instead of controlling the character themselves, players would have to guide the character who was now stuck in a gacha pond ball by tilting the board in certain directions to change the direction, gain speed, and stop. The main goal was to reach the end of each level within the time limit, without falling off the floor. Bonus points and extra lives could be earned if enough bananas had been collected on each stage. In its 20 plus year lifespan, the series has released 21 games, making it one of Sega's most prolific franchises to date. Now, to be realistic, the series has not seen a new traditional Super Monkey Ball game since Super Monkey Ball Banana Splits, which was released all the way back in 2012 for the PlayStation Vita. The games following this were either remakes of past entries or spin-off games that more so mimicked mobile games. Sales for the series as a whole are also not publicly known, with Sega not sharing the specific numbers of a lot of their older games. From what I could find, the franchise most likely has sold anywhere between 6 to 10 million copies as a whole, which while respectable, doesn't quite earn a spot in the flagship tier. I know some of you guys are gonna be like, oh come on, come on Kai, you're being too harsh here, but no really, like, I think Super Monkey Ball, if it had more new games coming out in the recent years instead of just like collections of past games, it could definitely be a flagship series, let's just say that. But for now, I think it's just a mainstay. Now guys, I'm gonna be honest, 
I'm not even sure if this is a Sega franchise, but I was talking to someone that wouldn't stop going on about it, so yeah, that's why this is on the list. The Headhunting series was a pair of games that followed Jack Wade in a third person shooter format, as he looked to re earn his Headhunter license by taking part in virtual reality tests while catching some of the most notorious criminals in the city. The first game went on to receive fairly positive reviews, with many praising its setting and story, whereas the sequel wouldn't fare so well. The series developer, Amuse, promptly closed down following the release of the sequel, due to economic hardships in 2005. If that wasn't obvious enough, we most likely won't be getting any new Headhunter games. And here we probably have one of, if not the best manga series based on Japanese street racing, Initial D. Wait. Hold on a sec, isn't this already about Sega game franchises? Well my friend, Initial D, believe it or not, actually had a few games developed for it by Sega. Well, I say a few, but it was more like an onslaught of games, 13 to be exact. 10 for arcades and 3 for home consoles. The arcade iterations were your typical races, set in the initial D universe. Each new stage or version would introduce new courses, rivals, and in some cases even new game modes like tag battle. The series has also seen the production of 3 home console games. The special stage released in 2003 for the PS2, Street Rage released as a PSP exclusive, and initial D Extreme stage, which was released for the PS3 in 2008. While the home console games have seemingly stopped, the arcade ones have stayed strong, with the most recent update taking place in 2021. Like many arcade games though, it's hard to place them above it exists due to their limited exposure outside of, well, actually going to arcades. But for the most part, they're a fun take on a stellar manga series that I recommend reading for anyone that's into racing. Now of course Sega would be the one to pick out such a treasured manga and anime as Astro Boy. I actually remember playing Astro Boy Omega Factor on my Game Boy years back. It was my go-to game for long road trips, and it's kind of crazy to see how well the game still holds up to this day. Omega Factor was the first Astro Boy game Sega would develop, and it was a beat-em-up in which the player took control of Astro Boy, obviously, as they fought their way through different incarnations derived from the original source. Upon meeting different NPC characters, players were rewarded with points that could be used to power up one of Astro's stats. The game even had its own fair share of hidden areas within its levels, and it honestly gave off a Pokemon feel like you were completing a Pokedex whenever you met someone new. The game would be met with critical acclaim, which convinced Sega to try the hand at one other Astro Boy game. This would take the form of a very mediocre 3D third-person adventure game, with small instances of an open world. Due to this iteration's poor sales and lackluster reviews, Sega parted ways with Astro Boy once again, making for a dead series. Now here's a hidden gem, lost to time. The Condemned series was a set of first-person psychological thriller games that had elements of survival horror and action weaved in. The first entry, Condemned Criminal Origins, followed the story of Ethan Thomas, an agent with the FBI's serial crime unit, who had reason to believe that the surge in serial killings had something to do with the surge in vagrant assaults. What followed is a gripping and unnerving story that delves into a rabbit hole that goes far deeper than ever once thought. One aspect of Condemned that separated it from your typical first-person action games was the over-reliance on melee combat. The designers in particular looked to utilize the capabilities of the newly released Xbox 360 to bring the environment to life as well as allow for some very realistic and visceral close quarters combat. The game was met with generally positive reviews and at least by Sega's standards sold better than expected during its release week. This prompted them to develop a sequel, which was released just three years later in 2008, titled Condemned 2 Bloodshot. Set just 11 months after the original, Condemned 2 would look to fix up the problems with its predecessor, mainly the implementation of forensic tools and the lack of melee mechanics. In regard to the future of the series, Jace Hall, the co-creator of the Condemned concept, would make a post on Facebook in 2015, where he would express his desire in finding an interested proven indie development team to take over the franchise and push it forward. While this was definitely welcoming news for fans, it hasn't seem to work out, as 8 years later, no new developments have been mentioned. I still think there's hope though, so for now, I'm going to drop it into the zombie tier. Here we have Sega's version of Pokemon, Dinosaur King, an RPG game based on the TV series and card game of the same name. The game follows Max, Rex, and Zoe, who discover mysterious stones which allow them to summon dinosaurs. Players would be able to excavate fossils and clean them to receive dinosaurs, which they could then use to battle in the game's random encounters. Dinosaurs were categorized into different elemental types, and would grow stronger as they gained experience and leveled up. Despite it not performing too well, the game would get a spiritual successor on iOS in 2011. I would attempt to say its name, but I, yeah. Despite being a fan of anime and manga, I'd most likely butcher it. Thankfully, I don't need to read it out to know that it's a dead franchise. If I was to ask you, out of the seemingly endless Sega franchises, which ones would be at the top in terms of sales? 
I wonder how many would mention this next franchise. Following the Championship Manager series, Football Manager would make its debut in 2005 after Sega would acquire Sports Interactive. As I'm sure you can tell from its title, the game is a football management simulation game, where players would, well, manage their own team of players, taking care of anything from the formations, to the training, to the purchasing and learning of players. If you thought this was just like FIFA though, then I'm sorry to disappoint you, as you don't actually get to play the football. More so, it's like watching someone else play FIFA, except you can make the decisions in real time concerning the more managerial aspects of team management. Now, I'm sure some of you will think this is just an inferior series to FIFA, but just like FIFA, this series has seen a new release every single year since its inception. Not only that, but the game has consistently garnered very high ratings from critics and fans alike. The franchise has sold over 33 million units, and the series is only getting more popular with each new entry beating out the record of the previous installment. The question becomes then, is it a Sega flagship? You bet your sweet ass it is. We've now arrived at what I consider to be the best medical themed series, which is most likely just my nostalgia talking. Trauma Center was a simulation game developed by Atlas and released for the Nintendo DS in 2005. Designed to take advantage of the DS's touchscreen functionality, the game combines surgical simulation gameplay with storytelling which is delivered using non-interactive visual novel segments. I personally find the characters very charming, and the gameplay was simple but unique enough that at one point it did actually make me think, you know, maybe for the, the tiniest second of a career as a surgeon. But here I am, three lifetimes later, making mediocre videos on YouTube. <sighs> anyway, the game would sell fairly poorly in Japan, while in the West it was described by Atlas staff as absolutely fabulous, with sales going off the charts. It was around this period, however, that Atlas turned its head towards the development of Persona 3, and as a result, many of the developers that had previously worked on Trauma Center had to shift their focus. There were a few staff members left over to continue with the series, now going by the name The Kaduk Team. They would release three subsequent games, with Trauma Center New Blood for the Wii in 2007, Trauma Center Under the Knife 2 for the DS, and finally Trauma Team for the Wii in 2010. Alongside these was a remake titled Trauma Center Second Opinion, which was released for the Wii as a launch title. Now while the games had been received positively well, the game sales seemingly decreased with each release, and it seems at this point that Atlas has shelved the franchise to work on their more popular series. The little kid in me wants nothing more than to see a new game for this franchise. But if there's one series that I won't have to beg for, it's this next one. <laughs> The Yakuza or Like a Dragon franchise has quickly become one of Sega's biggest and most commercially successful franchises. The series of games incorporate elements from action adventure, beat em up and role playing games and meshes them all within an expansive open world. While each installment has its own story, they're most typically centered around a crime drama with plotlines that mimic Yakuza films. Like many other open world games, Yakuza would allow players to participate in side missions, learn new moves from NPCs, eat and drink at various restaurants, visit clubs and pretty much just do whatever the hell you one. Since its inception in 2005, the franchise has released 8 mainline games, 10 spin-offs, and multiple remasters, remakes, and compilations. Every single mainline entry in the franchise has been met with very positive reviews, and the series as a whole has sold around 20 million units. The franchise has blown up to include books, feature films, and even a TV series. This series is without a doubt one of Sega's new flagship franchises, with a new spin-off and mainline entry scheduled for release in 2024. Next up is Company of Heroes, a 2006 real-time strategy video game that evolved into its own franchise following Sega's acquisition of Relic Entertainment. Company of Heroes is set during the Second World War, which is interesting considering Sega as a company pretty much came into existence during that time period as well. The object of the game was to capture several strategic resource sectors located around the map. Players could then use these to build base structures, produce new units, and defeat their enemies. The game would go on to receive widespread acclaim, winning multiple awards and being considered by many as one of the greatest real-time strategy games ever created. Its success led to a sequel being developed called Company of Heroes 2, which also happened to be the first in the series to be published by Sega. The gameplay, while similar to the original, was modified to help players capture flagged points which would generate fuel credits that could be used to assemble more units. 
The sequel would once again receive positive reviews and sell incredibly well, shipping over 680,000 copies, before making its way onto Steam, where it would sell a whopping 7.4 million copies. For many, this was thought to be the final entry into the franchise, but after a decade of waiting, Sega would release a third installment titled Company of Heroes 3. Company of Heroes 3 would still be set during World War II, but featured new mechanics and modes. The series as a whole has sold over 8 million copies, making it one of Sega's biggest franchises in terms of sales. Because of its popularity, and the series even receiving its own film adaption in 2013, I'm happy to say it's a Sega mainstay. Sega more than any other company really does have their eggs just in every basket. While others seemingly have leaned more towards the home console releases, Sega would continue to mark their territory in the arcade scene with the release of Let's Go Jungle. In this joystick mounted gun arcade game, players would take on the roles of Ben and Nora as they find themselves stranded on a jungle island which thankfully is also overrun by monsters. As with most on-rail shooters, the aim was simply to fire at monsters which range from mutated animals to insects. Some levels would incorporate quick hunt events, and most would end with a boss battle. A sequel would be developed and released in 2011 called Let's Go Island. Taking place on a Pacific island this time around, the gameplay itself would remain primarily the same as its predecessor. Depending on the scores achieved by each player, the game actually had multiple endings and added a touch of replayability. Outside of that though, it's not the kind of franchise to get consistent releases and as a result is more than likely a dead one. I'd have completely forgotten about this next franchise. Full Auto was a vehicle combat racing game. I'd always likened them to the Fast and Furious movies, but honestly, these games are somehow even more believable than those films. This is the worst! Full Auto was just pure chaotic fun. The first game had four vehicle classes, each with its own strengths and weaknesses. The point of the game? Destroy as many of your opponent's vehicles as possible. I guess you could also try and race for first place, but that was, that was never anyone's actual reason for playing, right? The game received average reviews, but somehow got a sequel that was released towards the end of the very same year. Full Auto 2 Battle Lines would feature much of the same as its predecessor, but in my opinion, it was a weaker entry in the series. For anyone hoping that the series is coming back, I wouldn't get your hopes up. Following the closing down of Cedo Interactive in 2008, the online servers no longer had a means of surviving. By July 2014, the game's online servers had completely shut down, essentially killing off the series as a whole. Starting off 2007 was Atlas, back at it again with another dungeon crawling RPG in the form of Etrian Odyssey. While it still remains one of the more niche franchises, it also happens to be one of the most consistent. The series centers around the first person exploration of dungeons, with a player created party of characters. As the series predominantly releases on DS hardware, it allows players to annotate and write notes on the map to help them navigate in case they get lost. Over its lifespan, the franchise has seen the release of 11 games, including two remakes, two spin-offs, and most recently, an Origins collection that remastered the first three games and released them together for the Nintendo Switch in 2023. In total, the series has sold over 1.5 million copies, which by most standards isn't mind-blowing. So despite its consistent releases, I can't put it any higher than it exists due to its niche nature and humble sales. And finishing off 2007 was Sega, with another light gun rail shooter called Ghost Squad. Immersion was the name of the game with this one, as Sega wanted to make sure the game felt as realistic as possible. The arcade game featured a working fire selector switch, a stock, force feedback recoil, and cold hard iron sights. The game itself featured three non-linear levels that featured branching tactical decisions, as well as numerous sub-activities like defusing bombs and throwing grenades to disable armor. A home console version was developed for the Nintendo Wii and released a few years later in 2007. The game, while receiving fairly average reviews, did manage to snag itself a sequel with Operation Ghost in 2012. Even so, these types of franchises are never consistent, and for that reason, I don't think it can go any higher than maybe the zombie tier. Now if you haven't had the chance to play the series, then treat yourself and give it a shot. Valkyrie Chronicles is one of the best tactical RPG games I've had the chance to experience. While the games still incorporate turn-based combat, it does so in its own unique Blitz format, which shows the battles in live tactical zones. It introduced a more hands-on approach, where instead of just moving and commanding troops to perform actions, you as the player got to manually aim and take the shot yourself. It added that bit of oomph into the gameplay, and to this day, I think may be one of the few to incorporate such a unique aspect. 
Funnily enough, the game takes place in Europa, a fictional continent based on Europe during the onset of, you guessed it, World War II. I'm not sure if Sega likes paying homage to their creation, but this sort of focus in their games makes me think twice. The original Valkyrie Chronicles would garner critical acclaim, winning multiple awards for the time, with many believing it to be one of the best tactical RPG games ever. It would mark the beginning of a media franchise that not only has resulted in three mainline sequels and a spin-off, but has branched out to include its very own manga and anime. Over its 15 year lifespan, the series has seen considerable success, with its most recent entry, Valkyrie Chronicles 4, passing 1 million total sales. Now as much as I'd love to place it in the mainstay status, I think due to its smaller player base, I have to put it in It Exists. Actually, you know what, screw it. It's going in mainstays. It's consistent and has had several entries over its short lifespan. Now if you thought Mario and Sonic had the best Olympic themed games, then you, I mean, you're right. But alongside the partnership with Nintendo, Sega would also get the rights to publish the official Olympics games, starting with Beijing 2008. Beijing 2008 in particular would be the first time an Olympic video game would feature an online mode. And while a cool addition, it would certainly help if the games were a bit better. They're like, they're all right at best, mediocre at worst, with each new iteration featuring more national teams, yet somehow fewer events. Like what's up with that? Regardless, because it's the Olympics, we can expect further entries into the series in the near future. And while there's no way it could ever appear as a mainstay, it certainly isn't a dying franchise. Also, just quickly speaking about Mario and Sonic Olympic Games, I already covered them in my Nintendo franchise video. And in the same vein with the Bayonetta series, I've also covered that in the Nintendo video. So I won't be ranking those ones again this time. Now let me ask you guys something. Captain America or Iron Man? Alright, now that we've established that Iron Man is cooler, let's talk about how fucking trash his games were. Now Sega's no stranger to using household names for, from films in their games, and the unfortunate sacrifice this time around was Marvel's Iron Man. Now while the original game was released back in 2008, and actually had Robert Downey Jr, Tarrant Howard, and Sean Torb reprising their roles from the movie, the actual games themselves were just lackluster to put it nicely. Despite the game being like 3 hours max, and the controls suck an ass, it's still, god like, what is this camera, I didn't even know what I'm looking at. Oh, sorry, I got sidetracked. But regardless, because it's Iron Man, the game sold incredibly well. It sold so well that GameSpot awarded it the coveted award, the worst game that everyone played. And against all odds, Iron Man 2 was somehow worse than the original. And maybe that's a hot take, but Iron Man 2 had repetitive gameplay, lack of enemy design, game length was still shorter than my... Yeah, overall this was a series based on the films, it's safe to say for Sega that this is a dead franchise. Now this next franchise would start as a Japanese exclusive, but due to its growing popularity finally made its way over to the west with its latest entry. The series in question is the 7th Dragon franchise, which was first released back in 2009 for the Nintendo DS. The game is a cutesy RPG game, taking place in the world of Eden, 80% of which is ruled by various reptiles who are led by seven dragons, hence the title. Seventh Dragon incorporates character classes as well as an extensive overworld that players could explore before taking part in battles. Now while the original game did receive fan translations which allowed English players to enjoy the games, it wasn't until three sequels later with Seventh Dragon 3, code VFD, that the game would officially receive a western release back in 2016. This game would mark the final installment in the Seventh Dragon franchise, with the story being tied up following it. Now despite my saying that, it doesn't mean that this is the end of the franchise as a whole. Game director Kazuya Ninoi has mentioned his desire to continue with the series, with a remake of the first game along with a new sequel. This was back in 2019 however, so only time will tell. For now, it's safe to say that the game is, it's, 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 it's branching into life support, with a good chance of coming back. Wait, now just hang on a second. Isn't Angry Birds owned by Rovio Entertainment? Yeah, okay. For those of you that aren't aware, Sega is currently in the process of acquiring Rovio Entertainment for a lot of money. Yeah, which means they would get access to Angry Birds, you know, Small Town Murders, what else do they have? Sugar Blast. I'm not going to include it in this video as the deal hasn't actually gone through yet. They're still just considering it and talking it through. But I thought I'd just mention it because, you know, people probably bring it up. I'm sure everyone can guess where it would end up anyway. Sega would find themselves back in the home console market after picking up high voltage software's The Conduit, a first person shooter developed for the Wii and Android. While I've never played the game myself, its gameplay did remind me of the Metroid Prime games, and more specifically Metroid Prime 3 Corruption, due to its similar control scheme on the Wii. The story focuses on a species of aliens called the Drudge as they invade Washington DC. It's up to the players, in control of the newly inducted agent Michael Ford, to clear up and stop the destruction of the capital. The game actually featured its own multiplayer mode, and it even had its own voice chat implementation through Wii Speak. Unfortunately, this was only available between those who would exchange friend codes, so no Modern Warfare 2 shenanigans were happening this time around. 
For the most part, this game was received well and sold decently well, shipping over 350,000 copies during its lifetime. After months of speculation, a sequel for the series would release in 2010. Unfortunately though, this new entry was met with a very lukewarm reception. It did not meet sales expectations. So despite the game ending on a cliffhanger, it's very unlikely to continue, given the fact that High Voltage Software has not even mentioned the development of a third conduit game. If there was one thing that started getting massive popularity during the late 2000s, it would be the Vocaloids. These were virtual celebrities who became known for their artificial singing voices and songs which used Yamaha Corporation's Vocaloid synth techniques. Sega would look to capitalise on the explosive popularity of this new medium and chose to go down the rhythmic gaming route. The resulting product? Hatsune Miku Project Diva. As you may have guessed based on its name, these were a set of rhythm games that focused on the songs performed by the Vocaloids, and Hatsune Miku in particular, the company's very first Vocaloid. They played like your typical rhythm games, players would need to press the required buttons in time with the music with varying levels of difficulty. The series proved to be successful, most likely due to the popularity of its star characters, and before long the series had expanded to include numerous games, many of which released year to year. The series to this day has remained extremely consistent, to the point where it may even deserve a slot among the other the mainstays. Next up is Sega's seductive witch, Bayonetta. The series has had three games to its name thanks to Nintendo helping out when producing both Bayonetta 2 in 2014 for the Wii U and Bayonetta 3 in 2022 for the Switch. For the most part, Bayonetta has become a particularly popular franchise within its niche. The game sold poorly on the Wii U, but recently Bayonetta has managed to sell over 1 million copies. I don't believe it's big enough to work its way into the mainstays just yet, but due to the continued support and the recent release of the prequel Bayonetta Origins, I think it won't be needing live support at least for a little while. Sega's next franchise would be Kingdom Conquest, an MMO strategy game that incorporated card collection and third person action. This was a free to download game for iOS and Android, but of course, if you aren't buying any of their $40 packages, you're most likely not going anywhere. The game actually got itself into some controversy, with people saying that despite the game itself being free to play and download, it was somehow drawing out funds from players' iTunes accounts. It was such a big problem that even players who had never downloaded the game in the first place somehow were getting money stolen from them, which I don't even know how that's possible. I guess everyone forgot after a few days though, because just two days later, a sequel called Kingdom Conquest 2 would release, which pretty much was the same game, just with two on the title. The game ended its services in 2017, and while another sequel called Kingdom Conquest Dark Empire would launch in its place, I don't believe it's owned by Sega anymore, meaning that it's most likely a dead franchise. Sega had developed a game for pretty much every genre under the sun by this point, and for those saying, oh they haven't tackled 4x strategy games yet, well, Sega would release Endless Space, their very own 4x turn-based strategy game. In a similar fashion to the immense popular Civilization series, except this time set in 3000 AD, players would command one of 12 unique civilizations, as they created their own interstellar empire and conquered the galaxy. Endless Space would receive positive reviews, resulting in it winning the Unity Golden Cube award in 2013. Due to the game's commercial success, where it sold over 1 million copies, Sega would release two spin-off games, as well as a direct sequel titled Endless Space 2 in 2017. The series will also see a new installment with Endless Dungeon towards the end of this year. As a whole, the franchise is actually fairly recent, and has seen its fair share of games released. I could definitely see it becoming a Sega mainstay before long, and some of you may even consider it one already, based on its consistency and positive reception. At the moment, I would probably say it's in the it exists category though. Now while you may have not heard of this next franchise, you've most likely seen someone going crazy at the arcade playing it. I'm talking about Mai Mai, a rhythm game series where players interact with objects on a touchscreen and execute dance-like moves. It's become notorious for its striking resemblance to a front loader washing machine. And that's not even me saying that. Even advertisements promoting it would throw in jokes saying things like, it's not a washing machine. Which I mean, I'm glad they cleared that up because, well, <laughs> I mean it really does look like a washing machine. As is the case with arcade machines, the Mai Mai franchise has seen plenty of updated machines to this day, but due to its niche nature and being an arcade exclusive, I can't put it any higher than it exists. Chain Chronicle was a unique take on a tower defense role playing game. The gameplay was split up into three separate elements, tower defense, traditional RPG elements, as well as card trading in the form of arcanas. Players were able to play through the game as an RPG, visiting towns and participating in events, but while the story was driven by RPG elements, its combat would focus on tower defense elements instead. Despite the game releasing in Japan initially, the positive reception it received allowed for it to be licensed outside of Japan and even got a western release in 2014. Unfortunately, the game was closed down in North America 
America in February of 2016, and its sequel, which was released in March of 2022 in Japan, also had its service shut down on May 31st, 2023, due to its waning interest and in game purchases. While it's a strange addition to the list, it's without a doubt a dead one. Now, as they've done in the past, Sega would partner with a small film series, this time going by the name of Transformers. Sega would actually release the first arcade video game based on this franchise with the release of Transformers Human Alliance in 2013. This rail shooter was actually the spiritual successor of the Let's Go Jungle series, and was set in the Transformers universe and also includes multiple stages over different countries. But while it may not follow the film series to a T, it does feature fan favourites like Starscream. And yes, I don't care what anyone says, Starscream was cool, alright? Even if he didn't get to do much before being absolutely bodied. Sega would release a follow-up to Human Alliance with Transformers Shadows Rising in 2018. The game which pretty much played the exact same as its predecessor, had a new set of stages that could be played in any order before unlocking the final stage, the moon. It's always hard to rank arcade games, seeing as they kind of just get released whenever. Based on the fact that it only has two iterations, I'm going to say that it's most likely on live support, until, well I guess the Transformer movie just came out, so maybe a new one's coming out soon. Chun Nithum is an arcade rhythm game and the latest one to be released worldwide by Sega. It has the player use touch and motion based sensor bars to input commands that correspond to notes scrolling down the screen. As with any music rhythm game, there are plenty of different actions such as tapping, holding, sliding and waving their hands in the air. Now while there isn't too much information regarding the success of the cabinets, they have continued to produce new models up until May of 2023. This consistency at least in my opinion allows them a slot in the it exists tier, regardless of how niche the franchise is. And there we have it. Sega, more so than any other company that we've covered, loves to pump out franchises. In doing so, they have ushered in some of the biggest innovations in the gaming space, often being first to incorporate groundbreaking ideas that are still being implemented in games to this day. Unfortunately, it seems that while they love being first to do things, they will most likely never be the ones to have the last laugh, as many of their once innovative and cherished franchises are now nothing more than distant memories, relics, lost to time. This next company, on the other hand, may be one of the best when it comes to preserving some of their oldest franchises. Now, upon hearing that, you might assume I'm talking about some mediocre company with a small library of games. But contrary to that, this company is not only one of the biggest and most successful gaming companies in the entire world, but also holds the rights to some of the most dominant franchises in media history. The name Namco was first introduced a few years later in 1971 as a brand name for several of its machines. And after seeing the potential in the video game market through distributing Atari's games, Nakamura would change the corporate name to Namco in June of 1977. At the same time, Taito's Space Invaders was making waves in the video game industry, prompting Namco to focus more so on the development of video games. And by the end of 1987, Namco had released its very first original game, GB. GB, despite its name, had nothing to do with bees, well, apart from its arcade flyer. Instead, it was a block breaker game intermixed with pinball elements. The goal was to move a set of paddles on the screen to deflect a ball into bumpers and brick formations in order to score points. If the ball was to touch the Namco rollover symbols, which for whatever reason wasn't added in the Western release, the blocks would light up, increasing the score multiplier. BG was said to be the 8th highest grossing game of 1978 in Japan, and sold close to 10,000 units worldwide. This lukewarm success wasn't up to par with Namco's expectations, but regardless, it was crucial in helping establish Namco's presence in the video game industry. The series would see the release of two further sequels, in the form of Bombi in 1979, which featured colorized graphics and further additions like the ability to gain extra lives, as well as QTQ, which was also released in 1979. It was known for its cute characters, which would go on to become key inspirations for future Namco character designs. Apart from a few ports to the PlayStation and Wii in the future, it's safe to say that Namco's first original franchise is unfortunately a dead one. Despite the disappointment Namco experienced with GB, they wouldn't have to wait long before making it big. In fact, by the end of 1979, unbeknownst to Namco at the time, they had released what would become one of the most influential games of its genre. The game in question was none other than Galaxian. Acting as Namco's answer to Taito's Space Invaders, the game was a fixed shooter in which players controlled a starship called the Galaxip with the goal being to clear out each round of aliens. Despite it drawing heavy inspiration from Space Invaders, the game was a step above and was one of the first to feature RGB colour graphics, as well as animated multicoloured sprites. 
Galaxian would quickly become one of the highest grossing arcade games of all time, selling 50,000 arcade units by 1982. This success led to numerous sequels, as well as some reimaginings with some like Galaga overtaking the original in popularity. The series has expanded to include 9 arcade games, 7 home console ports and games, 8 mobile games and 4 other miscellaneous releases. The most recent entry, Galaga Revenge, was released back in 2019 as a free download on iOS and Android. The game was heralded as a pretty generic shoot'em up, but was advertised as an authentic sequel to the Galaga line of games. Overall, due to the sheer number of consistent releases over the years, as well as the total sales figure of over 12 million copies, I believe it to be a Bandai Namco mainstay. Following the release of Galaxian, the space shooter genre had become overly saturated, and due to the commonly depicted killing of enemies in these games, the video game industry as a whole had become dominated by a male player base. <laughs> Noticing this, Toru Iwatani, who had previously designed BG, wanted to focus on creating a maze game targeted towards women that featured simplistic gameplay and recognizable characters. With the help of a small team, he was able to create a game known simply as Puckman, where players controlled him as he moved around the maze eating dots. Funnily enough, upon its release in Japan, Puckman was only considered a moderate success, and it wasn't until the game made its way over to the West, now adorning the name Pac-Man, that it finally achieved its god tier status. What really is there to say about this franchise? Everyone in their pet slug knows it. The original Pac-Man quickly outdid all of its competition, taking Space Invaders spot in Japan as well as Atari's Asteroid spot in the US, making it the best-selling arcade game at the time, as well as becoming the official mascot of Namco. By 1982, it was estimated that the game had over 30 million active players across the US, partly due to its popularity among the female audience. The franchise has expanded to include countless sequels, remakes, and reimaginings, the most popular being the introduction of Miss Pac-Man, released just two years after the original in response to the series' growing popularity with women. As of the current day, the Pac-Man franchise has had over 40 games to its name, and has sold over 72 million units, easily cementing itself as a Bandai Namco flagship. Given Pac-Man's remarkable success, it was unlikely that Namco's next franchise would live up to their expectations. Regardless, Namco continued to charge full speed ahead, resulting in them releasing Rally X, a Maze Chase arcade game in 1980. Designed as a successor to Sega's head-on from 1979, the game had players drive a blue Formula 1 race car through a multi-directional maze while collecting yellow flags. Boulders would block some paths and red enemy cars pursued the player in the hopes of stopping them. Rally X was credited for being one of the first games to feature bonus stages as well as continuously playing background music. Despite all this, the game never managed to attract much attention, but was heavily overshadowed by Pac-Man. In saying this, the game performed well enough to warrant a few ports and sequels, the first being New Rally X, which was released in 1981 as a more polished version of the original, with slightly enhanced graphics, easier gameplay, a new soundtrack, and a lucky flag mechanic that gave players extra points in regards to the remaining fuel. New Rally X was far more popular than its predecessor, and has seemingly been ported to numerous other consoles over the years. Numerous remakes have been developed and released in Namco's museum collections, with the latest game in the series, Rally X Rumble, being released in 2001 for iOS. Overall, while the game has had its movements over the past few decades, it doesn't seem to be on Bandai Namco's lists of revivals. For now, it's most likely a zombie franchise. First, it was a pizza that someone stole a slice of. Then, it was an F1 car zooming around collecting flags. And now, it's a tank navigating another maze. In the seemingly endless maze games, Tank Battalion had you take control of a tank where the goal was to simply destroy 20 enemy tanks. I mean, at least this time you could destroy the maze. But it can't have been a coincidence that all three of these games were released during the same year in 1980. Even so, the game performed well and had two sequels to its name, with Battle City for the Famicom in 1985, as well as Tank Force for arcades in 1991. Past this point, the franchise gets a bit hazy. There were certainly games that could fall within the premise of the Tank Battalion franchise, but if you were to glimpse them from a distance, you'd most likely never match them together. The first of these was a game called Tankle, released for Windows in 2008. The game, which now featured a more anime-esque style, had players compete in 4 on 4 turf wars in a, uh, I mean, I guess, I guess they're kind of tanks? Kind of? The game seemed to be a total flop, with its servers shutting down a mere 7 months after its launch. Tank Battalion would move on to mobile phones in 2011, before making its final stand on the system in 2014, with Shingen Destroy Girls Tank Battalion. Again, comparing the two mobile games, I'd be hard pressed to find anyone who would think that they're part of the same franchise. This latest game didn't meet Bandai Namco's expectations, resulting in the closure of its servers in early 2016. This franchise is a strange one, but seeing as Bandai had seemingly tried to keep it alive despite in the most obscure ways, I think there's a slight chance that it will come back. 
Namco would return to the shooter genre with its release of Bosconian in 1981. All in all, this game was just like your typical multi-directional shooter, where players controlled a starfighter as they were tasked with destroying enemy missiles and bases. While successful in Japan, Bosconia never did reach the global success of other shooter map games. Even so, the series would see a further two sequels, Blast Off in 1989 and Final Blaster in 1990, both of which remain Japanese exclusives to this day. Seeing as no new entries have been worked on in over three decades, I think it's safe to say that this is a dead franchise. Despite dipping back into the shooter market with Bosconia, Namco wasn't done with the maze type games just yet, and within a year would release Dig Dug for arcades. Dig Dug followed Taizu Hori as he eliminated red creatures called Pulkas and fire-breathing green dragons by inflating them and crushing them under large rocks. Namco had adopted their cute characteristics and implemented them into Dig Dug, which helped it garner both critical and commercial success, becoming the second highest grossing arcade game of 1982. Due to the original game's success, the series has expanded to include a further five games, ending with Dig Dug Island in 2008. Dig Dug Island in particular took the overhead perspective of Dig Dug 2 and turned it into an MMO, tasking up to four players to clear up the island of monsters, the same ones that had been introduced in the original game. As is the case with many MMOs, Dig Dug Island allowed players to create their own avatar and customize their very own island villa, while simultaneously emptying their wallets through in-game purchases. This iteration of the game wasn't received too well, and its servers would shut down a year later in 2009, essentially killing off the franchise, as there hasn't been a game since. But while Dig Dug may have dug its own grave, it would spawn its very own spin-off franchise called Mr. Driller. At first, Mr. Driller was intended to be the third mainline entry into the Dig Dug series, but due to the game now adopting more puzzle-like gameplay, it was later renamed and pushed as its own standalone title. In Mr. Driller, players would take control of the titular character Suzumu Hori, who had to destroy the piling up blocks before they could take over downtown. By drilling certain blocks, it would cause the ones above it to dislodge themselves, which could in turn fall down, crushing Suzumu as a result. Suzumu also had an oxygen meter that he must replenish throughout the game by collecting air capsules. The series was praised for its colourful aesthetics, refreshing gameplay, and catchy soundtrack, helping expand into a long-lasting series with multiple sequels and spin-offs. Each new sequel brought on new additions in the form of characters, game modes, which certain games referred to as amusements, special blocks, and power-ups, but the general gameplay remained the same throughout the series. As of the current day, there have been 14 games released in the Mr. Driller series, with the latest being a HD remaster of Mr. Driller Drill Land released back in 2020 for current gen consoles. Due to the game's niche nature and sporadic western releases, I don't think it can go any higher than it exists. Namco was seemingly in its prime by this point, as just a year after Dig Dug, they would release yet another smash hit in the form of Pole Position, an arcade racing simulation game that would go on to become recognized as one of the most important and influential racing games of all time. As is the case with pretty much every racing game during this period, players took control of an F1 race car and had to take part in the time trial lap, where they had to complete it in a certain time period in order to qualify for the actual F1 race at the Fuji racetrack. At the time, this was the very first racing game to feature a track based on a real racing circuit and its 3D third-person perspective was gobbled up by players and critics alike, with the latter amazed by its unbelievable driving realism. Pole Position would speedrun its way to the top, becoming the highest racing arcade game of 1982 and the most popular arcade game of 1983. The title was so popular, it even spawned its own cartoon, board game, and of course, a sequel titled Pole Position 2, which was released the next year to critical acclaim. Now you'd expect a franchise that was topping sales lists to flourish and continue to pump out new games, but for the most part, this is where the franchise would end. Pole Position would see a few ports and a remake in 2008 for iOS featuring modernized 3D graphics, but apart from that, the series has seemingly been abandoned. Now despite Namco releasing highly successful series one after another, nothing had quite lived up to the appeal of their smash hit IP, Pac-Man. Well, that was about to change. On the 10th of December 1982, Namco would release Xevious, a vertical scrolling shooter for arcades in which players controlled an attack craft called the Solver Lol, with the goal being to destroy all the Xevious forces who were plotting to take over the Earth. The Solvalo had two weapons, a zapper that fired projectiles as well as a blaster that could bomb ground vehicles. The game's impressive graphics and thrilling gameplay were heavily praised, and the resulting success was nothing short of exceptional. In just its first few weeks, Xevious would go on to smash sales records, the likes of which hadn't been seen since Space Invaders. This was unprecedented for Namco in Japan. It was essentially the eastern version of Pac-Man's success in the west. As you'd expect, following such a groundbreaking release, the potential for sequels was immediately acted upon, resulting in the development 
development of a further 11 games for the franchise. The latest game, fittingly named Xevious Resurrection, was released back in 2009 as an exclusive addition to Namco Museum's Essentials and acted as a modern update of the original Xevious arcade game. The franchise has branched out into other forms of media such as films, novels, and even its own model kit akin to the Gunpla series, which people can build their very own Solvalol Starship. Unfortunately, the series hasn't seen any news since, and it's most likely a dead franchise as a result. Now up to this point, we have covered franchises purely owned and developed by Namco. And I'm sure some of you have been wondering, well, it's Bandai Namco, right? So what the hell has Bandai been doing all this time? Well, as I mentioned in the beginning, Bandai was more of a toy distributor than a game developer, but following the explosive growth of their Gunpla model kits, it was only a matter of time before the idea of developing video games for the series would emerge. By the end of 1983, the first ever Gundam video game would release. Kido Senshin Gundam Part 1, Gundam Daishi Natatsu, referred to itself as a role venture game, as it included visual novel and RPG elements, as well as shooter segments throughout it. Now bear with me, as I'm going to try and cover this absolutely ludicrously massive franchise of games. The popularity of anime and Gunpla models naturally trickled into video games, and before you knew it, Gundam games were flying off shelves. The Model Suit Versus series was one of the first developed for arcades. The series was a set of hack and slash action another games based on the games series called Only the Only Year Later Did you get all that? Well, that's only about half of the games that were in this whole franchise. that's only about half of the games in this whole franchise. In general, this franchise has become almost too big, at least to talk about in this small segment of this video. To help give some perspective though, the Gundam video game franchise has well over 250 games to its name, with sales totaling over 30 million units. Despite like 90% of these games ever having made it out of Japan, the seemingly endless onslaught on top of the already massive franchise easily places Gundam in the flagship tier. We turn back to Namco with this next one. Mappy was a unique platform game in which players guided Mappy, a police mouse through a mansion that was filled to the brim with thieving cats called Meowskis. The idea was to retrieve stolen goods like TVs or the, wait, the Mona Lisa? <laughs> All while avoiding the cats. Mappy would navigate the multiple floors by using the trampoline which allowed him to bounce and pass by cats without being harmed. The game was met with considerable praise and was successful enough to spawn a small series of sequels up until 2011 with the release of Mappy World for mobile phones. The series even got its own animated web series called Mappy the Beat which had been written and directed by Scott Kurtz and Chris Straub. The original game would also see a re-release in 2021 for the Switch and PS4, but apart from that, this series has remained dormant. It's hard to imagine a complete revival of the series in its current state. After developing Xevious, Masanobu Endo would switch things up when designing Namco's next franchise. Titled The Tower of Draga, the game was one of the very first ARPGs which followed golden clad knight Gilgamesh as he painstakingly scaled 60 floors of the titular tower in an effort to rescue the maiden key from the demon Draga. Within each floor there were numerous monsters that Gilgamesh must defeat while also searching for a key to open the door to the next floor. One of the game's unique features was the addition of hidden and secret items that would only appear upon completing special tasks like defeating a certain number of enemies or even inputting a special code with the joystick. These hidden secrets were heavily praised and have been cited as being incredibly influential for future games such as Dragon Slayer and even the iconic Legend of Zelda series. A wave of sequels and spin-offs would soon follow, which would become collectively known as the Babylonian Castle Saga series. Over its nearly 30 year lifespan, the series would feature 10 games, ending with The Labyrinth of Draga in 2011, a Japanese exclusive mobile release. The series would also feature in its own anime, which premiered in 2008. Interestingly enough, the main series only ever consisted of four games, ending with The Blue Crystal Rod back in 1994, and according to Namco, was the final game in the series. The rest have been spin-offs developed by third-party companies, none of which were as popular as the original series. Taking this all into account, I think we can say that this series is probably a finished one. Continuing on with their experimentation, Namco would tackle the run and gun genre next, releasing Baraduke in early 1985 for arcades. In this game, players would take control of Kissy, a space person geared up in their very own biohazard suit, as they fought their way through 8 worlds of increasing difficulty while blasting enemies with their wave gun. The game featured a co-op mode in which player 2 could join in for some action, playing as Taki. In what could only be described as a twist ending, upon beating the game, Kissy would remove her biohazard suit to reveal that she was female all along. Wait, where else have I seen this before? Huh, now you may think, you know, how dare Namco steal this idea from my queen, Samus Aran. But I should mention that this surprise reveal predated even Metroid by over a year. As an added bit of trivia, Toby Kissy Masuyo was actually married to Taizu Hori. 
the protagonist of Dig Dug, if you remember, before divorcing him, which I mean, it, it doesn't even really make any sense how they would meet in the first place. But anyway, even with the shock twist ending, the game never amounted to much in terms of its success and was passed off as a serviceable game with nothing special to it apart from its mildly addictive gameplay. Even so, it did get another chance when a sequel would release just three years later in 1988 for Japan only. Like its predecessor, however, this game never saw much of the limelight, and apart from its poorly conceived and developed port for the Wii Virtual Console in 2009, the franchise has seemingly fallen into obscurity. Upon witnessing the explosive success of Xevious, Namco had a brilliant idea in hopes of replicating its success. But instead of a vertical scroller, Namco was overclocking their neurons and decided on the groundbreaking idea of a horizontal scrolling shooter. It's not true. That's impossible. Okay, I'm just I'm just making this shit up for a dramatic effect, but Namco really did develop a horizontal shooter titled Sky Kid, which was released towards the end of 1985 for arcades. Gameplay involved players taking control of the Sky Kids, Red Baron and Blue Max, which were references to the infamous World War One ace pilot Manfred von Richthofen and the prestigious order Per Le Merit. Sorry if I butchered those, as they bomb specific targets, all while evading enemies with loop-de-loops. With its catchy music pumping away, Sky Kid managed to soar its way to the second most successful arcade unit of the month, and got its very own sequel titled Sky Kid Deluxe, which was released a year later in 1986. This sequel was more of an enhanced version of the original, featuring new missions, enemies, and even a new song, outside of a few references to it in other Bandai Namco franchises, like Ace Combat. The series has unfortunately been shot down, and seemingly never recovered. Wow. Honestly, it's crazy to me that No Man's Sky was in development for over 30 years, but I mean, it's certainly come a long way from the- Wait, wait, this isn't No Man's Sky beta footage? What? But, but it looks just like it. Alright, sorry, my bad guys. Despite it looking pretty much the same, this is actually Star Luster, a space combat simulation game released back in 1985. The game involved you exploring space while shooting down enemy ships and bases. The game has been credited as one of the first to feature a regenerating shield. Despite its simplistic gameplay and lack of story, it did eventually get a sequel in the form of Star Ixium, which was released as part of a compilation in 1999 for the PlayStation. In a similar fashion to its predecessor, Star Ixium received mixed reviews for its simplicity and generic missions. Out on top of that, the game never saw a US release, only ever making an appearance in the EU, and it's no wonder that this game slots into the dead tier. Now I know I mentioned Gundam as Bandai's introduction to the video game industry, but in reality, the first Gundam games weren't actually developed nor published by Bandai themselves. It wasn't until 1985 that Bandai would become one of the first third-party developers for Nintendo's NES, and with that, Tag Team Match Muscle, a fighting game developed by Toze and published by Bandai. This game in particular featured two modes, one where you fought a CPU, and the other which allowed players to fight one-on-one -on -one with each other. While the original Japanese version was based on the hit manga and anime series Kini Kuman, the Western release was passed off as your typical macho wrestling game, as Bandai figured no Western player would know what the hell Kini Kuman was. It was likely due to this link to the manga series that the game sold extremely well, shipping over 1 million units in Japan alone. This resulted in the game getting its own follow-up sequel two years later in 1987. This game, however, would remain a Japanese exclusive, and since its release, the franchise has seemingly been suplexed into oblivion. Moving on to the world of 3D, well, kind of. We have Thunder Scepter, a 1986 rail shooter in which players make their way through a strip of enemies, destroying them with their cannons and bombs while avoiding, uh, I mean, whatever the hell these things are. The game was fairly popular and got its very own sequel called 3D Thunder Scepter 2, just six months later at the end of that very same year. This time around though, its arcade cabinet incorporated stereoscopic 3D technology which gave off the impression of large 3D objects coming towards the player. Despite its simplistic gameplay and idea, it was commercially successful, even tying with the original Street Fighter back in 1987. Originally, these two games were never released in the West, only recently becoming available through a bundle called The Arcade Archives, which was released on PS4 and Switch earlier this year. Even so, I think I'd confidently put money on this franchise not seeing a new original release in the future. By this point in time, the rise of the gaming industry was in full effect, spearheaded by Nintendo's popular home console, the Famicom, and their flagship plumber, Mario. But if we were to discuss popular franchises, there was another that would release earlier in 1986, one that I may or may not have copied for my own personal channel name. Obviously, I'm referring to The Legend of Zelda, which garnered universal acclaim upon its release. Seeing this, Namco decided that their next game would follow a similar route, incorporating RPG elements within a large, vast world with an emphasis on exploration. The resulting game was Valkyrie no Boken, which was essentially The Legend of Zelda, but if Zelda was actually the protagonist instead of Link. Players would take control of Valkyrie as she hunted down Zona in an attempt to restore peace to Marvel Land. 
Much like Zelda, Valkyrie's tasks were not assigned. Many had to be discovered by simply exploring and experimenting. As you progressed throughout the game, you would find stronger equipment and increase your powers. While the game never did find the same success as The Legend of Zelda, it would perform admirably, earning it several sequels over the years. As of the current day, the franchise has had 5 original games to its name, with multiple ports and enhanced remakes. It's a shame to see this franchise fizzle out, as the potential for a game like this could be limitless. I mean, just look at how far The Legend of Zelda has come. Next up is a fairly obscure release, going by the name of Genpei Tomaden, which was released as a coin-operated game back in 1986. If you have no idea what's going on with the gameplay, uh, yeah, neither do I. It was a side-scrolling hack-and-slash platform that had you slashing through demons. The game itself had three types of actions, which they referred to as small mode, which was just your standard mode, big mode, which was just standard mode except the room was big after eating a super mushroom, and plain mode, which was viewed from an overhead perspective. The game drew elements from mythology, with the god of the underworld and the sun goddess Amaterasu appearing within the game. The game went on to become a sleeper hit in Japan, often being seen as one of Namco's best and most beloved arcade games. Despite starting as a Japanese exclusive, the original game would be renamed to the Genji and the Heike Clans, while being bundled in Namco Museum Volume 4 compilation. On top of this, the game would get its own sequel called Samurai Ghost, which was released in 1992 for PC. The gameplay and story were essentially the same, but for whatever reason, Namco decided to remove the small and plain mode sections from this iteration, which didn't go down well with its fans. As a result, this franchise is most likely a dead one. It seems that every franchise Bandai brings in, Namco had already produced 5. But what Bandai lacks in quantity, they certainly made up for in quality, and this next franchise was certainly no different. It was at this point that I realised just how big Bandai Namco really was. On one end, you have top tier original game franchises being produced from Namco's side, and on the other, we have Bandai, who as we'll uncover throughout the rest of this video, has a monopoly over some of the biggest series in manga and anime that they just pull over to the video game industry, as we've seen from Gundam and now Dragon Ball. Just like Gundam, this franchise has a ridiculous lineup of games, over 100 if we were to include mobile and spin-off games. The series features various genres, most prominently fighting games, role-playing games, and platform platform games, which all feature varying rosters of characters from the original series. Now, I'm not insane. Well, at least I'm not insane while writing this section, so I'm not going to attempt to cover every game or even every sub-series, but I would like to mention a few things that help put things into perspective. Due to the overwhelming success of the original source material, it should be no surprise that the Dragon Ball games sell extremely well. By 2014, over 40 million units have been sold already establishing it as one of Bandai's best sellers. This was only the beginning though, as the franchise would delve heavily into the fighting game genre, spawning some of the most popular games in the whole series, namely the Xenoverse games, as well as the latest smash hit, Dragon Ball Fighter Z, which has resulted in some of the most iconic moments in eSport history. No, wait, do not tell me we're gonna summon. Are we gonna summon? Oh! And Summon Fox is your Dragon Ball Fighters Evolution 2018 Champion! Those would be followed up by the immensely popular Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, with each of these entries selling millions if not tens of millions of copies each. The series as a whole is most definitely a Bandai Namco flagship, even if the show is pretty mid. What did he say? Okay, my personal hot takes aside, we have transitioned back into Namco's playing field, where they would release Rolling Thunder, a 1986 run and gun arcade game. You control Albatross, a member of the world crime police organization Rolling Thunder Espionage Group. Fuck, that is a long name. Albatross has been tasked with saving his co-agent Leela Blitz from a secret society. The gameplay involved the player using doors to hide and crates to take cover, while taking care of enemies with a variety of weapons. This game in particular has been cited as the predecessor to modern cover shooters like Time Crisis. As you can imagine, the game was fairly successful in both Japan and the US, resulting in a further two sequels, fittingly named Rolling Thunder 2 in 1990, which added cooperative gameplay in which two players could play at the same time, and finally Rolling Thunder 3 in 1990 which only ever released in the West. Following the release of Rolling Thunder 3, the franchise seemed to go silent, but for now, Rolling Thunder has to remain in the dead tier. Namco turned towards the sports genre for this next series. I'll give you the cover art and 3 seconds to guess the sport it's based on. Now if you said anything but baseball, then I must applaud you for getting this far into the video while drunk. Alright, let's be real, that's the only reason anyone's still watching. Either way, Family Stadium or Famitsa is a long-running series of baseball sports games. The first game in the series, Pro Baseball Family Stadium, was actually the first console game to be licensed by the MLBPA, allowing for the use of actual MLB player names. The game garnered universal acclaim upon its release and has sold over 2.5 million copies to date, making it one of the best-selling Famicom games of all time. The series has continued to this day, 
with the latest release on the Switch in 2020. Seeing as it's consistently released pretty much every year until now, I think it deserves its spot in the mainstays. The franchise was so popular actually, that it even spawned its own spin-off series. Now what sports could they derive from baseball to develop a spin-off series? Let's see, maybe softball? You know, maybe, maybe even cricket if they're feeling a little bit spicy. Oh, no. Nope. It's, it's just baseball again. The World Stadium franchise was essentially more of the same, featuring different stadiums among its 15 games. If it wasn't for the first game, Great Sluggers 94, I wouldn't have had to include it in this list. But seeing as it was the first and only game to ever release in the West, it technically matches the criteria. Overall though, this series is merely a spin-off of the main one, and hasn't had a new game since 2001, meaning it's a dead one. Bandai wanted to top in on the sporting spree when they released Family Fun Fitness, a set of sports fitness games that utilize the control map for its running and jumping focused gameplay. Honestly, this may be the earliest iteration of the fitness game, certainly a lot earlier than Wii Fit and the like. You know, it'd be cool to snag a copy and see just how- 35,000 fucking dollars? Are you kidding me? I'm sure some of you are aware of this version of the game. It's been heavily cited as one of the rarest NES games of all time. The reason being that Nintendo upon seeing the potential of this control map looked to rebrand the games, which they eventually did, re-releasing the games as world-class track meet with a new map called the Power Pad. This quick turnover meant that there were very few original copies existing, and that number has only decreased over time, resulting in some of the most expensive sales for a video game ever. Oh, and I guess it's a dead franchise as well. It never ceases to amaze me how strange some of these older games appear to me, who for the most part grew up in the late N64 and GameCube era, but Shadowland is definitely up there in terms of strangeness. The platform had you take control of Tarasuke, a boy that had been essentially sent to the naughty room after misbehaving. Well, in reality he was actually banished to hell, but I mean that's the same thing when you're a kid. He then had to reach the end of each level while shooting small key bullets to defeat enemies. The game got its own spin-off in 1990, which, what the fuck, it's another baseball game. What? I guess there was this baseball craze at the time. Anyway, this is a dead franchise, and the only reason it made it on the list is that it was released as part of the Arcade Archives collection finally bring it to the west. After the baseball craze died down, Namco moved on to the next biggest thing, F1 racing. <laughs> Of course, when they released Final Lap in 1987. Its release window held some significance, as 1987 was the first year a Formula 1 Grand Prix was held on the Suzuka circuit, which appears as the main track in Final Lap. Final Lap was also the first game to allow up to 8 players to race simultaneously in an F1 car. While commonplace these days in arcades, at the time this was revolutionary, and as a result the game garnered a lot of attention and popularity amongst its players. Following this success, the series would expand to include Final Lap 2, Final Lap 3, and Final Lap R, with each game featuring more and more tracks from different countries. Alongside these sequels were numerous spin-offs, ending with Final Lap 2000 and Final Lap Special, a pair of games released for the Wonderswan, a handheld device developed by none other than Bandai. Unfortunately, Actually, this is where the series would end, allowing us to slot it in to the dead tier. While Namco was screwing around with baseball games, Bandai was cooking up another franchise. And by cooking, I mean looking for a popular manga series and sniping the rights to produce games for it. And this time around, it was the highly popular Saint Seiya series. The franchise would take a crack at everything, having platformers, fighting games, beat-em-ups, and even the odd RPG thrown in, with a large majority of the games remaining Japanese exclusives. Over time though, Saint Seiya games slowly started releasing in Europe, starting with Saint Seiya The Sanctuary in 2005. This trend continued for the foreseeable future until 2013, when Bandai Namco would release Saint Seiya Brave Soldiers in the US, marking it as the first game in the series to make it to the United States. Saint Seiya Soldier Soul, a versus fighting game, remains the latest home console release in the franchise, spanning all the way back to 2015. Since then, the franchise has seen multiple new additions to the series. However, most of these are merely licensed Japanese mobile games, the latest of which being Saint Seiya Legend of Justice in 2022. Seeing as the source material ended over 30 years ago, it's surprising that they're still able to develop games for it. Even so, I don't believe it's nearly consistent enough to slot into the mainstays. Here we have one of the most unsuccessful yet successful game series. And if that makes no sense to you, then I mean, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't really make much sense, does it? But let me try and explain what I mean. On the Momo was a 1987 beat-em-up arcade game in which players took control of the titular character Momo as she acted out a stage play in which she had superpowers. While the setting was charming and added a sense of realism instead of your typical fantasy elements, the gameplay still mimicked that of your typical beat-em-up, with Momo charging up a Wonder Meter with her kicks. Upon filling this meter up and touching a tornado icon, she would transform into Wonder Momo, allowing her access to the powerful Wonder Hoop. The game was also known for its risque fan service, which is kind of commonplace in anime. Now when I say unsuccessful, I don't mean the 
game flopped by any means, but it wasn't blowing anyone away either. In fact, the series was due for a direct sequel in the form of Wonder Momo 2, which had been planned for a release in 1993. This was later cancelled though due to waning interest in the series. Not wanting the series to die however, WayForward Technologies, an American independent game developer, would pick up the series and release Wonder Momo Typhoon Booster for mobile phones in 2014. Unfortunately, this too would eventually be removed from the app stores in 2015. Aside from an internet comic strip and a short anime miniseries, this franchise has seemingly been left to die. Continuing on with the beat em up genre, Namco would release Bravo Man in 1988 for arcades. Bravo Man had your usual abilities, kicking, punching, and headbutting enemies into oblivion, but what separated him from the rest was his best friend Lottery Man, which would give him random power ups like noodles that could heal him, or a bullet train that instantly warped him to the end of the level. Initially, the game was very well received in Japan, but upon its port to the Wii Virtual Console, and in turn its introduction into the West, it was shat on, with many looking negatively upon its rough character designs and bland backgrounds. A sequel was being developed during the late 80s, which was apparently set to feature Bravo Man as a divorced, unemployed and homeless warrior fighting his way back to the top. This game ultimately got scrapped, with the team believing that the concept would not work as a brand new game. In a strange sense of deja vu though, the game would get its very own animated adaption that ran for 12 episodes from 2013 to 2014. At the same time, an endless runner game called Bravo Man Binger Batch would release for iOS and Android. This too would unfortunately end up being delisted, and is no longer available to play as of the current day. In saying this, the series is most likely on its last legs. It honestly seems like Namco was going through certain phases. First it was maze games, then it was baseball games, and now it's beat em ups, as the next franchise Splatterhouse would continue on that trend. Inspired by western horror films such as Friday the 13th, Poltergeist and Evil Dead 2, Splatterhouse had players control Rick, a parapsychology major that had been resurrected and had to fight his way through West Mansion in an attempt to save his girlfriend Jennifer. As you can probably tell from its cover art and gameplay, this game wasn't for the faint of heart, with the TurboGrafx-16 port of the game having its own parental advisory warning stating the horrifying theme of this game may be inappropriate for young children and cowards. Emotional damage. Simultaneously roasting adults and destroying any kid's dream of playing a cool scary game. Following the moderate success of the original, the series would expand to include two mainline sequels, a 2010 remake of the original game, and a parody adaption of the arcade game which took a more comical approach to its presentation, having super deformed characters as well as poking fun at your typical pop culture references. The series hasn't seen a new entry in well over a decade, but Bandai Namco have seemingly renewed the trademark for the Splatterhouse IP, and most interesting of all, they were marked under the subtitle of Encore, so I mean you never know, we could see a new entry into the series eventually. Winning Run was your typical arcade racing simulation game, in which, you guessed it, you took control of an F1 driver, with the objective being to make it to the end of each race in first place. The game came with two modes, easy and technical, which are pretty much just 50cc and 150cc in Mario Kart terms. To add to the immersion, the game was housed in what is known as an environmental arcade cabinet, which turned and moved according to the player's directional input. The game went on to become the most successful arcade cabinet of the month, with praise given to its realism and 3D graphics. The series would return with two sequels in Winning Run Suzaku GP and Winning Run 91, both of which never made it out of Japan. Since then though, there's been nothing of note, and therefore we can slot it into the dead tier. Golly! Oh shit, wrong series. Sorry for burning that into your eyes, I got it mixed up with Golly Ghost, a 1991 light gun shooter that makes use of a diorama, which is controlled by a driver board to open and close mechanical doors. The diorama comes with globe lights that actually light up the rooms during gameplay. It's actually quite cool in execution. The idea of the game is to use the attached light guns, nicknamed Zip and Zap, to shoot ghosts in each of these rooms within the time limit. The game was so unique that it inevitably garnered praise from critics and players. A sequel titled Bubble Trouble Golly Ghost 2 was released exclusively in Japan a year later, and featured similar gameplay to its predecessor, now basing its theme around sunken treasure instead. The series would end off with a spin-off titled Golly Ghost's Goal, which was released in 1996 for Windows. This iteration was merely a reskin of game color lines, just with Golly Ghost characters. The same subsidiary, Shift Look, which was reviving older Namco franchises, would also illustrate and publish a comic strip for this series as well. Apart from that though, this one is definitely one of Bandai Namco's dead franchises. Namco would continue to improve, and would take on their very first light gun video game, when they released Steel Gunner in 1990. In what seemed to be drawing from Gundam, Steel Gunner follows police officers Garcia and Cliff as they use mecha suits named Gargoyles, which were equipped with powerful weapons to wreak havoc on an evil organization that was plotting to create a world ending super weapon. The series would receive its very own sequel in Steel Gunner 2, which featured much of the same as its predecessor. It followed the same police officers, but this time they were tracking down a different terrorist group. This is where the series ends though. 
But there may still be some hope, as towards the end of 2022, Bandai Namco filed a new trademark for the Steel Gunner series IP. I mean, this may not amount to anything, but it gives it just enough hope to move up into the zombie tier. We've stumbled upon one of the most ambitious and popular crossovers in gaming history that you've also most likely never heard of. Super Robot Wars was a series of tactical RPGs that were well known for having crossovers of several popular mecha anime, manga, and video games, allowing characters from each of the series to team up and battle one another. Think like Fire Emblem gameplay, but with characters from popular mecha anime and manga. Now despite that sounding pretty cool, there's a good chance you haven't had the chance to experience the games, because for whatever reason and despite the series being extremely popular in Japan and spanning well over 50 games, only a handful have ever released in the west with English translations. Even so, the series has sold over 20 million copies, which for a majority Japanese release is fairly impressive. The series has had manga, anime and film adaptions, and as I said has become very successful, to the point where it's been consistently releasing games to this day. Because it's hardly made an appearance in the west though, I can't rate it higher than mainstays. I want you to picture this, a talking cat, Japanese sailor uniforms, the DreamWorks logo, and a good looking guy with a top hat and masquerade mask. Taking those things into account, what comes to mind? I'll tell you what, a kick-ass series full of magical powers and magical girl- <coughs> What do you mean by that? I mean, you get like some girly show, you know, nothing special. Bandai had done it once again, but this time they were pulling in female audiences when they secured the rights to start developing games on the Sailor Moon manga series. You gotta hand it to Bandai. They definitely know how to pick them, just like with Gundam and Dragon Ball. Sailor Moon during the early 90s was an unstoppable force, smashing its way to records and worldwide stardom. As is the case when a series is popular, video games start getting pumped out at rapid rates, and Sailor Moon was no different. Of the 35 plus games developed for the series, only 3 from my knowledge ever released in the west, with many of them consisting of beat-em-ups, fighting games and RPGs. Despite the ludicrous profits and sales figures, with many of the games selling well into the hundreds of thousands, the hype seemingly died down over time, and within the last decade only a handful of games have ever been developed. It seems despite the series getting a revival in the anime industry, this hasn't translated into its video games, and in all honesty, I think I have to put it into life support. I know it sounds weird, especially if you're a fan of the series, and have seen how big it really is, but this is the current state of its video game franchises, unfortunately, and the current state of that is not looking too hot. Suzuka 8 Hours was a motorcycle racing arcade game that was based on the real world racing event of the same name. The game was your typical racer, but made it possible to have two people play at the same time. Upon its release, the game garnered a lot of attention, most likely due to the event it was based on, and it even got its own sequel in Suzuka 8 Hours 2, which was released a year later and featured pretty much the same gameplay as its predecessor. In saying this, as is the case with a lot of these older racing games, it hasn't been maintained to this day, and has therefore become a dead franchise. Namco would start 1993 by releasing one of their most ambitious games to date. Cybersled was a shooter that had players competing against one another in hovercraft style tanks. Within the futuristic arenas, various power-ups were available that improved the craft's radars and allowed for extra missiles and shield recharging. What made this game stand out in particular was the use of 3D polygons and the ability to switch between third and first person perspectives. The game was heavily praised and even was nominated for the most innovative new technology at the 1994 AMOA Awards. Following the game's success, work on a new sequel began, which would release the following year in 1994 titled Cyber Commando. This sequel was deemed an improvement over its predecessor, featuring a wider range of maps and enemy tanks, but has remained a Japanese exclusive to this day. Despite its innovative use of 3D graphics, it seems that this franchise as well has been forgotten by Bandai Namco. I gotta say, after seeing this game, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games ain't looking so hot. Newman Athletics was a competitive sports game, well if you can even call these sports. It featured four mutant humans, that were called Newmans, as they competed to see who was the strongest and fastest in a wide range of very obscure events. Some of them mimicked your typical track and field events, like Turbo Dash was your 100 meter, and Missile Toss was just Javelin, if the Javelin was a missile. But then you'd get into some truly mental events, like Versus Express, where you're literally stopping a train, and not just any train, but those, go those goddamn bullet trains, and launching it back as far as you can. There's also another funny one where you're continuously wall jumping for what seems like a millennium, with the Eiffel Tower in the background. Upon its release, Newman Athletics quickly rose to become one of the most popular arcade games in Japan, and within two years had its own sequel, called Mark Breakers Newman Athletics 2, 
The sequel introduced seven new Newmans, each with their own speed and power stats, as well as the usual collection of batshit crazy events. Despite the positive praise the series got in general, it seems as though this is where it ends, and unfortunately needs to be placed in the dead tier as well. During this time, Namco's arcade division had been working on and developing a new 3D arcade board named System 22. This board was capable of displaying polygonal 3D models, with fully textured graphics as seen in Namco's next release, Ridge Racer. Ridge Racer, as the name suggests, was a 1993 racing game based on a trend among Japanese car enthusiasts, which involved racing around mountain roads while drifting around the ridges. It would be the first first ever arcade game to use 3D textured mapped graphics, and allowed players to choose not only their car and course, but also the song to play in the background. All of these features culminated in a god tier game that has not only been cited as one of the most influential titles in the racing genre, but has also allowed the series as a whole to expand into so much more. As of the current day, the Ridge Racer franchise has released 23 games, including spin-offs and mobile titles. For the most part, each and every one of these games has been received well, and while there are no sources setting the exact sales figures, it's safe to assume that they sold decently well. Unfortunately, there hasn't been a new game released in over 7 years, and if you're only counting mainline games, then that gap would increase to over 10 years. Taking this into account, it's highly unlikely that a new entry will be developed. Hoping to milk the System 22 for all it's worth, Namco would follow up Ridge Racer with another 3D racer called Ace Driver in 1994. This time however, players were taken back to the old school routes where they controlled an F1 racer, with the objective being to simply complete 3 laps on first place. By this point, the 3D racing format was becoming saturated, with players being spoiled for choice between Sega's Daytona series, Namco's own Ridge Racer, and now Ace Driver. Even with all of this competition, Namco stated that Ace Driver was an overwhelming success, with many people preferring the 8 player version of the game. Within a year, a sequel called Ace Driver Victory Lap would release, and over a decade later, a third and final game, titled Ace Driver 3 Final Turn, would release in 2008. While it wouldn't last as long as Ridge Racer, it was still remembered as an extremely impressive and influential racer. Unfortunately, it seems as though the series has been finished, meaning we can put it in the dead tier. Now, I'm not sure how to describe this next series, point blank. It's kind of like WarioWare with sets of minigames, except they're shooting minigames that you could select from a menu. They were all kinds of stages, some graded based on accuracy, others on speed, and even some on intelligence somehow. All of them had to be done in a short time frame, and performance was ranked after each one. Some described the game as having non-violent shooting contests, because there's no blood, but I mean, you're literally blasting birds and shit, so I'm not sure I'd fully agree on that. Due to its fast-paced action and addictive gameplay, it's no wonder the game would prove successful, and as a result, the franchise expanded to include a further 8 games, with the latest, Point Blank X, rebooting the series with HD remastered stages from the first 3 games. Even so, this iteration was released over 7 years ago, and since then, nothing else has emerged. Not to worry though, as Namco were back in the kitchen cooking up a feast with this next franchise. As I've stated more times than I'd like to admit, if there was one genre to dominate arcades during the 90s, it would without a doubt be the fighting game genre. Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, and Virtua Fighter were some of the biggest releases during this time period, and well, Namco wasn't going to let this opportunity surpass them. Even so, I wonder if Namco knew just how big this franchise would become. Tekken. Namco's highly technical flagship fighter would release on the 21st of September 1994, and while the original game didn't necessarily incorporate any innovative or groundbreaking features, it was still considered one of the best games in the genre. The undeniable success of the original has led to numerous spin-offs, sequels, and appearances in other media formats. Tekken 2 and Tekken 3 in particular are considered landmark titles, with Tekken 3 adding emphasis to three-dimensional movement, allowing characters to sidestep in and out of the background, adding to the technical gameplay and immersive feeling. To this day, the Tekken franchise has sold over 54 million units, placing it as the fourth best-selling fighting game franchise in history, eclipsing other iconic fighting series like Street Fighter, although that may have changed with the most recent release of Street Fighter 6. Unfortunately for Street Fighter though, that victory will most likely be short-lived, as Tekken 8 is currently in development and is pending a 2024 release. Outside of its games, Tekken is featured in animated films, comics, and even its own Netflix anime series, which was released last year in 2022. From its iconic characters to its rooted esports scene, Tekken is without a doubt a Bandai Namco flagship. Now if you thought Namco would back off and chill out after releasing Tekken, then you'd be sorely mistaken, as by this point, Namco was on fire, and truly in their golden era of games. Namco would follow up Tekken with another banger, in the form of Ace Combat, a flight simulation game in which you soar through the skies in fast-paced action with a certain degree of realism. 
I say a degree because these offer a variety of aircraft, with each of them having their own specific flight dynamics. And they can even store their motion, which is similar to their real life counterparts. Instead of sticking with that realism though, Namco decided to equip each of these aircraft with super weapons that could be used to wipe out enemy squadrons and massive battleships. The first game in the series was actually a port of an arcade game titled Air Combat, which was released in 1993. This game set the groundwork mechanics for the resulting series and had players work their way through missions, each with their own objectives. The series would follow this gameplay format for most of its games, with some branching out like Ace Combat 3, which relied on more story-driven gameplay that had branching stage paths. As of the current day, the Ace Combat franchise has 18 games to its name, soon to be 19 as an untitled new entry was confirmed to be in development since August of 2021. With over 18 million units in circulation, I'm actually not sure what I'd classify this as. It could definitely be a flagship, but I think compared to the other titans in that tier, Ace Combat seems to be more suited as a mainstay. Namco would continue the snowball with Alpine Racer. Get it? Because because <laughs> it's skiing and snow? Snowball? <sighs> anyway, Alpine Racer had one of the coolest cabinets to go along with it, featuring its own handlebar controller and rotating foot pedals. Alpine Racer had plays zooming down a snow-covered mountain in hopes of not stacking it, both in-game and in real life. You had a few modes to test your skills on, the standard race mode and a time attack mode, where you had to pass through gates to extend the timer. The game was extremely successful, with many praising it for its realistic depiction of the sport. Alpine Racer spawned a series of sequels and remakes, with each entry adding new skiers, courses, and multiplayer modes. As of the current day, the series has had 7 games to its name, and as an extra bonus fact, has even been used in a Harvard-based research study on sleep and dreams, where sleep scientist Robert Stickold found that those who played Alpine Racer before sleeping actually dreamed of skiing. Even so, it's been almost a decade since the last game, so in that regards, it's most likely on life support. All of these games I've discussed so far are timeless classics. If only there were a way to collect them all together. Oh wait, Namco thought of that with their Namco Museum series. What was originally used as the name for a chain of retail stores from the 80s that sold Namco merchandise had now been rebranded as a series of video game compilations. Now I'm not even sure if this means that they count for this kind of list, but hey, there's been more than one of them, so I guess it does? The series has received mixed opinions due to many of the compilations just including the same games repeatedly. Even so, the series has released 15 different compilations and has sold over 14 million copies altogether. And seeing as the series has stayed consistent over the past three decades, God, am I really going to put a series of games that are just a collection of another series of games into mainstays? I, I guess I guess I am, no matter how wrong it feels. Now despite the overwhelming success of Tekken, Namco wasn't quite finished with the fighting game genre and decided to have another crack at it barely a year later. This time though, they wanted to focus the gameplay on weapons instead of your typical hand-to-hand -hand combat. The resulting game was Soul Edge, which was released initially at the JAMA trade show towards the end of 1995. Featuring a multitude of unique characters, each with their own specialized weapon, Soul Edge incorporated a weapon gauge that when depleted resulting in the player losing their weapon, forcing them to fight unarmed. With similar movement tech to their previous fighter Tekken, Soul Edge was met with very positive reviews. While this was a positive start to the franchise, nothing could prepare fans for what was coming next. Namco would follow up Soul Edge with Soul Calibur in 1998. Aside from the obvious name change, there was another aspect about this game that truly cemented it as an all-time great. That being, the introduction of the 8-way run. While it may sound confusing by name, this feature essentially gave players the option to move their fighter in whatever direction they wished. Up to this point, fighting games had very simplistic movement options, often being locked into moving forwards and backwards, with the occasional sidestep. Soul Calibur essentially shed all that baggage, giving players complete freedom over their movements, and allowing for more strategic play overall. To this day, the first Soul Calibur remains the fourth highest rated game on Metacritic, and its success helped push the series towards global stardom. The series has had seven mainline games, multiple spin-offs, and even manga and music albums based on it. It's also had its fair share of appearances at EVO over the years, and has shipped over 17 million copies in total. Despite its consistent nature and popularity, I don't believe it's at the same level as its big brother, Tekken, and therefore falls a slot lower into mainstays. Namco had been releasing banger after banger, and that streak wasn't stopping anytime soon. If you were to think of the king of RPGs, I'm sure many of you would have another company in mind. Especially taking the time period into account, Enix was considered the godfather of the genre, with their immensely popular Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy series. Even so, Namco wanted to have a slice of that cake, and decided to develop their own flagship RPG series. The resulting product has become a worldwide success, and is known simply as the Tales franchise. 
The series debuted on the Super Famicom with Tales of Fantasia back in 1995. This entry set the groundwork for many of the elements that would become synonymous with the Tales franchise, the most notable of which is the game's unique linear motion battle system. Whereas the majority of other RPGs at the time focused on turn-based combat systems, Tales of Fantasia distinguished itself by allowing players to scroll the screen and execute attacks and combos in real time. Another difference was the fact that players only controlled the main character, while the other party members were controlled entirely by the computer. This battle system along with the anime art style remained consistent across the franchise, which as a whole had independent stories and characters between each of its games. With 18 mainline titles to its name and countless spin-offs, remasters and ports, the series has blossomed into one of the most successful RPG franchises, with many of the games logging over 1 million copies sold. The popularity of the series only seems to be growing, with the latest game Tales of Arise smashing previous sales records, bringing the total franchise sales to well over 27 million. And while I do consider it barely inferior to first Barrier and Symphonia, it doesn't change the fact that this series is without a doubt a Bandai Namco flagship. Alright, that should be enough hit series in a row for now. Time Crisis. Alright, never mind. Time Crisis was THE arcade game, at least it was for me. It's pretty much your premier light gun cover shooter, and was always a blast to play with a friend. Unlike a lot of the light gun shooter series that were hard stuck in arcades, Time Crisis has had the majority of its games ported over to consoles. To this day, the series has been releasing somewhat consistently, with 5 mainline titles and numerous spin-off games to its name. Despite the franchise not having a new entry since Time Crisis 5 back in 2015, Bandai did file a new trademark application for the Time Crisis IP, alongside Steel Gun. And while this may not necessarily mean anything, it could be a clue as to a new installment coming in the near future. Now as much as I want to put this in mainstays, I think it isn't quite at the same level as some of the other series. Now this next product from Bandai didn't start off as a video game franchise, but it also wasn't an established manga or anime series either. I'm sure the majority of you watching already know what these little guys were called. The love child of Aki Maita and Akihiro Yokoi, Tamagotchi which was derived from the two Japanese words Tamago which means egg and Nochi meaning watch was a small handheld digital pet that became a cultural phenomenon during the late 90s and early 2000s. These cute little guys were initially marketed solely towards teenage girls. I'm sure some of you even had your own or knew people that had them during your school years. I mean these things were literally everywhere. The general concept was simple enough. What started off as a small egg would slowly hatch into your very own pet, which you'd have to take care of, from feeding it, to cleaning up after it, and even disciplining it. Your pet would go through a standard life cycle, and in more morbid cases, could pass away for numerous reasons. While not as popular as they once were, Tamagotchis are still being sold to this day, with over 83 million units sold in total. Considering its success, it's no wonder the toy got its own video games, among other things like anime and films. The majority of Tamagotchi games were released on handheld devices, most likely to keep with the portable theme of the source material. While there are no definitive sales figures for the whole series, the first two games collectively sold over 4.4 million copies, certainly proving their popularity. Now despite some people not considering the actual digital pets as games, I'm going to just include it all as one, and by doing so this franchise easily earns a slot in the flagship tier. In hopes of creating more story driven games, Hideo Yoshizawa, who had previously directed Ninja Gaiden, conceptualized the idea for Door to Phantom Isle, which would become the first game in the Klonoa franchise. The Klonoa series was a set of platformers and some of the earliest examples of side-scrolling games that used 3D elements. The games followed Klonoa, an anthropomorphic creature that possessed features from dogs, cats, and rabbits, but could never truly make up his mind on what he wanted to be. Klonoa was a dream traveler who set out to save the worlds he found himself in. He would do this by using his ring and wing bullets to inflate enemies which he could then throw at the ground giving them a boost and the ability to double jump. Despite the early success of the series and the potential for a new company mascot, the series has slowly faded to the point where the most recent games are merely remakes and remasters of the original Geo. Because of this, I don't think I can place the series any higher than it exists. Now following the explosive success of Tamagotchi amongst the female population, Bandai looked to develop a similar product that they could market towards the male population. What they came up with would go by the name Digimon, Digital Monsters, and much like the original Tamagotchi, started off as digital pets that players looked after as they played with them and had them fight. Digimon wouldn't immediately take off like Tamagotchi though, and it wasn't until the video game Digimon World, which was released in 1999, that the franchise started to gain some significant traction. Digimon World would mark the beginning of Digimon World series, as well as a smaller subseries known as Digimon Story. The franchise would branch out into other game genres like fighting games, racing games, video card games, and even strategy games. The biggest draw when it came to this franchise is without a doubt the animated series. 
and for the majority of people in the West, is most likely how they first were introduced to the franchise as a whole. Safe to say, after 25 million units sold between its games and digital pets, this, like its sister product, deserves flagship status. Now I'd just like to quickly mention this series, as while it's primarily owned by Bandai Namco, it's also quite a confusing array of games, and it's hard to consider them a franchise at all. The franchise in question is the Simple series, which is a bunch of budget priced video games that have been released on pretty much every console you can think of, well apart from the more modern ones. You had dozens of games released exclusively in the West, and the same for the East. Now apparently, all of these games together have sold over 20 million copies, which is extremely impressive for a bunch of budget titles. I'm not going to place this one as I don't really consider it a franchise, but just thought I should mention it seeing as, as technically they do hold like 95% of the stock in the company. Not to get all deep, but this next franchise has a wholesome backstory. Gunpei Yokoi is a name any gamer should be familiar with, as he is without a doubt one of the most distinguished and beloved designers to ever grace the industry. Even if you're not immediately aware of who this is, you for sure know some of the systems he has designed, namely the Game & Watch, the modern cross-shaped control pad, and the original Game Boy. Now you may be asking why am I talking about him in a Bandai Namco video, seeing as he was through and through a Nintendo employee. Well, it may just become clearer when I say that this next franchise was called the Gunpei series. Following the tragic passing of Gunpei, former colleagues that had worked with him developed a series of puzzle games and named it Gunpei as a tribute to the beloved designer. They were simplistic in design, with the main goal being to piece together broken lines to form a connected one. The series has had 8 games released to this day, with the large majority of them released on handheld devices like the Wonder Swan, which Gunpei had also helped develop. While the latest game, which was released back in 2017 for the iOS has been discontinued, as a way of saying Gunpei's efforts and creations still remain alive to this day, I want to place it into the It Exist here. The MotoGP line of games were your typical bike races. Between the years 2000 and 2006, the franchise released 5 games, 4 of which were on the PS2, and the final being moved to portable play on the PSP. It's hard to really say anything about this game series, they mainly just did the job, and more often than not, got hit with average reviews by fans and critics alike. It seems that after these few games, Capcom took over the reins of this franchise, before passing it on to Milestone, who has continuously made the game since 2013. In terms of Bandai Namco though, this is without a doubt another dead franchise. Now not counting Tamagotchi and Digimon, which had started off as their own original products, it had been a while since Bandai had taken hold of a popular manga series and translated that into a money printing gaming franchise. Well, that was until the year 2000 when Bandai would obtain the rights to the peak of the shonen genre. Any guesses as to what it was? I'll give you a clue. It gets good after 200 episodes. Now if you still have no idea what I'm talking about, then you either don't give a shit about anime, or you love Naruto. Believe it! 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 I'm of course talking about the masterpiece One Piece, written by the legend Ichiro Oda. If you can't tell, I'm a massive One Piece fan. Yes, I'm one of those guys that has spent- wait, hold up. Yeah, 15 straight days of my life watching a cartoon, and I've loved every second of it. Now even with my incredible bias showing, I can admit its game series is mid at best, and absolutely trash at worst. With over 50 games to its name, it's quite a feat that only a handful of them are actually good, namely the Pirate Warrior series. But with the latest release of One Piece Odyssey, you can only hope it's on an upward trajectory. As is the case with a lot of these manga turned game series, the franchise predominantly consists of RPG and fighting games. Overall, the series has sold close to 18 million copies worldwide, which hurts knowing how many copies of Naruto and Dragon Ball are out there, but when looking at the average quality of the games, it's no surprise. This next franchise is actually one that I discovered recently, and it sits as one of Bandai Namco's more underappreciated series in my opinion. I'm talking about Summon Night, a series of RPGs with visual novel elements and dating sim mechanics. One of the biggest reasons for this game remaining relatively unknown in the West is due to the fact that before the series' fifth entry, Summon Night 5, the games had remained Japanese exclusives. Even so, the series was popular enough in Japan to warrant Bandai Namco taking a chance on a translated edition of the fifth game. That task was appointed to Gaijin Works, an American game publishing company known for localizing niche Japanese games for American audiences. Sales figures for this game never were published, but it was deemed a big enough success that work began on translating its sequel, Summer Night 6, which also saw a western release in late 2017. 
In its 23-year lifespan, the series has seen six mainline entries, as well as a further seven spin-off titles. Despite the latest two iterations receiving a Western release, the franchise remains a niche one, selling around 2 million units total across its games. Alongside this, the series writer, Mia Kazuki K, has stated that there have been no new talks regarding future entries, but that he will most likely be ending the story in one final UX novel. Taking this into account, there is a slim chance this novel will be adapted into a game. And because of that, this series unfortunately will have to slot into the zombie tier. Looking back at their monstrous lineup of franchises now, you wouldn't expect it, but during the early 2000s, things weren't looking too hot for Namco. In fact, starting from 1998, the company was taking L's in terms of net losses year after year, and by the year 2001, had predicted a 95% drop in annual revenue. In hopes of stopping the bleeding, Namco's arcade division would undergo a massive reorganization, and the resulting product wouldn't just save them, but would go on to become one of their most recognizable titles at least in Japan. That series was Taiko no Tatsujin, a drum-based rhythm game that had players hit Taiko drum controllers to the beat of songs. I'm sure we've all played one of these games or have seen someone going ham on it. Honestly, I thought that the little mascots were pieces of sushi when I first came across these games, and I hope I'm not the only one that thought that. Regardless, this series would expand to include up to 30 arcade releases and countless home console releases over the years, with some of the most popular entries releasing recently on the Switch. In total, the franchise has shipped over 10 million units, and is to this day one of Bandai Namco's most successful arcade-based series. Wagan Midnight was a Japanese racing manga series written by Michiharu Kuzunoki that centered around street racing on Tokyo's Bayshore route. Due to the popularity of the manga, the series has been adapted into several live-action films, an anime, and you guessed it, a series of video games. The series actually started off being developed by Genki, before Bandai Namco Amusement took over with the Wangan Midnight Maximum Tune series in 2004. The original game featured two modes, a story mode in which players race through 20 different stages on the two available tracks, C1 and New Belt Line, as well as a time attack mode, where you would race against the clock. Future releases would add new story mode chapters, new courses, new cars, new game modes, and even increase the horsepower for all cars, which in turn added to the difficulty when controlling them. The Wangan Midnight Maximum Tune series has had 12 games released for it so far, with the latest, Wangan Midnight Maximum Tune 6RR in 2021. Due to the series being arcade exclusives, it's hard to gauge their popularity, but due to the consistency with a new game essentially releasing on average once every two years, I think it garners a spot in the mainstays tier. Bandai would look towards the RPG genre once more with this next franchise, but instead of your usual MMORPG or ARPG, Bandai wanted to create a game series that shocked and surprised the player in hopes that it would become a more distinctive product. Numerous ideas were thrown around, including slaying dragons or being a thief in London, but these were ultimately rejected in favour of an offline online concept. The Dot Hack series was the resulting product from this. These games were part of a much larger multimedia franchise known as Project Hack, and were set after the events of the anime series Hack Sign. Despite mimicking your typical ARPGs in which you control Kite, the titular character in real time, the series takes a more unique approach by including a game within a game. This is achieved through the simulation of an MMORPG, in which players could choose to close out of the RPG world, which would then take them to a computer desktop where they could interact with game emails, news and message boards, all while still technically playing the game. The original set of four games were designed in this way, played in a fictional MMORPG called The World. Players could even transfer their characters and data between these four games. And if that wasn't confusing enough, the series would expand to include an actual multiplayer online game based on the fictional MMORPG The World, which lasted two years before having its servers shut down. The hack series would get another trio of games between 2006 and 2007, as well as a few one-off entries. The latest addition to the franchise came in the form of Hack GU Last Rico, a HD remaster of the previous trilogy, which was released back in 2017 for PS4 and Windows, and recently in 2022 for the Switch. All in all, the franchise has sold decently well, but due to there not being a new original game in over a decade, it's hard to place it any higher than it exists. Now I just wanted to quickly mention Xenosaga, as it is a property of Namco, before being scooped up by Nintendo and turned into the Xenoblade Chronicles series. Now Xenosaga was a trilogy of RPG games that took elements from its predecessor, Xenogears, and while its story was independent, it did happen in the wider Xeno metaverse. It is without a doubt a dead franchise, seeing as it ended with Xenosaga Episode 3 in 2006, but I thought it still deserves its own little mention here. Another hot take coming in here. If you're a fan of Naruto, get those fingers ready in the comments sections. But Naruto Shippuden is mid. 
Yeah, that's right. Typical smooth brain One Piece fan tape, but it's true. I will admit that the original Naruto is peak shonen though. Anyway, I'm sure that even if you aren't a weeb, you've most likely heard of Naruto. The manga series written by legend Masashi Kishimoto and was once a part of the big three. The series erupted during the early 2000s and had the weird kids in school doing the ninja run down the hallways. Safe to say, I may have been one of those kids. But its popularity didn't just stop at manga and anime. Unlike a lot of other video game series that are based off manga and anime, Naruto games have been developed and published by a wide array of different companies, from Tommy with the Clash of Ninja and Ninja Council subseries, to even Ubisoft with their own standalones. The biggest series is without a doubt the Ultimate Ninja series and fighting games though, which also happens to be the one Bandai Namco is responsible for. What started off with Naruto Ultimate Ninja back in 2003 has now grown to include five mainline titles, as well as multiple subseries with Ultimate Ninja Heroes and the immensely popular Ultimate Ninja Storm. While the Ultimate Ninja and Ultimate Ninja Heroes subseries have died off, the Ultimate Ninja Storm series has kept the franchise afloat, with its latest release, Naruto X Boruto Ultimate Ninja Storm Connections, expected to release this year. The Ultimate Ninja franchise as a whole has sold over 28 million copies, placing it within the flagship tier. We've come across what I consider to be another hidden gem among the riches that is Bandai Namco's library. The Baton Kata series was a set of RPGs developed by Monolith Soft in the early 2000s. While the game plays similarly to your typical JRPG, you as the player didn't actually control the game's protagonist. Instead, you assumed the role of a guardian spirit, an unseen player avatar who would guide Kallus and his party of companions during his adventures across the floating island-based kingdom up in the clouds. The original game which had been developed specifically for the GameCube due to the system's lack of JRPGs was met with positive reviews. Unfortunately, these did not translate well into sales, which were considered lackluster at the time. Even so, the team believed in the franchise's potential, and a resulting prequel was developed and released three years later in 2006. The prequel would maintain the original's focus and use of Magnus, which were magical cards that captured the essence of items. Unlike its predecessor, Nintendo actually published this iteration. Bandai Namco would later trademark the IP though for these two games before announcing a HD remaster of the two games in a Nintendo Direct earlier this year. This collection would offer improved graphics as well as other quality of life features and a new game plus option. What was looking like another dead franchise has seemingly been revived and for now gets to slot into the it exist here. This next franchise is often considered a sleeper hit. Katamari Damacy is a series of puzzle action games that follow a prince who's tasked with rebuilding stars, constellations, and the moons, all of which had been destroyed by his father, the king of all cosmos. Players take control of the prince, who was tasked by his father to roll the Katamari around houses, gardens, and even towns in order to meet certain parameters. Initially, the game received a lukewarm response, and at the time, Namco had no plans of ever releasing the series in the West. It did do enough to warrant a sequel, however, and over time, with each new game, the series started to develop its own cult following. This led to the series in question continuing to this day, with the latest entry, We Love Katamari Reroll Royal Reverie, releasing as a remaster very recently in June of this year. While there have been no definitive sales numbers released for the franchise as a whole, the consistent releases up to this point I think warrant a spot in the mainstays tier. Going into 2005, things were starting to shift, the biggest of which being that Namco had begun talks with Bandai regarding a merger between the two. Despite all this corporate jargon, Banpresto, a wholly owned subsidiary of Bandai, had been working on their latest project. The series in question was R. Tonelico. The R. Tonelico series is an interesting one and is made up of not just video games but manga and an OVA. The core part of the series is formed by its three console RPGs though, with the first R. Tonelico Melody of Elamia being released back in 2006 for the PS2. These games returned to the typical turn-based battle system and had players exploring dungeons and defeating enemies while meeting new characters and building out their party. The aspect that made these games unique, however, was the diving mechanic, which allowed players who visited a dive shop to enter Ravertail's mines. Ravertails were a manufactured race tasked with maintaining Artanelico. While they appear human, they were separated into three types and were often created for specific purposes. Now I'm getting off track here, but as I was saying, by diving into the minds of the Ravertail, you were able to resolve the inner doubts and concerns, ultimately leading them to be able to craft new song magic and unlock new outfits to use in combat. The series would continue with the further two games, with the third game wrapping up the trilogy. Even so, the series Mythos would actually continue in Gust's Surge Concerto series, but that series is under Koi Tecmo's eye, so it's best not to include them here. In saying that, Unfortunately, it means that, as a Bandai Namco franchise, this series is either in the dead or finished here. Now, on what sounds like a cheap ripoff of the Wii Sports games, we have Wii Ski. Except this time it's actually, uh, well, spelt correctly. 
It would be the first third party game to incorporate the Wii Balance Board and had players race down different courses in an attempt to finish first. Well, unless you were IGN, where the goal was to simply avoid hitting these fucking trees. I mean, this gameplay video always used to crack me up. Like, how can you, how can you be so bad? Anyway, after selling over 1 million copies, Bandai Namco would follow up with a sequel called Wii Ski and Snowboard, which, if it wasn't obvious enough from its title, added snowboarding to the mix. The series would end off with what I can only describe as Bandai Namco's answer to Wii Sports Resort, Go Vacation. If anything though, Go Vacation took it to the next level, having players explore four resorts located on Kawawi Island. Sporting more than 50 activities with a solid mix of competitive and cooperative activities, it seems to have something for everyone. What was originally released for the Wii in 2011 also got re-released for the Switch in 2018. All in all, this series offered a nice alternative to the Wii series, and as of the current day, can probably slot into the It Exists here. Now I want you to picture this. The year is 2071. The world has been ravaged and left bare by the Aragami, a race of vicious creatures that can consume anything and take on its attributes. Humanity is on the brink of extinction, due to these creatures being invincible against your conventional weapons. In what can only be described as a miracle, a pharmaceutical company known as Fenrir has been able to create a subseries of biomechanical hybrid weapons called Jinki, and to this day, they are the only things capable of killing the Aragami. These weapons choose their owners, and guess what? You're one of the chosen ones. The title given to those able to wield them are God Eaters, which funnily enough is also the title of the next franchise Bandai Namco would put out. Now obviously what I was describing was the story surrounding the set of games, and that's essentially what you'll be doing in these ARPGs. The game offers both a mission based single player mode as well as cooperative play, where you can team up with your friends to take down these behemoths. It's not the most complex gameplay loop, as most missions often task you with taking out certain Aragami in the area, but it spices things up with the Jinki or God Ark, which can instantly switch between four different types, these being Blade, Gun, Shield, and Predator. You can then upgrade, enhance, and craft new parts using the materials gathered from your missions. The first game garnered decent reviews and sold extremely well in Japan, allowing for further sequels to be produced. In total, the franchise has had three mainline games, as well as three vamped additions to previous games, which expand the story as well as introduce new mechanics. In saying this, the series, like a few others, unfortunately has remained fairly unrecognized in the West, with the majority of its sales coming from Japan. Due to this, I don't think it can rank higher than it exists for now. A lot of people would say that games these days have gotten a lot easier. Gone are the days of Nintendo Hard, where you got bodied over and over by Ghosts and Goblins, Contra, or Ninja Gaiden. At least that was the case, until Bandai Namco would partner with another developer to create a series that is often regarded as one of the most challenging in the modern day. That franchise was Dark Souls. Now when I say Dark Souls, I'm referring to the trilogy of games of the same name, and yes, I'm aware that technically this genre started with Demon Souls, but just like Bloodborne, Sekiro, and even Elden Ring, which are all fall within the Soulsborne moniker, they are not technically part of the Dark Souls franchise, if that makes sense. Regardless of the technicalities, this series in general introduced younger and more modern audiences to the pain felt by those during the NES days. But while you were getting decimated every 5 minutes, it never felt especially cheap, its exceptional level design and punishing but expansive combat system allowed for some of the greatest dopamine hits once you finally conquered that boss that was giving you such a hard time. Its unique game design went on to inspire a lot of future games and has resulted in the Dark Souls franchise garnering critical acclaim. To this day, the series has sold over 33 million copies. While Elden Ring is technically a spiritual successor, the continued success of From Software's Soulspawns easily warrants a flagship spot for this franchise. Now, alongside their Xenoblade Chronicles franchise, Monolith Soft is known to undertake and help with the development of other series, with its next series being a prime example of that. Project X Zone was a set of crossover tactical RPGs that were a follow-up to the 2005 game Namco X Capcom. Despite this, Project X Zone is regarded as its own franchise and features many of the star characters from Bandai Namco, Capcom, and even Sega. Gameplay focuses on grid-based combat in which the units are paired up together and can move freely within their range on the field map. These stages were taken from locations of the many games crossover titles. The games make use of a system called the Cross Active Battle System, wherein by pressing the A button in combination with the circle pad, allowed the player to perform up to 5 basic attack combos. The game was praised for its stellar class, which included iconic characters Jin and Yuri from Bandai Namco, alongside Jill Valentine, Ryu and Dante from Capcom, and Ula La and Imka from Sega. Following the success of the original, the series would receive a sequel called Project X Zone 2, which featured much of the same as its predecessor. Since then though, there hasn't been any news of a new entry. 
During an interview with Nintendo Life, series producer Kensuke Tsukenaka expressed his wishes to continue the series. Only time will tell if he will be able to fulfill those wishes. For now, I think it just slots into It Exists. If you're a true gamer, you're going to love the sound of this. What if I told you there was an RPG series about a manga slash anime where the main premise is about players playing RPGs? We've really come full circle with this one. I'm talking about none other than SAO, a show that started off with one of the coolest premises before nosediving into mediocrity before the first season even ended. Now while the anime may have been hit or miss, what about the games based on it? To this day, the Sword Art Online franchise has had 8 games derived from its source material. These games often take the form of RPGs, usually simulating that of an MMORPG, as this was the main center point in the original story. Each new game often takes place in separate arcs of the show, albeit not always in a canonical fashion. The main draw of these games, apart from the setting, has to be the sheer number of playable characters that are available. A lot of these characters preserve their unique and specialized skills from the light novel and anime, and it's pretty exhilarating to feel like you're the one casting and, and taking control of them. The franchise has released a new game consistently every few years, with over 5.6 million units shipped. Now while that may sound low considering its source material, it should be noted that this figure is from 2020 and does not include the latest two games in the series. Assuming that they have sold decently well, and considering the rate at which the games have been released, I believe this franchise deserves a spot in the mainstays tier. Now just another quick mention, Project Cars, which was originally owned by Bandai Namco, was a series of racing simulation games. The franchise actually managed to release three games, and for the most part, they were successful due to the sheer number of vehicle types and track layouts. Slightly Mad Studios, who had developed the Project Cars line of games, were acquired by Codemasters in 2019. Codemasters would then go and get acquired by EA in 2021, essentially shifting the ownership rights to EA. EA being EA though, promptly cancelled all development into the franchise, despite plans that had already been set for a fourth entry. Unfortunately, adding another to the list of franchise, EA is killed. Again, not placing this one, but just thought I should mention it. Thankfully, the next franchise Bandai Namco would work on doesn't look like it's going to be abandoned anytime soon. That franchise was Little Nightmares. Little Nightmares was developed to help portray the wild extremes of childhood and had puzzle and horror elements intermixed with platforming adventure gameplay. Taking place in the 2.5D world known as The Moor, the story follows Six, a 9 year old girl geared up in a yellow raincoat and armed with a single lighter, as she snuck through the bowels of The Moor, a massive underwater iron vessel. This game makes you feel helpless, mainly due to your lack of combat abilities, but this adds a lot to the atmosphere and emphasizes the stealth periods of the game. Upon its release, Little Nightmares was met with positive reviews, and sold particularly well for a new IP all of which led to the release of a sequel, which was actually a prequel, titled Little Nightmares 2. The gameplay of the prequel is fairly similar to its predecessor, but this time, the player isn't completely helpless. As Mono, the titular character of the prequel, has the ability to grab certain items and swing around to fight back against smaller foes. Similar to its predecessor, Little Nightmares 2 would garner positive reviews, and within one month of its release, had already sold over 1 million copies worldwide. Now while no direct announcement has been made in terms of a new entry into the series, People noticed a job ad posted by Bandai Namco, which was looking for an intern to join the production department within the team dedicated to the IP, Little Nightmares. Because of this, many have speculated that the third installment of the franchise is already under development. Due to the game's high sales figures and consistent releases so far, I think it actually fits within the mainstays, at least for me. Making its appearance as the latest manga slash anime based video game franchise, we have My Hero 1's Justice, a set of fighting games based on the smash hit series My Hero Academia by Kohei Horikoshi. In an attempt to set itself apart from the countless fighting games out there, My Hero 1's Justice employs a sort of rock paper scissors format, in which every character has a selection of attacks to use. Normal attacks are quick enough to beat out unblockable attacks, counter attacks will counter normal attacks, and the unblockable attacks rip through the counter attacks. Alongside this, each character has their own unique quirk. These added an element of uniqueness to every fight, and were heavily praised as a result. Due to this success, the series produced a sequel in My Hero 1's Justice 2, which incorporated a lot of the game's mechanics of its predecessor, while adding a plethora of new characters to play as. Because it's such a new and fresh franchise, with only two games to its name, I don't think it can move past the It Exists here for now. And we've arrived at Bandai Namco's latest franchise, Ace Angler. What started as a fishing simulator arcade game, later got ported to the Switch and sold over 800,000 copies, essentially guaranteeing it's a sequel titled Ace Angler Fishing Spirits which released last year in 2022. The sequel would take place in an aquarium themed amusement park, and featured a story, arcade and online multiplayer modes. There's honestly not too much to say about this game, as it's just your typical party game, and for now it just exists. And there you have it!
Honestly, Bandai Namco surprised me with just how well they've managed to maintain a lot of their franchises. Obviously some of the older ones have been abandoned, but at the same time some of their oldest franchises are still going strong to this day. They're certainly doing a better job than Sega, that's for sure. But then again, that's not necessarily a hard thing to achieve. Even so, Bandai Namco will go down as one of the most influential companies in gaming history. What started off as two separate titans managed to reach even greater heights through their merger, and have only gotten bigger as a result. Let me know which of these amazing franchises is your favourite in the comments below, and do consider subscribing and liking the video if you made it this far. But I appreciate all the support as always, and I hope you guys have an enjoyable rest of your day. I hope to see you all in the next one.